members, the speaker. The Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent and pay respects to their elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament now assembled and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Are, are there any petitions? Papers for tabling. The following paper is presented for tabling. Report from the Corruption and Crime Commission, review of a police use of force incident in Northbridge on the 10th of November 2019. Uh, giving notices of motion. Brief ministerial statements. Uh, Madam Speaker. Of the House. Madam Speaker, I rise today to inform the House on a new milestone on our $6 million Ascot Kilns conservation project as part of the WA recovery plan. On Tuesday, 6 April, heritage specialists Hocking Heritage and Architecture were engaged as the lead consultants on the conservation of the kilns and surrounds. They were selected following a competitive tender process and will bring their considerable heritage expertise to assist the Department of Planning, Lands and Heritage in this conservation of the kilns. This highly complex process will see the kilns and chimney stacks undergo assessment, planning and design ahead of a specialised conservation works. Madam Speaker, these works are, are anticipated to begin in 2022. And our project to restore these kilns is about more than just preserving the heritage fabric of our state. Restoring the kilns is part of our vision for reinvigorating the precinct and showcasing Australia's largest collection of rare beehive kilns and our state's industrial history. I'd also like to note, Madam Speaker, the reinvigoration and activation of the kilns precinct is something the community is already quite keen to see. I've been informed of a new guest on the site, the so-called brick man statue, mm. that was placed by a local artiste. Whilst he may have to hit the bricks, um, he might have to hit the bricks whilst works are undertaken, Madam Speaker, I'd like to assure the community and the member for Belmont that we are looking at long-term options for the statue. Very intriguing. Mm. Finally, Madam Speaker, at the core of what we do is a commitment to creating WA jobs. <clears throat> and these conservation works will ensure a pipeline of economic activities, including local jobs opportunities across the life of the project. I'd like to thank the member for Belmont on her diligent work in advocating for this project, and the Ascot Kilns and Park Fields Community Group uh, and their chairperson, Sharon Holt, for their strong community advocacy for the kilns. And of course, the member, the minister, <coughs> minister for um, um, planning, for her strong advocacy for this important project. Madam Speaker. Minister for Culture and the Arts. Madam Speaker, I would like to inform the House about, about the new social enterprise cafe at the State Library of Western Australia. Libraries are one of the last remaining public spaces where anyone can remain from opening until closing without needing any reason to be there and without having to spend any money. <laughs> this, is true. this is true of the State Library, which plays a positive role in the lives of many as a centre of research, learning and recreation, and for some, a place of opportunity. That's why it is fitting that the recently opened cafe in the State Library is a social enterprise. It's educating, empowering <coughs> and creating employment opportunities for young people experiencing or at risk of homelessness, and of course offers great coffee. The cafe, called Ground & Co, is run by the Underground Collaborative. The Collaborative is founded by Katie Liu, who after nearly a decade in the mining and resources industry as a management accountant, embarked on her social entrepreneurship journey. The new cafe demonstrates the State Library's commitment to provide a place to learn and develop for all Western Australians, no matter their circumstances. And recently, the State Library also launched a service called eConnect, 
which provides free one-on-one -on -one support to help the public connect with essential online government services. Clients are provided with free training on how to engage with government services online and how to do things like set up an email account and use online banking. The State Library also provides free access to computers with more than 140,000 computer sessions booked every year, helping to bridge the digital divide. <laughs> Libraries are a public space where people come to research, to learn, to relax, to be comfortable and to mix with like-minded people. The new cafe will add to this community atmosphere and serve to draw people to the State Library and the Perth Cultural Centre. So, Madam Speaker, when you next visit the State Library, please grab a coffee, knowing that it is contributing to a great social enterprise and helping young Western Australians. You are a great coffee lover, I know. Jobs, I think it is, or State Development. Minister for State Development. Madam Speaker, it's with great pleasure that I announce today the government's intention for the 2021-2022 regional communications forums. The government has, has a proud record in achieving strong linkages between government purchasing and economic and social outcomes. This government introduced the Western Australian Jobs Act in 2017, an associated Western Australian industry participation strategy, which was the first time that legislation covered covered all agencies and all forms of procurement. Since the full implementation of the WA Industry Participation Strategy in October 2018, more than 41,000 jobs have been captured, over 2,700 apprenticeships and traineeships, and 91 per cent local sourcing has been committed. Additionally, this government, through the West Australian Buy Local Policy, has placed a strong emphasis on regional participation in government contracts. When the Premier launched the WA Buy Local policy in July 2020, a target of 3,000 jobs in the regions was set. I'm pleased to announce that this target has been surpassed within 12 months. Members, the McGowan government is committed to economic growth in our regions and we will ensure all local businesses in country WA have the opportunity to benefit and thrive from government procurement and work. A key factor in our success has been the promotion of these initiatives across the state, including the use of regional communication forums. First introduced in 2019, these forums provide briefings to, for local business and community leaders on local policy and process and specific opportunities related to individual contracts. The forums have proven to be extremely successful with the Department of Jobs, Tourism, Science and Innovation's exit surveys showing satisfaction levels of over 90%. In 2020, the forums were successfully delivered in locations from Kununurra in the north right down to Esperance in the state south. For the 2021-2022 forums are planned to return in a variety of regional centres. We intend to emphasise the opportunities arising from the pipeline of work announced in November 2020 and to outline the range of measures we are introducing in terms of workforce skilling. We will again welcome input from attendees as communication is a hallmark of this government's approach to supporting growth and diversification in the regions. I intend to go along, with, go along to as many of these forums as I'm able and look forward to meeting with these regional business owners and operators who are the lifeblood of country WA. Thank you. Uh, the Minister for Creative Services. Madam Speaker, I'd like to inform the House that 12 more prisoners have graduated from the successful Kerry Binjarab training program at Carnet Prison Farm. These 12 Aboriginal men <coughs> are now on track for potential employment in the mining and civil industries after completing the Kerry Binjarab program at a simulated mine site at the Carnet Prison Farm in Serpentine. The Department of Justice program is a collaboration between traditional owners and Aboriginal contractor Kerry Mining that provides meaningful industry-led training for Aboriginal men with direct links to employment when they get out of prison. <coughs> Over the 14-week course, course, participants gain industry-specific skills, including a Certificate two in Civil Construction, a high-risk forklift ticket and a Working at Heights qualification. One of the graduates went a step further and received a Certificate three after completing additional work and acting as a peer mentor during the course. 
The, the participants are also supported to reconnect with their culture and, and learn key life skills, resilience and confidence. 57 men have now completed the program, with two thirds that have been released from prison gaining employment in the mining, civil and related industries. <coughs> More than half of the remainder are actively seeking employment activities at Kerry Mining. I thank mining service companies West Track, Biz Industries, Monodelphus, Alcoa and Makita for providing equipment, site access and expertise for the program. On behalf of the McGowan Labor Government, I congratulate the 12 men who have graduated from the Kerry Binjarab Training Program. The Minister for the for the prevention of family and domestic violence. Thank you. I rise to inform the House about important work underway to work with perpetrators of family and domestic violence. A therapeutic residential perpetrator program called Breathing Space featured on the recently aired SBS documentary, See What You Made Me Do. Drawing on the critically acclaimed book of the same name, journalist Jess Hill examines domestic abuse in Australia. It explores family and domestic violence in various forms through interviews with families, survivors, reformers and domestic violence service workers. One focus in the doc documentary series is on perpetrator programs that are changing lives and making a positive impact on Australia's domestic violence statistics. I'm proud to say that the documentary featured a program being delivered right here in Western Australia. It's one of the most established residential men's behavioural change programs in the Southern Hemisphere. The state government funded breathing space program is being delivered by Communicare in Callista, along with a second breathing space facility that the McGowan government opened in Maylands in 2019. Funded by the Department of Communities, the program works to help perpetrators be accountable for their actions and keep women and children safe in their own homes. The program is for at-risk men who are willing to address their violent behaviours. They are provided with accommodation for up to six months and have access to case management, individual and group counselling. They are challenged to reflect on the impacts of their behaviours on their loved ones and take responsibility for their actions. Acting S M M Madam Speaker, as the Minister for Prevention of Family and Domestic Violence, I know how important it is for our responses to include programs that work to change behaviour and stop the cycle of abuse. There is more work to do to build the evidence base for these programs and ensuring that they deliver lasting change. The McGowan Government has made combating family and domestic violence a priority with a $60 million commitment over the next four years to continue to support survivors, keep perpetrators accountable and to continue to educate the community about respectful relationships. Family and domestic violence is preventable and we are committed to playing our role to stop it. The Minister for Community Services. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to inform the House about this government's continued progress to delivering on our homelessness strategy all paths lead to a home. A $2.4 million contract has been awarded to St Patrick's Community Support Centre to deliver accommodation and support services to people experiencing homelessness in the Manjo Rockingham area. This contract is an integral component of the McGowan government's $34.5 million Housing First Homelessness Initiative, which couples stable accommodation for rough sleepers with tailored supports to keep them in accommodation long term. Experienced community service organisations, Rua Community Ser Services and Wanjining Aboriginal Corporation will assist St Pat's to implement an evidence-based service delivery model in line with proven housing first approach. To respond to the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people among drunk sleepers in the area, Wanjining will place senior Aboriginal leaders in governance roles and employ Indigenous service delivery staff to ensure all outreach workers uh, outreach work is delivered with an emphasis on culturally appropriate practices. The Mandra Rockingham contract complements housing first contracts already in place in the Perth metropolitan area. Bunbury and Geraldton. The Housing First Homeless, in Homeless Initiative is a tested model that is globally accepted, supporting people experiencing homelessness with appropriate wraparound supports. It builds on the 50 Lives, 50 Homes project here in WA led by Rua and contributed to, 
to by nearly 30 organisations. By its third year of operation, 80 per cent of those long-term homeless who had been, had been housed were still in housing. That gave us the evidence we needed to make significant investment in this approach across a range of locations. We get to, this, to get to this point, government has driven significant change and reform. We consulted across community, service providers and peak bodies and other sector leaders, hearing from over 500 people across the state to build this strategy. We've committed the largest new investment in homelessness ever seen in WA. I thank the Premier and my co Cabinet colleagues for their leadership and the community sector for its commitment, ensuring that we can do everything that we do everything we can as a government and as a community to support some of our, some of our most vulnerable people. The, Madam Speaker. The Minister for Emergency Services. Madam Speaker, I would like to take this opportunity to inform the House of the remarkable response of emergency service personnel to assist and support Western Australian communities impacted by tropical cyclone Serosia. And I'd like to add that these are volunteer and career emergency responders. Madam Speaker, tropical cyclone Serosia posed the biggest threat to Midwest coastal communities in 50 years. Influenced by a rare weather phenomenon, Serosia's path hit coastal and inland communities hard, damaging homes, businesses and public infrastructure. I have travelled to the Midwest with the Fire and Emergency Services Commissioner and the State Recovery Controller to see firsthand the scale of damage and loss and thank emergency services who travelled from across the state and nation to help. We also heard from residents about how the cyclone has impacted their lives and how they will rebuild. They have shown great strength and resilience, and I thank them all for sharing their stories. The extent of the devastation spans more than 130,000 square kilometres. In total, 1,521 structures have been damaged, and sadly, 96 homes have been destroyed. Sorry, 96. <clears throat> buildings have been destroyed, including 48 homes. Madam Speaker, the journey to recovery for communities will take time. We appointed a state recovery controller early to coordinate the recovery efforts with affected local governments and the community. State government electricity and water relief packages are available for affected residents. State government financial assistance has also been activated, including the Commonwealth State Disaster Recovery Funding Arrangements, which directly assists uh, affected local governments. This has been assisting local governments with clean-up on the ground and providing emergency assistance for individuals. I thank the Commonwealth for their ongoing support and acknowledge visits by the Prime Minister and the Governor-General. I'd also like to acknowledge the Perth Lord Mayor, who also recently joined me in Kalbarri. Members, the state is continuing to work with the Commonwealth on a range of tailored packages that will support the recovery of affected regions and communities. The the assistance measures were expanded on the 19th of May to include a community recovery support package for impacted local governments, which includes the clean-up and restoration of community recreational and heritage infrastructure. Under the expanded program, five community recovery officers will work across the region to support long-term recovery. The State Recovery Controller is working directly with the fund uh, uh, to determine activation of grants for the affected residents. Uh, I'm sure that everyone in this House will join me in thanking all the volunteer and career emergency service responders, including ADF, WA Police Force, volunteers, local government, government agencies who have been on the ground uh, support for supporting the affected communities. Uh, grievances. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My grievance is to the Minister for Transport. I rise today to grieve to the Minister over the unjust treatment of two uh, families who live adjacent to the northern end of the North New Tonkin Highway, the North Link, uh, the relevant uh, part of that North Link project being the extension of the Tonkin Highway from Ellenbrook to Newshay, with that section opening on the 23rd of April 2020. Uh, Pam and Ian Taylor moved to Newshay some 14 years ago in search of peace and quiet. In July 2018, the arrival of sea containers adjacent to their property signalled the start of the North Link construction work near their two-storey home. Main Roads WA ordered a series of photos to be taken prior to the start of construction, together with a visual and written condition report, with a further set of photographs to be taken on completion of the project. Main Roads explained that this was to document damage and protect the tailors. 
Once construction started, CPB contractors dealt directly with residents and, according to Mrs Taylor, Main Roads provided nothing in the way of a handover to the project's lead contractors. The Taylor's home is located 150 metres from the enormous overpass which spans Mewshay South Road, the railway line and Almeria Parade. Construction of that overpass was a particularly stressful period for the Taylor household, while compactors were at work ahead of the installation of the large pylons. Pam Taylor says construction workers were on site from 6 or 7 a.m. until 5 p.m. and at times they worked through the night. She says the dust was horrendous, with the entire family having to take antihistamines for a prolonged period. The Taylors say their house was shaking and vibrating for weeks during construction of the nearby overpass. Numerous cracks developed during these construction works, including in the walls of the house, floor and wall tiles, within the granite bench top in the kitchen and the quartz render of the swimming pool wall and floor. Once the road construction was complete, Pam Taylor contacted CPB contractors about the damage sustained to the property. They ordered a post-construction report be completed and demanded three quotes to repair the damage. Uh, obtaining the quotes proved impossible, and I spoke to the tailor several times while they were trying to get these quotes. The builders were not prepared to consider work that was 50 kilometres from the CBD, when interstate travel was restricted at times due to COVID lockdowns, and Perth was at the beginning of a building boom. The job was simply too big for some of the, uh, the local builders. The one quote the tailors were able to obtain put the damage bill at $421,000. In a letter to the tailors, Dated the 23rd of April 2021, CPB refused the Taylor's $421,000 claim for compensation outright, citing that pre-existing damage was recorded in the initial surveys. CPB said damage to the Taylor home was due to external factors such as thermal expansion of brickwork, settlement of the footings, seasonal swelling of founding soils, shrinkage of cement building material and extreme temperature and moisture changes in the area, resulting in the expansion and construction of roofing members. Cracking to the floors was considered of, aesthetic, uh, of only aesthetic consequence and of no structural concern. The damage to the pool's quartz render was said to have been the result of acid used to stabilise the pH of the pool. Pam Taylor insists that she has always maintained her pool water as the, per the instructions when the pool was first installed. The Taylors are speechless. The property was a construction site for two years and now CPB contractors refuse to acknowledge or address the damage sustained by the heavy machinery at work just 150 metres away. They caused their house to vibrate for weeks on end, resulting in substantial damage. Like the Taylors, Bill Hayes moved to West Woolsbrook uh, 32 years ago for peace and quiet and to breed horses. Similarly, ahead of construction commencing, Main Roads exp uh, explained that photo evidence of every crack in the building would protect Bill through the Northlink construction process. He describes the stressful construction period with his French doors shaking and the growing cracks in his walls. His horses were particularly disturbed by the machinery. Northlink construction underway, Bill was somewhat alarmed at the damage already showing. He contracted uh, Main Roads WA only to be told that all complaints had to be referred to the contractors, CPB contractors. Phone calls from Bill to CPB were not returned. Emails went unanswered. Staff changed frequently, to the point where Bill estimates he was referred to 15 different staff at CPB. Bill became more and more frustrated at his inability to communicate with CPB and felt he was purposely being given, purposefully being given the runaround. When Bill did manage to speak to someone at CPB, he was ordered to provide three quotes within seven days. Again, this proved extremely difficult. Bill was determined to get some of the damage covered and, uh, and hurriedly provided a quote which he now acknowledges was for only a portion of the total damage sustained. He had not considered damage to the pool and other outdoor areas. CPP had offered him compensation of just $6,000 to cover work quoted at $10,500. Aside from damage to his home, Bill says the Bullsbrook Creek, which flows into the Allenbrook Creek and had reliably provided water for his horses, was filled in by contractors and stopped flowing, a matter he reported to the Department of uh, of um, water and environment regulation. CPB Contractors is the Australasian construction arm of CIMIC Group, the parent company of Australia's largest uh, project development and contracting group, formerly Leighton Contractors. Um, the Spanish-owned uh, company is now the majority uh, um, shareholder of Hotkeep, which is uh, CPB's parent. Their catch line is a trusted partner in construction. The website goes on to say, Working closely with clients and partners, our work is guided by our princi principles of integrity, accountability, innovation and delivery. 
I am greatly concerned that Bill Hayes and Pam and Ian Taylor are living in homes that have sustained extensive damage as a result of the construction of the North Link. Their decent West Australian people have been given the runaround by a multinational firm that answers to its international shareholders. I call on you, Minister, to ensure that Bill Hayes and the Taylors are treated with decency and offered the compensation that they deserve. Thank you. Thank you, Minister for Transport. And I thank the member for more for that grievance and also for um, providing me the grievance this morning and also contacting my office yesterday so I could provide some details in relation to the specifics of the grievance. Um, as you, the member highlighted, the set, northern section of North Nick was opened in April 2020. And as a member would be aware, the route definition was done prior to us entering government. But um, I expect and, uh, that uh, there was consultation in relation to that route alignment prior to us winning government. But it is, um, it is an issue that when we do build roads, that we do change the nature of the environment. There's no doubt about that. And I think um, if through that area in particular, there will be people who did go there to have a quiet retirement or quiet lifestyle that, of course, the nature of the environment has changed. And that's something I want to acknowledge. And I don't think we can shy away from that. Um, now, there's a set process in relation to uh, building these types of roads or these structures. And I'll go through that process and I'll make some comments where I can specifically in relation to um, um, Mr Bill Hayes and also the Taylors. Um, the agency and its contractors have a range of measures um, to try and, first of all, ascertain if there is property damage and then go through to resolve that issue. There's an established process and that means that the lead contract of the project um, initially negotiates and resolves um, any claims of property damage as a result of the project. These claims are assessed individually and resolved on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Um, in relation to this this, uh, this uh, process. If the offer, what happens is there's a precondition report undertaken and then there's assessments afterwards and offers are made. If the, if the offer is accepted, an independent building assessor comes to the property and completes an inspection of the home. Uh, this provides an accurate understanding of the condition of the property for both parties. And as I said, after construction is complete, the houses are invited to undertake post-construction surveys where the house is reviewed to ascertain if any damage may have resulted from the construction activities. When the post-construction survey is complete, a copy of the report and information on how to fill in the claim form is sent to the property owners. If a landowner chooses to lodge a claim form, they are asked to include the three quotes. And I understand the difficulties that would have been, in particular, not only the distance, but the property market we're in. So I think, again, that's in a bit of a unique situation, although um, sometimes it's hard to get people to come and quote work unless they're guaranteed to do that. We all understand that. The lead contractor will review the claim along with the quotations provided and advise the landowner of the outcome. Now, if the landowner disputes the outcome, and the lead contractor is unable to reach agreement, then the matters are escalated to main roads as part of the process to review. In relation to this section of Northlink, I'm advised by main roads that prior to the start of the construction, CPB contractors who delivered Northlink WA Northern section invited 32 properties to undertake property condition surveys. 25 of those properties completed precondition surveys and after the completion of construction, 23 properties completed post-condition surveys. After the review of the post-condition surveys, two landowners and those mentioned lodged claims regarding property damage with CPB contractors. Now, in relation to uh, that assessment process, I've got some broad information. Um, as I understand, because there's an existing process, I can't go through all the details, but. I do want to um, state that Main Roads is watching these cases very closely. So one claim was initially rejected by CPB contractors and has since followed the normal property damages claims process. That matter has now been escalated to Main Roads. Um, and the other, mat other claim is, on, is in ongoing negotiation. So Main Roads, in relation um, to one case, um, is now, being in, now directly involved in those negotiations. 
As I said, this is a legal contractual, contractual matter, um, and so there, there needs to be a followed process to ensure the outcome is achieved for all parties. But I will say that Main Roads is now getting involved as per the outline process. Um, so Main Roads is now involved in, uh, I think, both, both processes. Um, making sure that the landowners are treated fairly and that the established process is followed. There were, I know there are differing um, claims made in respect to the amount of damage and what caused that damage, um, in particular I think in relation to the tailors, and I know there's some very different, diff, different views in relation to what caused the damage, but there is a process that's being followed. I want to assure the member and also the residents and landowners involved that Main Roads takes these issues very, very seriously, and when people aren't happy with the, I suppose, process or the outcome in relation to negotiations with the lead contractor, the process does allow Main Roads to be involved and to oversee that process. So Main Roads takes these issues seriously and will continue to work on both of the um, both of the um, set of negotiations to ensure that both landowners are treated fairly according to the process. In relation to the Creek member, sorry, I don't have information on that, but I will follow up directly with the relevant agency. I am asking Main Roads to follow up in particular to make sure that, again, those issues are addressed. So thank you for the grievance. We take these issues seriously. And I know, as I said, when these new roads are built, um, in particular for those neighbours who were enjoying a different lifestyle. It does impact them in particular in the nature of, of their environment. And this is, a, as I said, the alignment was done, and I'm not trying to you know, blame anyone, or, but this alignment was done um, over a few years. I assume there was um, consultation with all those landowners, but it still doesn't take away the fact that their rural lifestyle has changed significantly. Um, but in relation to the specific um, queries in respect to the homes, um, Main Roads is involved and will make sure that a fair outcome was reached. Madam Speaker. The member for Wanneroo. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, my grievance is to the Minister for Transport, and I thank her for allowing me to bring this grievance to her today. And before I start, I'd like to wish her a happy birthday for yesterday. Um, I begin by also uh, wanting to acknowledge the significant investment on road and rail infrastructure in our northern suburbs in my electorate in the last four years. In particular, we now have delivered two key interchanges on the intersections of Wanneroo Road at Ocean Reef Road and on Joondalup Drive. These interchanges are game changers for the residents in my electorate. These projects have busted congestion and significantly improved safety and, importantly, have future-proofed these intersections for the significant growth that we will continue to see in my northern and eastern suburbs like Bankshire Grove and beyond. And of course they were done in a holistic way, Minister. I worked with you and the community to make sure that we could also include some other works to make sure those interchanges would work even better, including traffic lights at Clarkson Avenue, a roundabout at Sheraton Drive and upgrades to the roundabout at Joondalup Drive. And it is brilliant and it works. Every day, families are saving precious minutes um, travelling to work. The one thing I'm not happy about, Minister, though, is the uh, lighting on the bridge, which is fantastic, but uh, it doesn't uh, get lit up in purple often enough. So we might need to do something mm -hmm. about that, perhaps get Freya to win a few more games so we can get a bit more purple happening there. And of course, we also saw the duelling <laughs> of Wanneroo Road from Flynn Drive to Joondalup Drive. It's not going to be purple for a while, I don't think. Thank you, <laughs> Madam Speaker. We we live in hope. We 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 live in hope. Um, but uh, so, so we had the duelling of Wanneroo Road from Flynn Drive to Joondalup Drive, uh, which is fantastic as well. And I want to talk a, a bit more about Wanneroo Road in a moment, Minister. My grievance today is about your recent announcement in relation to the construction commencing in relation to the Mitchell Freeway extension to Romeo Road. As you know, I've previously grieved to you in 2019, and I'm very grateful and proud that construction has started. To extend it so far north is incredible. Um, and of course, the freeway will link um, east-west at Romeo Road, making it easier for people in my suburbs 
to get to much needed infrastructure, whether it be schools, employment or recreation in the Northern Corridor. Wanneroo Road is the spine that runs through my electorate from north in Karabuda, south, and my suburb is Karama, Ashby, Sinagra and of course Wanneroo. It's a significant regional road that carries through traffic coming from the north and south of the state and with it a significant number of trucks and commercial vehicles. Of course it also services considerable local traffic with the rapid expansion of urban areas in the north and the development of Alkimos. It's really exciting to see the rural areas of Karabuda and Nowagup connected to the uh, now being able to be connected to the urban areas to the west allowing people in my electorate easy access to the freeway and rail this east west connection at Romeo Road would also allow our beautiful rural areas to further build on their potential for agritourism biz businesses I'm keen to hear, as are my residents minister on the timeline for the extension of the Mitchell freeway to Romeo Road as the Minister would know, I previously grieved on this matter in 2019 where I highlighted a dangerous black spot on Wanneroo Road at the intersection of Romeo Road and Karabura Road and I seek reassurance on behalf of my community that this dangerous intersection will be addressed and made safe as part of that Mitchell Freeway works. Um, the key problem here of course is that these intersections are where Wanneroo Road is still a single lane road and of course it's near on impossible to safely exit Wanneroo Road with cars and, and um, trucks and commercial vehicles travelling behind because there's no slipways to get on and off Wanneroo Road at those single lane points. Minister, I've also previously raised with you my position on not extending Lucan Drive through the heart of the Nearabut National Park. I speak for the overwhelming majority of my residents who believe that the east-west connectors of Hester Road and the soon-to-be-constructed Romeo Road Link services our community. Before seeking public office, I fought for many years to protect Lake Nowagup and the Nearabut National Park, and I urge you not to consider extending Lucan Drive through to the National Park to Wanneroo. It is unnecessary now that we will have Romeo Road as our east-west connector. Um, I'm also interested to know how this project will protect the existing Yabaru Walk Trail through the National Park from Joondalup to Yanchip, and to ensure that through the delivery of this project, the utmost consideration is giving, given to preserving the flora and fauna in the area by ensuring that we have adequate underpasses to preserve the connectivity. Finally, Minister, I would like to draw your attention to a most special opportunity that arises from this freeway extension. Lake Nowagup, which is part of Nearabutton National Park, lies some 300 metres south of the intersection of Romeo Road at Wanneroo Road. It is my electorate's best kept secret. It is the deepest permanent lake um, in the Perth area. And of course, importantly, the Yabaru Trail that runs from Joondalup to Yanship does so because of the lake systems that supported and sustained Aboriginal people along the route. The, the route starts at Lake Joondalup in Ye Yellowgonga Regional Park, passes through the Nirabut National Park and ends at the lakes in Yanship National Park. And of course, Aboriginal people would have visited Lake Nowgup on their journey in between. I've long championed this hidden jewel and its potential to be a recreational site for the northern suburbs. I ask that you may consider how we might complete this link with the Yabaru Trail, given now that we are going to extend Romeo Road and potentially Wanneroo Road, and hopefully the principal shared path, uh, paths that are developed as part of that road structure will allow us uh, to connect to Lake Nowgup so people in the urban area can also get better access to Lake Nowgup. In summary, um, Minister, I thank you for your continued support of our northern suburbs and acknowledge the unprecedented investment in roads and rail by the McGowan Labor government that is transformational in my electorate. And also importantly, I would like to acknowledge and thank you for your continued collaboration with us as local members when we deliver these key infrastructure projects to make sure that they're fit for purpose that they um, meet the expectations of the local community so that they can be the best po possible infrastructure um, uh, uh, built to service the community in my suburbs. Thank you. Minister for Transport. And can I thank the member for Wanneroo for that grievance and also her advocacy for her community in relation to how we can make sure that these projects deliver not only 
the base case in a sense, the extension of the freeway to Romeo Road. But the member for Wanneroo has been very keen to make sure that we also focus on Wanneroo Road as part of this project. And um, the member has approached me um, over the many years, first of all, to get to make sure we could secure funding for the project. And I'm very happy that we have secured funding in partnership with the Commonwealth, um, the required funding to do the extension, but also to address some other key issues. Safety on Wanneroo Road has been a major issue. And um, we've been, um, since winning government, we have delivered a lot on Wanneroo Road, the two new overpasses and, of course, the widening project. But further north, the member was very keen to make sure could we make sure we continue that widening project, but also make sure we address some key intersections in the area. And then, of course, the other key issue was in relation to Lucan Drive going east, um, making sure that that doesn't occur to ensure that um, the Nirabup National Park is protected and that we can all enjoy that lovely national park for future future years. So I just want to outline a little bit of what we're delivering, but also to specifically address what you raised in your grievance. As I've highlighted, two, um, $232 million was, um, was confirmed and an additional $8.5 million was recently confirmed in the Commonwealth Budget for um, Butler Boulevard interchange and also for the duplication of Wanneroo Road, south of Romeo Road to Dunstan Road. Um, so this project now includes 5.6 kilometres of a freeway extension between Hester to Romeo with two traffic lanes um, in each direction. The interchange at Hester Avenue, a new interchange at Lucan Drive, and um, that was something again that uh, that was put forward early, and again making sure it doesn't go to the to the east. And a construction of an additional interchange at Butler Boulevard. This wasn't included originally, but it makes a lot of sense in relation to connections for the new residential housing estates. The rail tunnel, un, a rail tunnel under the freeway northbound lane, northbound lane for the Butler train line. A bridge over the now got rail yard access for the freeway south lanes. A PSP on the side of the freeway from Hester Avenue to Romeo Road, including a pedestrian underpass at Lucan Drive. New shared path also um, to be constructed on Romeo, Romeo Road to link the cycle network to Marmion Avenue. And a fauna and pedestrian underpass at Romeo Road to connect into the National Park. Um, the duplicate construction of Romeo Road from Marmion Avenue to Wanneroo Road with signal modifications at the Marmion Avenue intersection. The duplication of Wanneroo Road from south of Romeo Road to Trian, Trian Road. The duplication of Wanneroo Road from south of Romeo Road to Dunstan Road. And again, that wasn't included in the original scope, but was included as a priced option and very happy to be able to deliver that to make sure, again, that we don't have the dual carriageway going to single carriageway going to dual carriageway. And so we can um, complete that duplication through that area. We're also incorporating, which I'm sure uh, the council, the Wanneroo the City of Wanneroo would be appreciative of, the widening of, the widening of Lucan Drive also from the Mitchell Freeway, west of Connolly Drive. Um, so, as you can see, as part of this project, we're delivering the extension, but we're delivering a lot of works. And in relation to those specific issues which you raised, so I'll, uh, the, in relation to Wanneroo Road intersection and Caraburra um, Road, so as part of the construction of Romeo Road from Wanneroo Road to Miami Avenue, the intersection at Caraburra Road, Wanneroo Road, and Romeo Road will be upgraded to include traffic light members. I'm sorry, traffic lights. Member, so again, one of your safety issues concerned are addressed. Um, in relation to Wanneroo Road, this now project now includes the duplication of Wanneroo Road from south of Romeo Road to Tryon Road, and also the extension of the duplication of Wanneroo Road from south of Romeo Road to Dunstan Road. So um, reinforcing the full duplication of Wanneroo Road through that whole area. Um, as we said, the extension of Lucan Drive to Wanneroo Road is not included in the project scope, um, again, because of the environmental concerns and the impact it would have on the Nirabup National Park. 
Um, in relation to uh, the impacts on Nirrabup National Park and the walking trails, Main Roads undertook early engagement with the Department of Biodiversity and Conservation, the city, to inform the planning and development of the project and to ensure that the impacts on the National Park were minimised. A PSP will be constructed on the western side of the freeway and will include a pedestrian underpass at Lucan Drive. The Lucan Drive interchange shared path will connect to the Yabaru Bud Budra Trail. A shared path will be constructed on Romeo Road to link the cycle network to Marmion Avenue. Um, a fauna pedestrian underpass will be constructed at Romeo Road to allow connectivity of the trail between north and south of Romeo Road. Um, and, and the optional works to duplicate Wanneroo Road from south of Romeo Road to Dunstan Road include a fauna underpass at Wanneroo Road. Um, and negotiations are also underway uh, to, with the DBCA to realign a small section of the trail to ensure that access can be maintained at all times. Um, member, you also asked about a cycling and pedestrian connectivity to Lake Nowagup. Um, we're working in relation to that proposal um, with DPCA. They're responsible for the trails in the National Park, but if that's something that we can work in with DPCA and also the City of Wanneroo to improve that connectivity, I hope to be able to do that too. So, Member, there's a lot of lot of roads. But, but, oh, sorry, yeah, I'll, I'll get to the purple on the bridge. But as... Um, member, as you've outlined and you've been very proactive putting forward safety concerns on Wanneroo Road, making sure that you protect the environmental assets in that area, and I'm really pleased that through your representation and our negotiations with the Commonwealth and also um, with other key stakeholders, we're delivering a project which has a freeway extension but massive safety improvements to Wanneroo Road and something I'm very, very keen on. And member, I'll commit to, heart, to lighting up the bridge purple every weekend, member. <laughs> <laughs> the member for Dawesville. <laughs> so to the Minister for Transport. <laughs> Firstly, can I thank the Minister for Transport for taking my grievance this morning. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank the McGowan Labor Government for contributing $55 million towards the duplication of the Mandra Estuary Bridge. This was an important election commitment for the people of Dawesville, uh, Mandra and Murray Wellington. Uh, the duplication of this bridge is a key infrastructure project for Western Australia. The bridge opened in 1986 to the, by the then Labor Government. It's a three-lane bridge. The bridge links Mandra to Dawesville End and coupled with the Dawesville Cut, which was opened in 1993 effectively makes my electorate an island. I'm proud to have lived on this island in Falcon for over a decade. This bridge was also intended to be duplicated long before now, and during my months of door knocking, many residents raised the issue of the duplication of the bridge with me, requesting that I make it a commitment. It was often said that every four years, the Mandra Estuary Bridge had been promised but never delivered. It was a great moment for me as the first Labor member in Dawesville electorate to announce the duplication of the Mandra Estuary Bridge as an election commitment, and now it's a reality. Thank you. Uh, the current lane bridge has long been a point of sorry. The current three-lane bridge has long been a point of frustration and concern from local motorists and tourists. Having a four-lane a four-lane highway feeding into a three-lane bridge just doesn't make sense, and causes a lot of traffic jams, motor vehicle accidents, and people failing to merge. And let's face it, West Australians are notoriously bad for merging. <laughs> As a paramedic who's worked in this area for over 10 years, it's an area of concern for me, particularly as an emergency service worker, trying to cross the bridge on priority with lights and sirens during peak periods. I've been in the back of ambulance resuscitating people from babies to the elderly on several occasions being delayed by the traffic congestion. Road users also become increasingly frantic and make poor decisions when they see blue and red lights approaching from behind with nowhere to go. When the Minister for Transport and the McGowan government agreed to fund the duplication, I was very excited. Minister, I'm hoping that now we have the green light for the bill to be put out for tender, I ask that you could give consideration to all my constituents, along with those in the member for Mandra and Murray Wellington's electorate, to be able to utilise the bridge for activities more than transport. Fishability is a not-for-profit organisation formed 20 years ago to enable people of all ages with disabilities to enjoy the healthy outdoor pastime of recreational fishing. The organisation has reached out to us to seek the building of a platform under the Mandra Estuary Bridge to allow people who are physically disabled 
or wheelchair bound to be able to access the benefits of the estuary to fish or just sit and enjoy the beautiful views our estuary has to offer. Fishability runs a manager program that's been operating for nearly 10 years. They hold events every Thursday at various venues around Mandra. Their clients are taught the fundamentals of fishing and encouraged to do things such as baiting, hooks and casting. It's vitally important that as a government, when announcing all new infrastructure projects, that the needs of all people are taken into account, including people with disabilities and limited mobility. We should always plan for every person to have the opportunity to be seen, heard and feel valued. And by doing this, we create, create inclusive, vibrant communities that attract more and more people to them. One of the existing facilities that is already part of the Peel region is the new old Mandra traffic bridge that the member for, in the Manba for Mandra's electorate. It was rebuilt in December 2017 and has a fishing, a fishing platform that is accessible to young families with prams. Um, others or others that require a wheelchair, physically impaired or require crutches or a walker. Due in part to the Fishability Successful Program, it's become a very, very popular spot, so much so that it's becoming increasingly overcrowded during peak periods. I'm proud that now as member for Dawesville, I can be a voice to those who are considered vulnerable or a minority within our community. Minister, I ask that you give serious consideration to ensuring accessible fishing platforms are planned for and provided in the design of the duplicated Manja Estuary Bridge. The current bridge does not cater for disability, so this is an opportunity to ensure people with disabilities and those limited in mobility can enjoy the fishing experiences on our magnificent Peel waterways. Thank you. The Minister for Transport. Thank you, and I thank the member for Dawesville for that grievance, and member for Dawesville. Um, it will be an incredible achievement that, as the first Labor member for, or Labor member for Dawesville, you'll be able to deliver this long-awaited and many, many times promised bridge. Now, as members would be aware, this is one of our key um, commitments at the last election, at the 2021 election, was a commitment of $55 million um, with the hope that the federal government or an expectation the federal government would match us um, to deliver the new estuary bridge. This is a project that has been talked about for many, many years and I know had been promised by the former coalition government at elections, but never delivered, never delivered. So I'm very, very pleased that since the election, we've already secured the other $55 million. Yeah. So we have $110 million to deliver this long awaited bridge. Now, I'll go through the current situation, although the member to the left of me, member for Mandra, and of course, the member for Dawes will know this current situation yeah. very well that. The existing Mandra Estuary Bridge is 12.74 metres wide and 383 metres long. It caters for a single 3.5 metre traffic lane in the eastbound direction and two in the westbound direction with, 0 .5, with half a metre shoulders and a shared path. Mandra Road on either side of the bridge is a four lane dual carriageway stand. Sorry, Mandra Road on either side of the bridge is a four lane dual carriageway standard. This means that northbound traffic is required to merge into one lane at the curves on the approach to the bridge before crossing the bridge in the eastbound direction. Uh, during the morning peak period, northbound traffic can queue at the merge onto the bridge, and I'm advised up to 500 metres, but I, yeah. I've been advised even more. This results in delays, and of course, Member for Dawesville, in your previous um, occupation as a paramedic, um, understanding the impact it has on emergency vehicles, and are, you know, you telling me exactly some of the stresses and also the pressures that's caused when you're trying to um, get across the bridge safely um, to, to make sure your patients are cared for, that of course is something we want to try and address as well. Um, so we're very much keen to deliver the bridge for you know, the safety of drivers, but also to reduce congestion on that area. But of course, uh, the issue that you've raised, which in relation to fishing, fishing pl platforms, is a good one. As you know, the existing fishing platform is located in the estuary between piers three and four. The platform and access stairs for the bridge are under the care and control of the city of Mandra. Um, but as you know, that it doesn't allow for uh, or much accessibility, in particular um, for the elderly or for those um, in wheelchairs and so forth. So uh, the current fishing s situation isn't very accessible and as part of building a new bridge, in particular in such a fishing mecca of Mandra, um, you have to look at things in particular like fishing platforms because we know 
people in Mandurah love to fish and they love to yeah. crab. Yeah. They love to fish and love to crab. So, so we are now will be going through the detailed design of the new estuary bridge and uh, we'll go through a detailed design and development of the duplication. Now, as part of this, um, we'll create an opportunity for key community input and both members for Mandurah but member for Dawesville um, as representatives of the community, I'd like you to be involved. Yes. But a key aspect will be how we can improve always pedestrian cycling access, because I'm very keen to make sure we incorporate that in the design of all of our new bridges yeah. and infrastructure, but also um, uh, better access to fishing. And I think the, exi the new Mandra Bridge, um, which I was fortunate enough to open. Yeah, although with, with, with me. With the member for Mandra, I remember it was a very hot day. <laughs> very hot day. My daughter bought a very weird very costume. Nice clerk, actually. <laughs> My daughter bought a really weird costume at the fair, Your remember? Your daughter did. She does have taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember that day. It was one of the first things I did as a minister. But, um, of course, I acknowledge the work done by the previous government on that project, but uh, I remember that day and the outcomes for pedestrian cyclists, yeah. that's six, me it's six metres, isn't it? Yeah. That pedestrian walkway. And I know when I stay in, you know, stayed a few times in, in Dawesville on, my, on some long weekends, how myself and the family loved walking across that You've bridge. You've seen me cycle there on my e-bike. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> No, different day, different day. Yeah. <laughs> Must uh, have been. But um, you wouldn't I have recognised him in the lycra. Pardon? Yeah. You wouldn't have recognised him in the lycra. I might have seen him, but I, I look very fetching. I can tell you. <laughs> I might have seen him, but I looked away quickly, um, Madam Speaker. <laughs> Avert your eyes. I was wearing my white shirt. <laughs> Area, I must say, the the skate park, which is a lot of fun, walking yeah. across the bridge, then going to the um, to the cafes and getting my crumpets from that very good bakery. Yeah. Um, that is a ver no, that's a re it's a really good area. But on this estuary bridge, we have the ability to provide some improved amenity, and in particular with um, with fishing. So we're very keen to consult with Fishability Mandra and yourself as local members as part of this detailed design phase. We really want to try and get on with it, get the design and then go into um, the tender process as soon as we can. But this is a huge opportunity yeah. to improve access for local residents um, to new fishing platforms and, of course, the overall amenity. So very keen to see this bridge built. It is very exciting that we've secured the batching funding, that we've got the cash in the bank, and now we have to go through the detailed design because that's work that we need to do and then go through the tender process. But very exciting, Member for Dawesville, um, to be able... Well done. Yeah, well done. <laughs> you did put on our agenda. I remember... <laughs> I, I remember... Sorry. <laughs> I remember the member for Dawes were approaching me a number of times um, in the lead up to the last election, raising this, and it was very, very pleasing to be able to go down there during the campaign and commit to it, secure the funding, now into detailed design, and now being able to design it to make sure that we bring not only benefits to the drivers, to those in the cars, but people walking, fishing, and those that want to use the bridge as part of the local amenity in the area. So very, very exciting project, and I can't wait to see this one built. Thank well done. you. Well done. Speaker. The member for Vass. Uh, my grievance is to the Minister for Health, and I thank the Minister for taking my grievance, which refers to the support available for children and adolescents suffering from anorexia nervosa in Western Australia, specifically at Perth Children's Hospital Eating Disorders Unit. From the outset, can I thank the many parents who have provided feedback for this grievance, and they would also like to thank the frontline superstars, as they say, the nurses who are currently working in the health system. As the Minister may be aware, and as classified by the Australian Government Department of Health, anorexia is a severe, very distressing and often chronic mental illness. It centres on an intense preoccupation around body weight and eating that is often accompanied by other mental health issues such as depression, anxiety, lack of concentration and low self-esteem and results in an array of physical illnesses including extreme, often life-threatening weight loss, heart problems, kidney failure, infertility and sometimes death. It usually starts in adolescence and has the highest death rate, 20 per cent in 20 years, of all mental health illnesses. 
The average time that people suffer is between five to seven years, but there are often relapses. For some people, it can be lifelong, a lifelong struggle. As stated on the Healthy WA website, seeking help and treatment early is associated with an improved outcome. Unfortunately, that early treatment does not appear to be readily available for children suffering this condition in WA. I have been contacted by a number of families who have provided anecdotal evidence that the system for treating children under 16 suffering from anorexia in WA is falling well short, leaving families struggling to find appropriate treatment and help for their often severely malnourished and psychologically very unwell children. As the Minister is, I'm sure, aware, there is a specialised eating disorder unit at Perth Children's Hospital, which has only eight inpatient beds for the whole state. There is also a transitional program. Uh, to receive treatment at the unit, children must be assessed by the Perth Children's Hospital multidisciplinary team and be officially diagnosed with an eating disorder. Children who have not been assessed are refused treatment at the unit. The wait time to be assessed and diagnosed is currently six to nine months, and for many WA families, their children are literally starving and fading away in front of them as they wait for their child's assessment date to arrive. If their unassessed children present to an emergency department in the meantime, they're often turned away due to a lack of beds or because their child's vitals have not plummeted enough. These families return home to try to manage this horrendous illness alone. One mother reported to me her extremely anxious, malnourished daughter was finally admitted to the Perth Children's Hospital's general admissions ward after being previously turned away, but only to share a room with a mother and a young baby. Anorexia is a mental disorder and this situation was dire for both parties and a lack of beds is causing significant concern. In some cases, the illness has often progressed to a critical level both mentally and physically once they are finally assessed and diagnosed. I am told that once admitted to the inpatient eating disorder unit, the treatment is based on a medical model rather than a psychological model. This means the primary form of treatment in addressing the child's weight loss issues through supervised meals and forced feeds. I understand a psychiatrist may be, um, may be there to see a child to prescribe antipsychotic drugs or other forms of sedatives but not actually to treat their mental illness through um, therapy. It is understood that the focus of this model is to treat the physical challenges of the illness because executives believe any form of psychiatric counselling would be futile while the brain is starved and until the physical condition improves, despite anorexia being defined as a chronic mental illness. This is despite often elevated behaviour, psychosis, suicide attempt, attempts and self-harm that occurs during the hospital refeeding process. Security guards are positioned full-time at the entrance of the unit to stop runaways and to sit, assist at the heightened behaviour. Once again, the child gains an, un, an acceptable amount of weight. They are discharged where families are told they should engage in family-based therapy or seek psychiatric services. Unfortunately, I've been told this is ineffective in at least 20 per cent of cases. As one mother stated, this is all well and good, but my child doesn't get to be an outpatient because she's unable to manage successfully on her own. I'm supposed, am I supposed to just let her flounder in hospital with her mental state getting worse and wait and see? Another mother I spoke to said her daughter has been admitted to PCH six times and has been recently discharged, but the earliest appointment she could find with a psychi psychiatrist specialising in eating disorders, public or private, was in August. Where are these kids to go? The most severely ill children will be readmitted within days of being discharged as their weight inevitably plummets when they get home without being force fed and because their mental illness has not been treated. One mother said her daughter had spent most of the past nine months in hospital on a never ending cycle of hospital admission and readmission and self harm, and she remains on the ward with no psychological support, still not eating a full meal and no understanding on when she might go home or get any further treatment. These parents believe their children are being left to languish in a system that is, is not supported enough and not treating their their child's core mental illness. They are desperate for a better approach and more resources, and I appeal to you urgently 
to review the current treatment for the model for anorexia within Perth Children's Hospital to include a comprehensive psych psychiatric plan that allows these patients to receive the psychological help quickly, uh, as well as looking at uh, how quickly the assessment process is. I also appeal to you to commit more funds to address the growing issue within WA. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Minister for Health. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much to the Member for her grievance this morning and also to thank her for the rescheduling of it. Um, as the Member would be aware, we're responding to the lockdown announcements in Victoria and having to move fairly swiftly this morning uh, in terms of that response. Um, it, Deputy Speaker, uh, eat, the eat, eating disorders, particularly in our young children, is, is a debilitating disease. Um, it's, a, it's a very chronic uh, condition and one about which uh, there is long-term repercussions for people's health. And so it's important that we do take the opportunity and provide the resources that are necessary to, to, address, uh, to address it. Um, it. It impacts obviously the individuals, but it's, obviously, but it's also the families. And people around them as they try, as they struggle to deal with the behaviours and um, and other issues that come uh, with, with this particular condition. And Deputy Speaker, the number of outpatient referrals and admissions to Perth Children's Hospital for eating disorders has increased significantly in recent years, and this is consistent with increasing numbers both nationally and internationally. Um, as referrals and admissions continue to rise exponentially, the Eating Disorder Service has been, had to adapt its services to respond. The current EDS, or Eating Disorder Services Day program, has been paused to create capacity for a new transition program designed to medically stable in patients to, to access group therapy and meal support in preparation for discharge. The program commenced on Tuesday the 31st, the 30th of March and initial feedback suggested has been well received by both young people and their families. There is a re recognition that there is a service gap in relation to the need for dedicated inpatient eating disorder unit and child and adolescent health services looking at options for this at PCH. And um, parents and carers and interest groups have been advocating for this approach for many years and uh, we know we need to respond. Um, we recently uh, hosted a round table with families affected by eating disorders. It's important to hear from them in relation to their concerns ar around these um, specific issues. Uh, Deputy Speaker, we've had since uh, the, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, onset, we've had a significant increase in the number of people presenting with eating disorders. So the eating disorder services received 273 referrals in 2020, compared to 185 in 2019. Uh, so this is a 47.6% increase in referrals. But in December, uh, uh, 2020, the EDS had 32 referrals, the highest number of referrals in a month since the program started entering, uh, data was starting to be collected. The number of patients admitted to PCH with a diagnosis for an eating disorder has increased by 86% from 2019 to 2020, and this increased rate has been sustained. December 20 was the highest number of uh, admissions uh, on record. And readmissions for young people with an eating disorder on medical ward have increased by 50 per cent also. In, 20, in, in 2020, 57 per cent of all patients were readmitted with an eating disorder uh, within 28 days. So we know that we've got an issue and we know we've got um, something that needs to be addressed. But, uh, Deputy Speaker, I'm very proud to say that during the election, com the election campaign, the, Australian, the WA Labor Party made um, significant commitments around a statewide eating disorders service. And over $31 million was committed uh, for investing over the forward estimates. And the WA Eating Disorder Specialist Services, uh, the idea is to create a WA eating, uh, uh, statewide eating disorder service, and the specialist service will be a hub, which will be a centralised tertiary level service consisting of a statewide day program and early intervention. They would have community spokes, which would be consisting of a statewide eating disorder prevention campaign, a statewide school-based eating disorder prevention program, an expansion of the existing body esteem program and provision of community information and support groups 
for family members of individuals experiencing eating disorders and also having a clinical spoke to this hub and spoke model, which was consisting of two patient transition coordinators, one nurse-led medical monitoring service and one specialist multidisciplinary outpatient clinical pilot and additional WA Country Health Service staff. Uh, Deputy Speaker, as the member pointed out, this is a, this is a, a horrible uh, condition. It's a very difficult one to manage with, both, with uh, co-occurring uh, mental health and physical health uh, 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 issues or, or symptoms. And as a result of that, we have, um, it is very challenging to design services around it. Uh, like many aspects of our health system at the moment, we are being significant. We are under significant pressure in terms of the number of people presenting. As I said, 86% um, increase in relation to in inpatient um, admissions, and so we know that we need to, to bring resources to bear. The good news is that WA Labor and this lab and the McGowan Labor government has committed to introducing a statewide eating disorders program involving a $31 million investment over the forward estimates, and a very much looking forward to implementing that, that election commitment in the coming uh, months and years. Thank you, Minister. Government business, orders of the day. Government business, order of the day number one, supply bill 2021, second reading, adjourned debate. The member for Wanneroo. Nice to have you in the chair again to listen to me conclude my uh, contribution to the supply bill, and I won't I won't stand for much longer. But um, yesterday um, I focused really on the area of education and the um, significant investment that's coming to Wanneroo um, in my local schools. But I just wanted to spend uh, the last few minutes that I had uh, this morning just briefly touching on infrastructure. Um, that has been delivered and um, is being delivered in the northern suburbs and particularly in, in Wanneroo and how that impacts um, on the residents in my electorate. Of course, Metronet, we hear a lot about, is truly um, transformational. We, were we are going to have 72 kilometres of new passenger rail built and up to 18 new stations. Quite, quite phenomenal. As one of the largest single investments in public transport that the city has seen, Metronet will help positively change how people live and travel in Perth. And it's coming all the way to Yanchip. But the point that I really wanted to focus on um, right now is um, a big announcement that was made during the election campaign, and that relates to making Metronet and public transport in Western Australia more affordable. Um, the election commitment was made by the Minister for Transport to reduce the cost of public transport in the suburbs. And I think that's been missed a little bit, and uh, I'm very excited when we actually roll that out and people realise the significant difference it will m mean to people actually being able to afford to use public transport, particularly in the outer suburbs. Um, so the announcement um, referred to capping the fares for all metropolitan train and bus journeys at the cost of a two-zone ticket. And, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a true game change of the people in the northern suburbs who have to use public transport every day to get to work. The Smart Rider ticketing system will also receive a $24 million upgrade, so passengers will be able to choose to pay by credit card, debit card or on their smartphones. Under the plan, the maximum price a passenger will pay will be a two-zone ticket. For a standard trip, that means $4.90 in cash, $4.40 if you're using the standard Smart Rider, and $3.90 for the Smart Rider auto reload. And if travelling on a concession, and I have a daughter who travels to uni every day, this would be $2.10 in cash and $1.68 for the Smart Rider auto, auto reload. Um, and that program is due to start in January next year. Uh, as I said, Mr Deputy Speaker, this brings equity to public transport for people in my electorate who need it the most. And um, the infrastructure investment that the McGowan Labor government is putting into public transport is transformational and it's very important that we make it affordable and accessible to the general public. Um, I also just wanted to, for, for a minute, um, touch on the Mitchell Freeway extension. I was pleased that the Minister accepted my grievance um, this morning. That $232 million project 
will extend the freeway north from Hester Avenue to Romeo Road, and it's anticipated that more than 1,200 local jobs will be created, and it's on track to be completed by 2023. Of course, very importantly, as part of that works, it is really fantastic that we will see the dueling Wanneroo south and north of Romeo Road, which effectively means, um, members, that Wanneroo Road will be dueled all the way to Karabuda. It's quite extraordinary that that's going to happen. Um, I remember um, growing up in Yantchip and uh, going to Wanneroo High School and the single lane Wanneroo Road was this very bumpy, windy road and to now in a few short years see the completion of the duelling of Wanneroo Road all the way to Karabuda is quite, quite, um, quite mind-blowing to me, having lived in that area for a very long time. Also, the fact that the freeway is extending to Romeo Road is, is, is really quite transformational. Um, I grew up in Yanchip and uh, when I graduated from high school, I decided to attend Murdoch University to do my teaching degree. Of course, I would choose the closest university, not uh, from Yanchip. And in those days, travelling in my little Ford Escort to uni every day, the northernmost point of the freeway was Main Street in Aussie Park. Um, and I try to have that conversation with my daughter sometimes as I try to explain the infrastructure that is coming to the northern suburbs and the rail line all the way to Yanchip. And uh, uh, they don't quite under, uh, understand the significance and the change, change it is going to make for people living in those northern suburbs of Wanneroo, also of Butler and, of course, also of Burns Beach. Um, it's exciting times for the northern suburbs, and I'm very, very proud to be part of the McGowan Labor government, who has, in the last four years, and in this term and into the future, um, demonstrated quite clearly its commitment to the people in the northern suburbs. Thank you. Thank you, Member. Another member for Bateman. Uh, Mr. Speak, Mr. Acting, oh, Deputy Speaker, my apologies. Um, I rise today to contribute to the um, Supply Bill 2021. In my inaugural speech um, three weeks ago, I talked about the economy being in the service of the people. The McGowan Labor government's commitments and priorities well and truly reflect this value. As well as protecting Western Australians um, in what is one of the safest communities in the world during the COVID-19 pandemic, the McGowan government also responded with a $5.5 billion WA recovery plan. This plan focuses on three key areas, economy and industry, community and, of course, jobs creating infrastructure. The WA recovery plan has helped drive WA social and economic recovery across Western Australia. In fact, we now have not only the strongest economy in Australia, but one of the strongest in the world. Due to this, the McGowan Labor government is able to commit significant investment back into this state. Some examples of this include the fully funded $1.8 billion Women's and Babies Hospital. The construction of this will create, um, generate more than 1,400 jobs, but this is in particular something that I hold dear to my heart. With a sister who had preterm labours for all her children but lost her first to preterm labour, I know that Western Australia is leading research in this area and infrastructure and a facility like this will help support outcomes for women's and baby, women and babies in Western Australia. It's very exciting. Um, in addition to this, of course, we have record spending in mental health and we've heard about some of the challenges in this space this morning. Um, it's a very, very important area and, of course, 120 million of that is going directly into supporting youth um, and increasing mental health services for young people. Um, we have 1,100 additional police officers, one of the largest um, injections of police numbers um, in this state and certainly in recent history. Um, and importantly as well, we have a plan to create jobs and diversify our economy, particularly in green jobs. Now, we've heard a lot about infrastructure this morning and the Minister for Transport has been very busy on her feet already, um, describing all of the great projects that are happening across Western Australia. And Bateman is no different in benefiting from this um, record infrastructure. Um, for example, 
Um, in addition to the $370 million already invested by the McGowan Labor government in cycling and trail infrastructure, um, my community in Bateman is going to benefit from a number of improvements to the cycle pathways. Um, this includes the um, principal shared path on the Quinana Freeway between Mount Henry Bridge to Leach Highway, um, the Murdoch Drive connection, and of course, um, which you know just outside of my electorate, but of which people from my electorate will access and benefit from. And um, just this morning, driving down the freeway with my husband in the car, who is a keen cyclist, um, a pursuit that's shared by many people in Bateman, um, not by myself, but uh, <laughs> I'll pass on the lycra, but nonetheless, it's very popular. And he commented on the section that's currently under construction. I see progress every morning, Minister for Transport. It's very exciting to watch. It's, it's huge. And, and he, he was very excited because he described to me this morning about how he used to have to um, go down the, the back streets and then try to cross a particularly busy um, intersection. And he's very excited about that because, of course, his um, ride to work would be a lot more safer as, as well as others that are using that. So that's um, a very important part of, of creating that. Actually, I think it's 74 kilometres of cycling infrastructure now, all the way from Mandra, if you're so fit, um, all the way to the city. So that's, that's a very important piece of infrastructure. Um, of course, I'm driving on the freeway this morning. We now have a smart freeway. Um, and that's been uh, very important in um, decreasing the travel time you know, on what was at times very congested areas of the freeway. Um, we say it's a smart freeway going into the city and it's a dumb freeway coming out. <laughs> Uh, we hope we'll have smart freeways all the way, but we, I note the uh, extension of that smart freeway technology up into the northern suburbs, um, which is great for people in that region. But certainly we're benefiting from the smart freeway in the southern suburbs, and um, yeah, maybe we'll see where that goes <laughs> coming out of the city. But we're certainly, we're certainly very, very grateful for the, the commute into it. So um, there's some of the infrastructure projects that are benefiting um, Bateman, but I'd like to turn now to some of the local commitments that were made um, because it gives me a great opportunity to talk not only about those commitments but the way in which they're supporting people in Bateman and the great work that is already going on by people. Um, it, new to the job as I am, I don't think I will get tired of learning about the people and the organisations and groups that support our communities. It, it's almost endless. Um, and every day I'm learning about somebody new and the efforts that they put into to our community and I take my hat off to each and every one of those. Um, I'd like to start with schools. Um, as a previous teacher, of course, it's, um, education is very important to me and, um, of course, it's very important to the McGowan Labor government as well. Um, Ardross Primary School. When I went and visited this school, uh, I was just blown away by the energy um, in that school, um, led by Principal Sue Mickelson, um, but they have a focus, a whole of school focus on sustainability. Um, they've got a whole range of projects. Their, their gardens are magnificent. They've, they've all been trans, well, they're all native gardens, um, and the kids get involved. And so $80,000 by the McGowan Labor Government was a commitment to support their work in the area of sustainability, and they're going to use that money to upgrade to more energy efficient lighting, um, reduce their ongoing running costs and um, other projects that will support that whole school approach. A uh, much larger commitment was $1.5 million for Applecross Senior High School with Principal Paul Leach. Now this is for a new STEM classroom um, and that's a very exciting commitment and um, when I visited the school for their Anzac Day ceremony um, they were particularly excited about that. I met some of the Applecross Senior High School students when they were at the Synergy Solar Challenge. Um, so they're already well and truly involved in their STEM. Um, they love it and this, is, this commitment is going to really um, increase their capacity to deliver for the students of Applecross Senior High School. Uh, a much smaller commitment, $17,000 to Bateman Winthrop Scout Group. Now, this group um, is very active in our community. I joined with them in collecting some litter. Um, they're very active in their local area, and it's led by the Barra Scout leader, Glenn Elliott. Um, Glenn brings a huge amount of energy, not only to the Scouts, 
but he's also involved in the Bateman Primary School and he leads the fathering project there as well. So um, that $17,000 commitment is going to enable them to buy some canoes. Um, they're going to be able to access the river and engage in water safety activities. Um, and that's really going to enhance their capacity to um, engage their members and perhaps even get more families involved in what is a great um, group, an active group. Um, Blue Gum Park Tennis Club. President Colin Lorimer there, um, he approached me during the campaign and said, hey, you need to come down and, and meet our club members. Um, and from the moment I met with them, it was really clear the passion that they bring to that part of the community. Um, they're, they're a very large club. In fact, um, I think they're the largest in the southern um, metro area. Um, so a $60,000 commitment there is going to assist them to build a spectator stand um, and a shade structure. So particularly during our hot summers, that's going to be really important. There's a lot of grandparents who come down to support grandkids. Um, obviously parents, juniors, people of all ages. It, it truly is representative of the diversity in our community. So to have a safe and um, enjoyable facility there will, will really improve um, what Blue Gum Park Tennis Club are able to offer. So I commend them for that and I will work with them. Um, the project is more than $60,000. Um, so that's part funding um, from the McGowan Labor Government and I will work with them to, um, and with the community to identify um, the, the rest of that funding so they can get that project underway. Um, Cardinia Bowling Club. This was one of the first clubs that I had the pleasure of going to an event to after, in fact it was the first, after I was elected as a member for Bateman. Um, but it was one that I was engaged with throughout the campaign as well. I'm not a bowler. <laughs> I might not come as a surprise, but um, this club, the moment I walked into it, um, I was going to say bowled over. <laughs> I was bowled over. I'm going to say it. <laughs> I was bowled over by their passion. They are truly an inclusive club. Um, it, the, the volunteers, um, led by President Steve um, Brack, but just to confuse everyone, there's another Steve there as well who manages the bar, but really he, he manages a, a lot more than that. Um, Steve puts in more than a, the equivalent of a full-time job every week, more than 40 hours into that club, and he does it entirely as a volunteer. So it's, it's a significant um, contribution that is made by volunteers into the Cardinia community and, in fact, into the broader community. One of the things that Cardinia Bowling Club is very proud of is their um, commitment to the Bowl Ability Program. So this enables people with disabilities to engage in bowls. It's a statewide program. Um, it does require additional infrastructure, as you could imagine, to, to support that kind of a program um, with ramps and universal access. And Cardinia Bowling Club are extremely committed to that. Um, so I'm very, very proud to be able to um, commit to them, as part of the McGowan Labor Government, $121,000. This funding will enable them to fully fund um, the replacement of their shade sales. So that will increase the safety and comfort of players. Um, and I would like to congratulate Cardinia Bowling Club for their commitment to a truly inclusive club. Now, I used to play netball. Um, I, probably I should go to bowling. Um, <laughs> but Cardinia Netball Club, they're a fantastic little um, community club. The member for Willoughby is familiar with them because, of course, they used to be in his patch um, and he supported them very well. Um, they operate out of a um, shipping container where they store all their, con their um, equipment, um, which was a commitment by the member for <coughs> Willoughby. Um, but their courts are pretty average, um, I don't mind saying. Bitumen, um, the, the posts are pretty, pretty average. Um, so $80,000 from the Gowan Labor government will enable them to fully resurface to a modern and safe playing surface for this great club that really has gotten by with very little support. So um, very, very pleased to be able to, to do that. 
Um, bowling clubs seem to be a theme, and the Mount Pleasant Bowling Club is um, not um, a stranger to, to the commitment of $100,000 by the McGowan Labor government. This is a pretty big investment um, because it's going to support um, the um, relocation or, or the movement of Mel not for profit aged care um, provider Melville Cares um, to to become an anchor tenant, so to speak, into that facility. And so what, what the bowling club is looking to do there is create a, a more um, accessible club that, that caters to a wider range of people. Um, that's going to underpin the, the financial viability of the club, um, but really create a, a community space there. So that, um, that $100,000 is going to be going towards the total project cost of $330,000. Um, the rest has been committed, or I should say, sorry, $330,000 has been committed by the City of Melville, $100,000 by um, the Gowan Labor government. It's going to create a really great upgrade there with universal access um, and a state-of-the-art facility. Uh, Murdoch University Melville Football Club. This is a huge club in our area. Um, again, very passionate, run by many, many volunteers. Um, no stranger to my family with a son who plays there, um, loves it. In fact, two sons now, um, the second one, so thanks, there goes my weekends. Um, but <laughs> they love it, so 50,000, Saturdays and Sundays, I mean, seriously. <laughs> anyway, no sleep-ins, $50,000 to them. Um, so that, that is going to enable them to um, relocate some storage facilities down onto a new pitch that, so they don't have to sort of lug everything at quite a large distance. Um, and that'll go a long way to enable them to expand and to meet the demand that they have. Um, they've got a huge number of, of members and um, participants right from the junior level across to top level seniors. So um, that's a very exciting commitment. Pali Rugby Club, Palmyra, Palmyra Rugby Club. Um, my husband started playing for the Pally Pigs. Um, don't ask, but anyway. <laughs> it's um, $10,000 for them, um, and what they would like to do with that is to purchase two custom-made um, spectator marquees. So being a winter sport, I'm sure that will be um, appreciated by spectators, um, probably myself included, if I ever get down to stand in the cold and the rain to watch him play. Um, Piney Lakes Fence Dog Park. This is a commitment that will be shared with um, the City of Melville again. Um, this dog park will go um, in an area of Piney Lakes after quite a large amount of consultation by the City of Melville. Um, and it was extremely popular. This is a very, very well supported project. And I'm very excited to bring this to the people of Winthrop. Um, they will enjoy that and I know Winston will enjoy that. I may even invite the member for Bicton to cross boundaries and maybe bring Archie down for a, a play uh, when we get that delivered, so you'd be very welcome. Uh, South Perth Yacht Club. Um, probably unusual for members of a, a Labor government to be making commitments to yacht clubs. Uh, how, this is a very worthy project, um, I have to say, a very, very worthy commitment. This funding of $80,000 is going to support um, the purchase of a new rescue boat, uh, which in turn will be used for their sailability program. They have over 70 volunteers who turn up regularly every Wednesday to, I'm not sure that 70 turn up every Wednesday, but they have 70 people who regularly volunteer and every Wednesday this program delivers to people from again across the entire metro area, people with disabilities. And they get them out onto boats. They use all sorts of mechanisms to do that. They might put um, a bean bag on, on the deck of the boat. They've got they've customised equipment. They've customised boats so that people with a whole range of disabilities can get out there and enjoy being on our river um, and all of the beautiful amenity that that brings. So um, that's very well deserved, and I absolutely stand by that commitment. Um, and I look forward to them getting that new new boat. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, may I have an extension? Extension granted. Thank you. Um, I'm going to return now to Netball, to Tingara Netball Club, $100,000. Um, and this is going to be used actually as well. Brentwood Primary School will benefit significantly from this. So again, um, some of the netball clubs, in fact all of the netball clubs in our, in our southern area, do struggle for, for netball courts. They struggle for, for enough access 
to courts, being a very popular sport, of course. And Tingara Netball Club have a shared use agreement with Brentwood Primary School to use their courts for training. Um, unfortunately, the courts are situated under, well, they're situated on some beautiful trees, but these beautiful trees drop leaves and nuts, and that becomes a little bit unsafe in wet weather. The courts just aren't able to, again, be safely used by players. Um, so $100,000 there will upgrade that playing surface so that they're safe in all weather conditions. And of course, the primary school students there, I'm sure, will absolutely love those new playing courts. Um, recesses and lunches, they'll sure enjoy that very much. Um, one of the exciting, or one of the biggest um, and, and exciting commitments that were made was $200,000 to Tompkins Park. Now, this is going to a nature playground. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with the community to develop ideas, and particularly with young people in the community, um, to, to see what their vision is for this space. But it's situated um, in the Tompkins Park area, of course. Um, it's used by lots of sports, so families will be able to come and play rugby, cricket, um, and their children can come and safely and enjoy that area. We know that parks create um, lots of values to communities, and if you get a good park, families will actually come from, from across the region um, and they'll enjoy that space, and, and Tompkins Park being on the foreshore there is an absolutely stunning space. It's a great community asset, and it's, of course, a community asset that was protected by the McGowan Labor government. In fact, Ben Wyatt, Minister Wyatt, um, in the last term, um, protected that space by not allowing an area of Crown land to be used for the, the Wave Park proposal, and in doing so has protected that space for community use and community amenity into the future. Um, so the Tompkins Park playground, nature playground, will be an asset to that space, um, and I look forward to that being delivered. Um, and last but not least, the Wendellia Sports Association. This is a passionate group in uh, Morris Buzzacott Reserve Area in Cardinia. Um, they've got multiple sports there. They've recently worked very, very hard to deliver a new clubhouse area, um, led by President Andrew Ogden. Now, that was a, a big upgrade. They spent, a, well, they spent, I think, Member for Willoughby, you might know, more than a million dollars anyway. Um, and the, what they got, the value that they got for that was, was incredible. Um, so this small commitment of $20,000 is going to enable them to do a proper fit out, to get the furniture that they need in there, the outdoor furniture in particular, um, so they can use those beautiful new facilities comfortably. Um, so I would just again like to return to the fact that um, it's been a real pleasure and a joy as the newly elected member for Bateman to get out into our community and to, to support these groups um, and to learn more and more as I do every week about the level of commitment that's made by people in our community. And again, I'd like to thank them for it. I'm particularly proud as a member of the McGowan Labor government to be able to support some of these groups and, um, of course, work with all others to deliver. And uh, I'd like to commend the Supply Bill 2021. Thank you. Thank you very much, Member. Members, the question is the bill now be read a second time. The Member for Riverton. Southern Deputy River. Speaker. Southern River, sorry. <laughs> I uh, have been a member of the uh, Riverton <laughs> Scout Group for 30 years, <laughs> but uh, I do represent Southern River. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. I oh, rise to uh, also make some contributions and comment on Stay. the supply bill and talk about all of the, the past and the current and the planned projects that are happening in your community and my community, uh, all underpinned, of course, by this government's fantastic achievement of committing to local jobs. So local jobs for a more projects now than were done before, so that your family and my family gets the work out of government projects, apprenticeships, training. So the funds and the work stays here in WA and uh, we all get a chance to share in that. Um, the first thing I'd like to talk to members about uh, is uh, a petition that I handed in yesterday to the parliament, and members would be aware, uh, and that is a, our commitment towards building new chicanes in Huntingdale. Now, um, and removing speed bumps. Um, members would be aware in Huntingdale, uh, last election there was a, a commitment that we made and delivered on to remove uh, all of the speed bumps off Gay Street. Um, we now 
uh, after successfully removing those and creating chicanes uh, on Gay Street, after community feedback, after that draft pilot program, uh, we then made a commitment of $475,000 at this election, which we've now begun the process for as well, to now remove all of the speed bumps uh, and build chicanes now on Harpenden Street in Huntingdale. Members, uh, speed bumps, you know, none of us in this chamber, of course, would ever speed or do things inappropriately. Um, and, you know, we all do the right thing. Um, what we found in my community in terms of speed bumps, though, is that uh, the idiots, you and I slow down, but the idiots don't. Uh, so if they're not slowing down vehicles, then what is the purpose of them? Um, we found after, as I said, a lot of community consultation that uh, chicanes were a much better way to ensure that every vehicle, every car, every family gets to be safe and secure um, in their transport. Um, so, uh, members, uh, we've now met with the council. Um, we've now begun the process. Last time, um, in the 2017 election, it took us about 18 months to do the design of the new chicanes, the consult with the community, and then the build. Um, we have. Uh, announced that timeline. I've now met with the council CEO um, and discussed how we're going to implement that. Um, we are now consulting uh, for the community. I do encourage the community to reach out to terry.healy at mp.wa.gov.au. Let me know your thoughts about the locations of these chicanes. The community needs to engage with us. We'll be writing to people, holding community forums. I'll still be door knocking through the area and talking to people, but please don't hesitate to reach out to us. We're hoping to have some of those initial concepts and plans available soon, and we'll certainly make those available to you. Members, uh, I'd like to talk about the, about the multi-million dollar youth plaza that uh, Mark McGowan and I made a promise to, to be built at Sutherlands Park. So our area ha has wonderful toddler parks. We're growing and building and delivering on the infrastructure that our outer suburb area, outer suburbs area needs. Um, but one of the things that is lacking is a facility that services an older, um, the older youth um, portion of our community. Um, after a, a extensive consultation, um, we, uh, the government, made a contribution, a commitment of $2 million towards that youth plaza. Now, a youth plaza uh, is more than just a skate park. It's more than just a, a facility. Um, we've, we've decided on the location to be Sutherlands Park. We think the best location is on the corner of Home Street and Southern River Road um, that allows us to keep the ovals space and really build a great development right alongside and adjacent to the new shopping centres and the new growing part of that area. Um, now, the Youth Plaza uh, is modelled originally on the concept of the, the Youth Plaza in Fremantle, um, but uh, since then we've also, after a lot of consultation, I was down at the Margaret River Youth Plaza recently, um, we've modelled a lot on it on the Scarborough Beach Youth Plaza. So uh, basically we're looking at building a very substantial toddler park um, that's part of the development. We're looking at a skate park uh, that doesn't have a deep bowl. Uh, after a lot of the community consultation that we've done so far in the first phase of that, um, a deep bowl is not what the majority of, of our residents are after. They're after something that's more long uh, stretches for, for younger people and uh, people to utilise um, is what we're going to, in, to engage in. Um, and it's a place where, uh, because it's out in the open, it's alongside our shopping centres. Out some of our other skate parks, by the way, are, are fantastic, but there's a perception of, of security. There's a perception that they're not um, the safest places because of lighting, because of positioning. So by placing this out on main roads, uh, with safety, of course, with fences and, and that, but within the public view, we create a safe area by, through that. By having uh, a very, very nice toddler park there as well, uh, dads like me, uh, when I'm there with my two and four year old, I'm actually helping create passive surveillance of the area. We're actually creating an active area with playgrounds and, and uh, you know, teams to, to utilise so that they can be active uh, and social and not necessarily hanging out in a shopping centre or in uh, areas where you know, some of the community feel that that's not the right thing. Um, we're also looking to build um, a, a half basketball court as part of the developments there. Um, 
Again, members, uh, we really, really appreciated the community that reached out to us and told us what you'd like to be designed and built. Um, like I said, the election was fairly clear. You've elected us to do it and we are delivering on it. Um, we have met with the council. We have sat down and begun a process where there is a working party that will meet every couple, of, every couple of months with myself and the Chief Executive Officer to talk about all of those milestones, designs and builds. Um, so the next phase of the design has been uh, completed. We're uh, at Caledonia and a couple of schools this week. We're going around to all the local primary schools, talking with families, students and young people about what they would like to be designed. Um, you can go to my website terryhealy.com.au and you can uh, fill out the Youth Plaza consultation survey there or you can email my office and let us know what you'd like um, and we'll keep you involved and informed as we progress through that. Members, uh, we also made a commitment of $100,000 towards the Yangtze Ave playground development. And that's in Southern River. Um, it's an area that has uh, some very, very smaller homes, uh, so smaller lot sizes, I should say, um, and there's a very, very large um, barren park that was built there. Um, I campaigned uh, in 2018, I presented a petition and a campaign to the council to upgrade that park. Um, unfortunately the council was not able to find the funds to do that. Uh, I very controversially suggested that some of the councillors could give up their travel allowances for the year um, to find the funds. That was not met with much uh, positivity from the councillors. Um, but uh, look, at the most recent election, we made a commitment of $100,000 towards building a new park there. Um, the consultation that we've done so far in this initial phase has been um, $50,000 to be allocated towards a soft play playground with kids' swings, slides, and we're hoping to have some designs available soon. Um, that's probably one of the first projects that we're seeking to get built um, because there's more or less a, a large number of consensus there on the first half uh, of that. And we're also looking, after talking with so many families in the area, we're also looking at some shade sales and seating. Um, but again, if you're interested in that patch of the Yangtze Ave, uh, please, uh, the Yangtze Ave playground, please don't hesitate to reach out to my website, terryhealy.com.au, uh, or uh, go to my uh, email or phone my office to let us know what you'd like for us to build and we're happy to send you the designs and engage with the community as we do that. Members, uh, we've also announced an extension of the hours at Gosnell's police station. Uh, one of the very, very popular, uh, well-received things that we did uh, in the last term was extend the hours at Canningvale police station. Um, most members would know a lot of police stations in our area, whilst they're staffed 24-hour uh, um, in terms of the police are always out there driving around, being on patrol. Our police stations themselves, the one in Canningvale used to shut at 4pm, uh, we extended that till 7pm. So the walk-in hours um, from a weekday went from a 4pm close to a 7pm close. Um, very, very popular for the area in terms of, we've still got our 24 hour stations at Armidale and, and Cannington, um, but when people needed documents signed, statements submitted, dropping off footage about things that they've witnessed, um, you know, a variety of different customer service or uh, customer desk services, um, we found those were far easier for the community to access by being able to go to their local police station. Um, so uh, the Minister, I presented a petition very, very recently, the community endorsed our position to extend the hours at Gosnell's police station. Uh, Gosnell's police station was still, uh, whilst we extended the hours at Canningvale station, we had not extended them to uh, Gosnells, we're now going to be doing that. So from a 4pm close to a 7pm close at the two local police stations in our area, as well as an increase in police numbers. The highest 1,100 new police officers to be recruited, the largest in Western Australian history, um, a fantastic um, addition. Now there's always more work to be done, um, but we think that a good first start is more hours and more police in our area. Um, Members, uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Gosnells Toy Library. Um, I'd like to commend Member for Thornley, Chris Talentire, who made a contribution of $10,000 uh, 
uh, towards the Gosnells Toy Library to expand um, the equipment upgrades and the things that they do. I'd like to acknowledge the great work that the Gosnells Toy Library have done over the last 45 years in our area. Um, whilst it's based in the member for Thornley's electorate, it's on the border of ours and services all of the families in all of Gosnells. Um, it's a fantastic facility where uh, you can have access to toys and games, jigsaws, over a thousand items. I've been there uh, many times, it's, it's, it's brilliant. Um, I'd like to acknowledge two things. First of all, uh, Bun Bun, the official mascot, the, the local rabbit of the area, uh, who is the unofficial mascot of the Gosnells Toy Library. And more importantly, I'd also like to acknowledge that the Toy Library, uh, Gosnells Toy Library was recognised as the Gosnells Toy Library of the Year uh, for 2021 for medium large toy libraries uh, by Toy Libraries Australia. A very, very well uh, earned, uh, very, very well earned um, award and I say congratulations. Members, I'd like to uh, mention the Sikh temple in my community. We were there on the weekend with the Minister for Multicultural uh, Interests uh, for their open day. Um, we, I, I, whilst it's located in my electorate, it's, uh, the, the, the Sikh temple in my community is, uh, services numerous, numerous electorates. Um, we're making a contribution of $40,000 towards rain protection um, for the Sikh temple. It was a very, very rainy day on Sunday. It's a pity we haven't had a chance to install them yet, but we're doing that as fast as we can. So at the moment, um, when we have a, different language classes and different facilities on the side of the building, um, unfortunately, the area is getting, um, you know, students are getting wet, young families are getting wet um, when they're trying to access the services of the temple. Um, the $40,000 that we've contributed, excuse me, um, will allow us, will allow the temple to employ local people to build better rain protection so more people can use that facility. The, uh, I'd like to mention the Hindu temple. Uh, we are also making a contribution of $25,000 towards the Hindu temple in my electorate. Again, a facility that services families from around uh, Perth and Western Australia. Um, we are making a contribution of $25,000 to redo the uh, underground, uh, the under uh, under the floor, there are a number of heating elements that heat the tiles. Um, members would be aware that uh, in winter, especially on cold days like we've got right now, it's very, very difficult for those devotees. Um, and we're trying to make it more comfortable for them to replace some of that ageing infrastructure. Again, employ local people and also uh, build up that shared community infrastructure. And I wish the Hindu temple very, very well. I'd like to acknowledge the member for Darling Range and his contribution towards the Animal Protection Society uh, in my electorate. Um, we went out there with the member for Armidale and the member for Darling Range recently and spoke to the Animal Protection Society about the new facilities that they can do with the grant that's, that's there to upgrade their vet facilities. Um, at the moment, they have a bit of a, a bad circle where they need to upgrade their facilities so they can attract the right vets and to do the right work, um, which gets some of the income. But without uh, accessing the, the veterinary services and the clientele to a degree, they also can't raise the capital. This is a circuit breaker. I think another great example of the McGowan government, uh, led by the member for Darling Range, in contributing uh, essential shared job infrastructure that benefits not only the families in my, sorry, not only the humans in my electorate, but also the dogs and the cats. Um, members, I, it would be remiss of me if I was talking about the past and the current and the planned projects, not to mention the Metronet project. Uh, members would be aware, after many, many years of broken promises by the previous government of every election promising to build a train station and a train line, uh, which was never done, uh, we broke ground and commenced work in mid-2019 on the train line project. Um, Two Canning Vale train stations, Nicholson Road and Ranford Road, connected bus routes, services, um, you know, Metronet is, is bigger than I could even uh, speak about in, in, in several days of Parliament, but the Thornley Coburn line is well underway, employing local people on the works, employing local companies to do the works, building the rail cars here in Western Australia. Um, the Premier was out recently uh, when we pushed the button to begin the piling. Uh, works on the extension and widening of Rantford Road Bridge, which is an extension of part of these works. Um, so we're going from a four-lane bridge to an eight-lane bridge at Rantford Road. Um, the Premier came and we pushed the button and began all the works. And all the great local workers have been doing great work there since. Um, about a week ago, the largest T-Roth beams um, 
in, ever built uh, were constructed here in Perth, 50 metre beams. Ten of them were placed uh, over the first half of the widening of that bridge. Um, and uh, a very fantastic extension of works. Um, and again, people in my community will start to see the, um, the changes when the traffic gets diverted soon uh, over the other half of that bridge while we build the other half. Um, and I think members would be aware that uh, you know, we're, we're approaching the end of works. And I appreciate the patience of my community for some of those delays. And it will now, hopefully by the end of this year, best case scenario, depends on how much it rains, we'll have uh, the bridge completed and people able to access all of those services. Um, I'd like to talk about some of the bus stop upgrades that are going to be happening in my community. Um, members would be aware uh, I've been running some pretty uh, full-on and serious community campaigns for the last several years about upgrading the bus stop infrastructure. So we don't have enough bus routes in our area and we've already added some new bus routes and there are more coming. Um, Deputy Speaker, I seek an extension. Extension granted. Thank you very much. Members, uh, so we've made a commitment and after running a very long campaign of extending, uh, about talking about the new bus stop infrastructure that's needed, um, we made a commitment of $200,000 to upgrading bus stops in Canningvale, upgrading bus stops in Huntingdale, upgrading bus stops in Gosnells, and upgrading bus stops in Southern River. Um, my view is that uh, an orange pole is great, but what we really need is a seat and a shelter. For people to be able to access the new bus services and the new train services, um, rail, rain, hail or shine, um, we're going to need to upgrade some of that infrastructure. Now, it's my view that the best location for those bus stop upgrades uh, are on um, main roads, the way people can access them, but I think it's also important that the, um, when we select which bus stops to upgrade, it's, um, I think we should be favouring, and we'll do a community consultation again on this, um, I think we should be upgrading bus stops that are not outside people's homes on their front verge, on the council verge. I think those orange poles uh, have been there for some time and that's existing infrastructure. The best location I think after, you know, what people have been telling me as well, the best locations are on the sides of properties, on main roads that don't impact the front areas of people's council verges. Now, um, we'll sit down with families in the area. Um, if you would like to let me know which bus stops you would like to upgrade, um, we have committed funding for at least 10 of those. Uh, so that's 10 lots of $20,000 upgrades and working with the council to upgrade those bus stops. Uh, on Wharton Road, on Garden Street, all around the community. Um, please feel free to go to my website, terryhealy.com.au, uh, or go to my, um, my office and give us a call or send us your details and let us know your feedback about where you would like um, the bus stops to be upgraded. And can I also place on record, I appreciate all of those families who have signed my petitions and engaged with me and let me know about those things that needed to be done. Members, I'd like to talk about some of the very, very uh, fantastic education commitments, um, and I'll leave the training commitments for another, uh, another, another time. And I'm just going to focus on all of the things that is being committed to, that has been committed to. Um, schools and education across Western Australia, in the metropolitan region, in the re in metropolitan area, and in the regions, every region, there are significant infrastructure upgrades. There are fantastic staffing and re human resource upgrades and additions that are being done to look after all of the people and all the families in our areas. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge the previous term, first of all, we returned education assistance back into classrooms. As we promised to do, we did. 300 FTE back into classrooms. Um, there was a TAFE fee freeze for the previous term of government, which has been committed to again. I can't emphasise how important that has been. There are new science labs being built in schools. There are, um, members would be aware, at the election we made a promise of additional career counsellors to be spread across uh, high schools all across Western Australia. In your electorate, in my electorate, you will have additional career counsellors placed into your schools on a permanent basis that will be able to assist with young people and those career conversations. 
As a career teacher myself, I can't emphasise how important that is. The schools will be able to work out whether they're placed in the vet office, the careers office, um, subject selection. It's worth reaching out to your schools now and talking to them about how they're going to utilise those additional places. When we talk about um, addressing uh, the skills situation and the shortage that's been brought about by the COVID scenario and you know, we've got a number of different booms that are going on in housing and construction, in mining sectors. We've got a number of skill shortages in a number of different sectors. Um, one of the key things is trying to match up young people to their careers and get them the skills and training that equips them for life. And the Career Counselor Program that we've committed to, uh, Acting Speaker, uh, will be a fantastic addition to schools, like I said, all around Western Australia. There is a funding also being made for a Year 9 Taster program. Now what that's going to do, again, this is available in every single high school. And I thank all of the Labor MLAs uh, for helping deliver that. Um, a Year 9 Taster program is going to be available for uh, schools to give basically what it says, taste programs um, so young people can see, because young people, they don't know what they don't know. If they want to be a hairdresser or a brickie or a doctor or an engineer, there are a number of different career paths to take. And the way our system often works is that you've got to start making some decisions about what direction you want to do from some time in year 10. What we, what we are seeking to do is make investments so that schools and TAFEs can coordinate a year nine taster program um, and make facilities and courses available um, and it's not, there's nothing wrong with a year nine finding out they don't want to be a brickie or they don't want to be an engineer by doing these programs. What you do and what you experience and what you taste um, also helps you find out what you want to be. I certainly remember in year 10 I wanted to be a cop, uh, a police officer. In year 11 I wanted to be a, a, a police, uh, sorry, a chef. And in year 12 I decided I want to become a teacher. Um, I think that the more people can uh, access and get across the variety of different things, the better. Um, I also ran a program when I was the careers coordinator at Southern River College called um, Speed Careers. We'd bring 40 different careers into the big gym and uh, we would basically have, you know, we'd have education assistants. We'd have brickies, engineers, doctors, teachers, a variety, whatever the students would ask us to, uh, that they were interested in, we would bring them in. And they'd have a five minute, sort of like speed dating a five minute session and we just sort of ring a place of music and they'd move around and they got a chance to experience um, the different things that are available to them so they can then look at the different university open days, the Skills West Expos, the career opportunities and explore those more. Members, um, student wellbeing is a very, very high priority of this government. Members will be aware that uh, we're investing $42 million in additional 100 100 additional psychologists in our schools. Again, this is going to benefit every single member in this chamber. Every single community is crying out for more access for our student wellbeing. So in government and non-government schools, there'll be 100 extra school psychologists. Members will be aware there's currently um, 250 or so FTE frontline school psychologists. There's a number of supervising psychologists and lead psychologists. Um, this is gonna be a fantastic program. In addition, um, there's another $21 million to expanding chaplaincy services. So for schools that don't uh, necessarily have a chaplaincy service now, expanding those services that are available to our young people. Um, we've already announced, um, uh, well, sorry, we implemented in the last term of government the direct to market policy. Um, members be aware, very popular of PNS program, um, which was basically a uh, we allowed up to previous, uh, previously the number was to $20,000 for schools and PNFs to source their own local builder. We're extending that to $50,000. So a project uh, that a PNF or a school would like to do often if they went through the government provider um, or the contracted provider, sometimes, too often than not, uh, the contractor, the match, the price didn't match what you'd find in local industry. It was often quite escalated. So we changed the rules last term to allow PNCs and schools to reach out for projects up to $20,000. Um, you know, that was for air conditioning, 
minor electrical work, furniture, carpentry, some of those small jobs that were easier to, to fund. Now what we found from feedback is that some people said, well as soon as it ticked over to $21,000, they then had to go to the government provider and it ended up being $40,000. So with extended at $50,000, members, I would certainly encourage when you're talking to your PNCs, make sure they're aware that we listened in our previous term of government and we've extended that to $50,000 for their works that they can um, they can now have a choice. They can still go with the government contracted provider, but they can, um, they can do that a little bit differently. Um, members, uh, you also be aware that we've also initiated one of the largest STEM building infrastructure programs in schools in Western Australian history. $136 million for primary schools and secondary schools to build science labs. Now, in the previous term of government, we built 200 new science labs in primary schools. Uh, my, uh, one of my schools, Ashburton Drive Primary School, where I'm at tomorrow, um, they benefited from one of these fantastic new um, schools. And now we're providing access to every single school in Western Australia to some form of STEM infrastructure grants. And we've got our first ever state STEM skills strategy. Um, members would be aware uh, schools that have less than five, uh, less than 50 students can access a grant of $5,000. Um, if you've got up to 100 students, there's $10,000. The majority of primary schools, though, that have uh, more than 100 students, you will have, those schools will be able to access $25,000 to re, uh, um, to build and reformat a specialist classroom. Now, you'll be reached out to, uh, the department is reaching out to schools now to talk uh, with those schools. If the school doesn't have room necessarily, if a school is quite uh, enrolled or uh, high enrolled and they can't spare a classroom, then we'll make available to them a grant of up to $40,000 for this, and then they can choose to purchase the equipment if they can't create the specialist lab. Again, every single MLA, this will be available to your primary schools and will be built. And they can choose to build 3D scanners, 3D printers, specialist learning materials, microscopes, robotics, dinosaur models, worm farms. These are facilities that will equip and encourage um, real infrastructure, real hands-on learning for all of the young people in our schools. Now again, the school chooses their equipment and I encourage all the MLAs to liaise with their schools as to what is going to be built. Um, members, there is uh, a very, very large number of high schools and district high schools that are being um, significantly rebuilt, but also in terms of the STEM facilities, there will be uh, a very, very high focus on those regional um, uh, high schools and metro high schools to, to equip their um, to equip their uh, facilities for the future. Um, just in closing, uh, I'd just like to comment on uh, one of my staffers. So when I talk about all of the past and current and planned projects, the last four years, uh, Kelly pilgrim Byrne has been in my office and has done an incredible, uh, an incredible role. Um, she has dealt with all of my constituent campaigns, all of my liaison, and all of these projects. I want to thank her for her service uh, and what she has done. She and her family run multiple businesses. They're photographers, boarding kennels, dog champions. Um, also, um, they have also been uh, her family, Kelly, her wife Sam and their daughter, um, uh, have been a, an incredible leader in our community. Most members would know um, they were also the first couple to be married under the same-sex marriage laws. Um, first in Western Australia, on the steps of this parliament, uh, two or three years ago, um, I was actually their celebrant, um, but on the steps of parliament at midnight, they were the first same-sex couple to be married when marriage equality became law here in Western Australia. I thank them for their service and I appreciate all that they've done for our community. Acting Speaker, thank you. Acting Madam Speaker. Member for Murray Wellington. Thank you. Today I rise to speak to the House about the progress already happening in Murray Wellington under the 41st Government of WA. Can I please start off in acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we meet, the Wajuk people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the Binjarup people of Pinjarra and surrounds as the custodians of the land on which my electorate is situated. As 
As we head into Reconciliation Week, I was proud to present Harvey CRC last week a Lottery West grant of $136,000 to continue their Indigenous language and cultural program. It was also wonderful to have representation from the Philippine community looking at a joint collaboration of cultural interests. Congratulations Tracy ann and Leslie Eugel for all the work and effort you have put into a fantastic cultural program. As we start on this new term of government, we have made tremendous strides and building great momentum across Western Australia, with many more exciting projects to come. I am proud to have been re-elected to represent the people of Murray Bullington and the communities within. And I'm passionate about setting a precedent about what this tremendous community should expect from a local and vocal representative. Our communities are innovative, educated, loyal, hardworking, proud, dedicated and resilient in the face of adversity. The people of Murray Wellington know what they want from a government. We will work with our communities to ensure their needs are met into the future. We'll ensure our children have the future they so richly deserve and providing valuable employment opportunities across a range of fields is vital. We need initiatives that promote and support local jobs as regional employment creates an industry that will foster local business and community growth. Acting Speaker, the McGowan Labor Government was re-elected in March 2021 with a strong ambition to continue to deliver much needed projects and to deliver more across WA. The McGowan Government did their research, listened to the communities and have started to deliver on each one of those election commitments. The McGowan government is committed to Murray Wellington. I am committed to Murray Wellington. Already we have started contacting the 73 different community groups across Murray Wellington to make good on our promise to invest in this, these vital community organisations. By replacing uniforms, sporting equipment, update walking trails, providing much needed resources to youth groups. We're kick-starting community garden projects and even restoring the little old library cabinet in Cookinup. An all access viewing boardwalk for beautiful Preston Beach. War memorial upgrades across Murray Wellington. These are just a few commitments that are being rolled out over the coming months. These are not large projects that will make the front page of the news, but these are projects that will go a long way in the regional communities we have in Murray Wellington. Acting Speaker, last week the Premier paid a visit down to the beautiful town of Aruna, smack bang in the middle of Murray Wellington, to meet with Shire President Mike Wormsley, Shire CEO Dean Unsworth, Shire Vice President Naomi Purcell and Shire Councillor Vince Vitale to get an update on the $1.3 million committed to revitalising the town centre of Raruna. The precinct in the heart of Raruna includes open grass areas for community events, a nature play area and a playground, an all-ages skate park and pump track, accessible toilets and landscaping. This investment will help return the majestic town of Raruna to its glory providing a refreshed town centre for both residents and visitors. This will keep the community strong by connecting local families and helping keep locals active and healthy. The Shire informs me that work will be underway by the end of this year. It was a very busy week last week. We not only had the Premier Gracie's presence in Murray Wellington, but we also had the Honourable Alana McTiernan come to visit the region to turn the sod on the new Western Australian Food Innovation Precinct at the Peel Business Park in Nandula. Acting Speaker, work is underway on the Western Australian Food Innovation Precinct, the state's centre of excellence for research, development, commercialisation of new agri-tech and value-added food. The $21.7 million precinct, located within the Peel Business Park in Nambula, will be an open access facility comprising of R&D capabilities, an innovation centre and a production warehouse. It is intended to be a centre of excellence to enable commercial research and development, prototype and market testing of food and beverage products 
and networking for WA food producers. The McGowan government has committed $10 million to develop the food, Peel Food Technology Facility within the precinct, a 600 square metre manufacturing space to allow producers to develop and test new value added food products and $2.5 million towards a $3.85 million enterprise support program in partnership with the Shire of Murray to help activate the precinct. Through the enterprise support program, grants will be available to businesses to support access to innovation opportunities, leading edge research capabilities, incubation space and technologies through the WA Food Innovation Precinct. Acting Speaker. Other key tenants at the precinct include Murdoch University to run the research and development facility. They will also deliver a food science and nutrition Bachelor of Science degree. Grow Hub have signed a lease to operate the precinct's innovation centre, a one-stop shop for agribusinesses and enterprises featuring a co-working co space consulting services and industry support, and Spinifex Brewery to run the precinct's warehousing facility and establish their brewer at the precinct. And may I add that the Bushfire Centre at Excellence next door are very happy about Spinifex Brewery going in next door. <laughs> the Western Australian Food Innovation Precinct is supported by funding from the Australian Government's Regional Growth Fund. On the subject of the Peel Business Park, Expressions of interest are now open for stage two at the park in Nambula. The first 120 hectares of the 1,000 hectare park has already been developed with all lots sold. Stage one is now complete, following the investment of more than $20 million in major infrastructure extension works. Once operational, occupants in stage one are expected to deliver more than 250 ongoing jobs and contribute $73 million to the local economy each year. The next stage will follow a series of significant milestones achieved at Peel Business Park over the next six months, including the opening of the Department of Fire and Emergency Services $80 million purpose-built bushfire centre of excellence, which is currently running. The centre of excellence, an Australian first, provides a location for learning based on the best academic, scientific and traditional Aboriginal land management practices. Also part of stage one at the park is Australia's first renewable energy industrial microgrid, delivered by a local Peel renewable energy company, which is expected to save businesses at Peel Business Park up to 30% in electricity costs as compared to regular tariffs. Acting Speaker. On Monday, the Minister for Emergency Services the Honourable Rhys Whitby came to Murray Wellington to check out the state-of-the-art Bushfire Centre of Excellence and to meet many of the wonderful volunteers and paid emergency service workers from across Murray Wellington. While on the visit, visit, the Minister also put his Minister for Racing and Gaming hat on and spent some time at the Pinjarra Paceway. It was raised the need for light towers to enhance the facilities and open up to a multi-purpose entertainment venue. The Pinjarra Harness Racing Club is the largest harness racing club outside of the Perth metro area and is featured on the national racing schedule. We took a drive down the South West Highway to visit the wonderful and dedicated volunteers at the Raruna Volunteer Fire and Rescue Service. We discussed the need for expansion to accommodate the growing number of volunteers, in particular women. In Murray Wellington, there is 23 volunteer and full-time emergency service groups. Murray Wellington has a dedicated, loyal volunteer group from the emergency service to sporting groups. Last week was National Volunteer Week, and I attended some events across the electorate to commemorate and thank our tireless volunteers that volunteer in all fields. The State Government recognised 166 of these Western Australians for their long-standing commitment to volunteering at the WA Volunteer Service Awards, and I'm proud to say that four of these volunteers come from the amazing electorate of Murray Wellington. I'd like to congratulate Anna and Jack Deguja, volunteer 
from the St Vincent de Paul Society of WA. Bruce Warren from Pinjarra for his work at the Mandra Volunteer Fire and Rescue. And my friend and ex-Mayor ex of Quinana, Dave Nelson for his long-running volunteer at the Lions Club of Quinana. Speaker. Murray Wellington is a hive of activity for tourism. From locals to people from all over the state come to Murray Wellington to indulge in the beautiful settings and the surroundings it has to offer. From the pristine beaches of Preston Beach, Binny Up and Mile Up, to the beautiful forest of Dwelling Up, natural lakes, rivers and forests complement the man-made dams of Aruna, Loke Brook and Harvey, where locals and tourists alike enjoy. The McGowan government is committed to the tourism industry. We recognise the beauty of Murray Wellington and its potential to be one of the best tourist destinations in Western Australia. Acting Speaker. The recognition and potential already speaks for itself. As one of the towns in Murray Wellington was recently awarded the title of Western Australia's top small tourism town in the GWN7 Top Tourism Town Awards. This is no accident. This achievement has been a culmination of years of successful collaboration between committed locals and a committed state government proud of showcasing the remarkable beauty of the land and their locals. The McGowan government has committed to helping the tourism industry in Dwelling Up. With a commitment to back the Dwelling Up 100, one of the biggest mountain bike riding events in Australia. We have also delivered $150,000 to complete a state-of-the-art technology fit-out of the Dwelling Up Trails and Visitor Centre, making it a state and potentially nationally acclaimed iconic trails and tourism centre, promoting Dwelling Up and the Great Shire of Murray and Peel region. We have committed millions, millions to the trails to ensure they are international standard to attract the best of the best at top international and national levels. These are just some of the projects that the State Government has delivered alongside the Shire of Murray and the Federal Government. Dwelling Up's transformation was initiated by the town's residents several years ago. A few years ago, Dwelling Up was a hidden treasure, but in recent years, scenic day trip locations like Lane Pool Reserve, South Dandelup Dam and its amazing mountain bike trail scene has seen it become incredibly popular. Acting Speaker, I stand with the community as a whole and am calling on the federal and state governments to ensure this pristine, idyllic, culturally significant region stays this way without the threat of potential mining throughout the surrounds of Dwelling Up, preventing the trails through mining areas and protecting the integrity of these renowned forests. It's a place where nature, adventure and culture combine for a truly unique destination with a little bit of everything that makes it so special. I'd like to make a special mention to the Shire of Murray CEO, Dean Unsworth, and the Shire of Murray President, David Bolt, for listening to the locals, in particular the Dwelling Up Compact, and raising the vision they had for Dwelling Up so the state government could help. Thank you to all those who voted. The public vote made up 70 per cent of the town's score, with the other 30 per cent decided by a panel of industry judges. Dwelling Up will now go into the national competition for a chance to win the title of Australia's small, top small tourist town. Go Dwelling Up. Acting Speaker. Just a timely reminder, next weekend is WA Day long weekend. So if you have no plans, go and check out Dwelling Up or one of the other amazing towns in Murray Wellington. We have our annual um, Pinjarra Festival, held around the beautiful Eden Vale Historic Precinct. Up the road is the St Joseph's Primary Fair, and next door a very significant celebration of the Pinjarra Senior High School Centenary Celebrations. The weekend will cultivate into a great celebration of history, local produce, crafts and community coming together to celebrate Pinjarra. You will not be disappointed. Down the other end of the electorate in Lachenault, I want to give a huge shout out to the Lachenault Cricket Club. Club President Angelo D'Agostino 
emailed my office during the week to notify me that their club was awarded Cricket Australia's Community Cricket Club of the Year 2020-2021. The club was nominated for the award when they won the Wackers Country Cric Community Cricket Club of the Year. The criteria on which the club was judged on was a community cricket club that actively creates welcoming environments and seeks to create sustainable participation and growth through good governance, volunteer support and inclusive on-field programs. Angelo informs me that some time ago when he took the role, a senior member of WA Cricket told him to take the time to develop their own culture. He thinks he can safely say they have done that and they have been recognised for that, and I agree with Angelo. Acting Speaker, how good is Murray Wellington? We have the best tourist town in WA, the best community cricket club, Australia's best meat pies, and <laughs> WA's favourite fish and chip shop, just to name a few things. I think I can say it's the best electorate in the state. <laughs> <laughs> The Leshenault Cricket Club shares facility with five other sporting clubs. Forming the Leshenault Sporting Association, I met with Angelo and the executive team last year to discuss how the McGowan government can assist the club and the association to progress. We will be delivering 100,000 towards a new, new drop in cricket pitch at the sporting grounds, which will start a chain reaction of events for the association, meaning the facilities can be used all year round increasing their revenue, meaning they can expand and ultimately increasing sporty pa sporting participation for the Australian Leisure area. Acting Speaker, may I ask for an extension? Extension granted. Thank you. The installation of the drop-in pitch will also hopefully lure the Perth Scorchers women's team to play their games in the exhibition matches as well. Just a big six hit away, the Lachenault Leisure Centre, which hosts the Australian Swimming Club and the Australian Basketball Association, also a part of the Lachenault Sporting Association, works on the expansion of the centre should be commencing with this, within this term of government. Before the election, the McGowan government made a commitment to invest $3 million to expand the Lachenault Leisure Centre to include two additional courts associated spect spectator seating, storage, administration and an upgrade to the amenities. I also want to give a shout out to the Binny Up Surf, Lysing, Surf Life Saving Club for their recent nomination for the 2021 Surf Life Saving WA Award. It is a great club in the beautiful community of Binny Up. We have also committed some funds to this club to help buy new and upgraded equipment. Acting Speaker. These are just some of the highlights so far from the last two months. I'm looking forward to standing up here and speaking on behalf and proudly bragging about the achievements that the McGowan government will deliver for Murray Wellington and what the people and communities of Murray Wellington achieve themselves. We have great communities in our regions and I'm always honoured to stand here and let the rest of the state know what is happening in our beautiful patch of the state. Acting Speaker, lastly, I'd like to send my best wishes to the people of Victoria. Our thoughts are with you. You have been through this before and shown the rest of the country your resilience and strength throughout the pandemic. You will get through this and we'll be right here thinking of you. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Forestfield. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, it gives me pleasure to stand and uh, speak in support of the uh, Supply Bill 2021. And, um, I haven't had the uh, opportunity thus far to uh, congratulate uh, the member for Midland for becoming the first female Speaker of the House and uh, um, a very, very well deserved position and uh, she's been a, a trailblazer within the Labor Party for many, many years and uh, her um, taking on this role as the, the first female to do that is, uh, is, um, is the right thing to have occurred and I think um, uh, the member for Midland will uh, do a fabulous job. Can I also congratulate um, all the new members that we have in the House. Uh, I think we ended up with 53 uh, seats out of the 59, um, which is uh, an outstanding uh, result. And 
once again reflective of the great work that was done by all of the members of the McGowan team um, during the campaign. And I suppose even more impressive amongst that is that we have uh, 26 females uh, out of that 53. So we're uh, very close to exceeding the 50% um, target that we do have in regards to representation within the Labor Party, which is great. Of course, yeah, one of the, uh, the consequences of that is uh, the Liberals beat us to 50%, <laughs> which uh, is something we've never been able to do before. <laughs> <laughs> but um, on, a, on a personal note, something that's quite special to me is uh, there's actually um, three members in this chamber now from Harvey, or very close to Harvey, and uh, that being the member for um, Collie Preston and the member for Dawesville as well. So my personal, and myself, um, my personal connection. Great yeah, great members, absolutely. Uh, with the, the member for... Um, Holly Preston, I worked with uh, her dad, Colin, for many years at, at Wadrup, and uh, as everyone knows, I have got a background coming through the union movement, and it was when I started uh, at Wadrup in 1995, it was. Um, Colin was one of the first people that uh, I sort of come and put their arm around me. I'd had a, a small involvement in the union previously when I was working for IFO, but it was through uh, Collins and other people's encouragement um, at Wager Up that I sort of got involved in the union, which then led to me eventually becoming secretary of the, of the union. And your mum, Julie, as well, and Brad was there for a little while as well. So, uh, 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 lovely family, and uh, yeah, one of those things, you know, I was quite saddened to hear of yeah, your dad's passing um, when that happened. But also, uh, the member for Dawesville. Um, their family and my family are very close friends back in Harvey and um, as uh, the member mentioned uh, Harvey is a very close community and there's a lot of community involvement and uh, especially um, through Apex it's where our families were heavily heavily involved and uh, we went to school together for a while and things like that so uh, it's great to see that uh, that Harvey is, is well represented <laughs> within this chamber. It is uh, a lovely uh, regional town, not too far from the city, and um, yeah, it's it's a wonderful place uh, to have lived and to be living as well. Can I also um, just wish all those members who didn't get returned uh, all the best um, for whatever endeavours they get up to? You know, it's an interesting place, this one. You know, you have the opposition normally on the other side, but now tucked into the corner. Um, and it's quite adversarial at times, but you walk out of here and you have a chat to people. So you do develop some sort of relationship with them. And um, as we all know, this uh, the role of a, of a member of parliament is actually quite a brutal one. You know, it, uh, it finishes quite suddenly on election day if you're unsuccessful. And uh, for some people, you may have some inkling that you may not get re-elected, but for others it might come as a complete shock. And there were a number of people who lost their seats at the last election who it came as a complete shock to them. So I just wish them well with whatever they decide to do uh, into the future. I also need to thank my campaign team. Um, uh, Matt Keogh, the, the member for Burt, Natalie Machen, Peter Brisbane and Keegan Burke. Uh, without you lot, keeping me under control and directing me of what I should be doing, um, we, uh, we certainly wouldn't have achieved the great outcome um, that we achieved. And a big part of that, and everyone uh, has the same thanks to their campaign teams, was the, uh, the discipline that was shown right across the, the whole team. But the great direction uh, that was given from Campaign Central and, uh, of course, the, the great leadership that was shown by the Premier. Um, he, he worked tirelessly throughout that whole campaign and uh, it, was just, it was hard enough keeping up with him when he was in your electorate, let alone uh, what he would have had to go on through. So collectively, um, we, everyone worked together. We had uh, very, very few issues and it was a great outcome and a, a really good learning curve for us all going forward. I'd also like to thank all the volunteers uh, who helped during the campaign. Um, as we all know, uh, without the volunteers that help us with our campaigns, we uh, would certainly struggle to achieve any anything. And um, 
they do it because for a number of reasons, whatever motivates them, uh, whether it's a, uh, a, a connection and a love for the party or it's just a personal relationship with you, the member that you've developed over time, or their friends and family that you just coerce in to do stuff. But without the volunteers actually doing a lot of the legwork out on the ground, none of us would be able to achieve uh, what we've achieved. And in line with that, you know, the campaigns are, are quite expensive. So I'd certainly like to thank everyone who donated uh, to my campaign. Um, without your support, once again, we wouldn't have been able to do what we've done and achieve the outcome we've achieved. As I mentioned, I do have a background in the union. Uh, so there's a, a number of unions I'd also like to thank for the support they've, they've given me over the years, but also through the campaign as well. Uh, and that would be um, the Australian Workers' Union, uh, both Brad Gandy, who's the State Secretary in WA, and Daniel Walton, who's the National Secretary of the AWU, based over in New South Wales. Um, the SDA, uh, Peter O'Keefe and Ben Harris, thanks guys. Uh, and the TWU, um, Smokey, Tim Dawson, uh, thank you and for all of your help. Also thank you to all the branch and party members uh, that helped out as well. So. As you know, we have a very active branch membership within the Labor Party right across the state. And um, they all contributed to our great success uh, at the last campaign uh, election. And certainly, once again, without all their help, through the good times and the bad, uh, we wouldn't have been able to achieve what we, what we achieved. I was also very fortunate, and I'm not Robinson Crusoe here, but I'm sure a lot of people did as well, but I had a lot of community support from people uh, who weren't part of the party, you know, who weren't sort of coerced into it. They were just genuine people that we developed relationships throughout the previous four years who wanted to help. And that makes a huge difference when you have that personal connection and that local endorsement from people uh, within your community. And it was... Um, I wanna, you, you've got to pick the highlights and the things you can remember on election day because it's a bit of a buzz. But um, one of the things I did really like to see was the, uh, the red faction marquees that were at a number of the schools above the uh, democracy sausage sizzle. You know, one in particular sort of had go red on it. I thought that was really good. <laughs> and, um, but thank you to all of them for their support as well. Um, certainly need to thank my family. Uh, <laughs> They, uh, they put up with a lot, and uh, for those new members, you'll certainly understand uh, what that means as time goes on. But uh, without the support of your family, it's very difficult to do what we do. And um, to Mel, Abby, Aaron, Rani, and Tia, thank you. And finally, to the uh, to the constituents of Forestfield. Um, normally, uh, you, you, you bank on a 50-50, you know, so half the people like you, half the people don't. Uh, we got a, a lot extra, a lot of extra support um, this uh, this election, and to everyone, whether you voted for me or not, thank you. Uh, appreciate you taking part in the democratic process. Um, but as the re-elected member of Forestfield, I'm now the first person to hold the seat for more than one term. <laughs> it was its uh, it was its fourth election, so at all the previous three elections, it had changed hands. So back in 2008, when the seat was first created, uh, it was won by Labor and Andrew Waddell on a margin of 0.25%, I think, Jeff, um, which uh, by about 98 votes. Then unfortunately, in 2013, we lost the seat to the Liberals by about 900 votes, uh, and it was sitting on a margin of 2.1%. Then in 2017, we were fortunate, I won the seat back. Uh, on a margin of about 4,000 votes, so we were sitting on 59.5 uh, TPP. Uh, and then in 2021, we uh, were able to retain the seat, which is a great outcome, and we're sitting on a 75.5% TPP now, which um, is, uh, is, a, is an amazing outcome. And uh, once again, it's, it's a result of a whole heap of uh, other influencing factors apart from just me. and and. Um, <laughs> When you look at those sort of results and some of the ones we received, like for Forestfield, for example, it's gone from a 98 vote seat in uh, 2008 to it's, there's about 12,000 votes in it at the moment, um, which 
like like they all say, with uh, with comes with a lot of um, a lot of uh, responsibility as well. But the support from the community community doesn't just happen by itself. You know, it's a result of the work that we have done, both uh, me personally locally, but also as a government across the state. You know, and in particular, um, we did have that and still do have the challenge of COVID uh, in our community. And the way that's been managed um, has had a, an extremely positive uh, impact on the state and everyone within that. And what, we, what we're able to achieve in our first term of government is actually quite extraordinary. You know, considering what we inherited from the previous government um, to turn the finances around from uh, what we what we um, took over from the books uh, was absolutely um, an incredible effort by the previous treasurer, um, the Honourable Ben Ben Wyatt, and it was also all the hard work that everyone put in. You know, we had a uh, what what we all thought was the the high water mark result in 2017, where we ended up with 40 members in here. So there was. 41 to start with, um, <laughs> but there was a, a, a lot of new members out there who were on very small margins and just went out there and actually worked and worked and worked and uh, were able to get the benefits of that at the last election and now have a, a bit more of a buffer behind them and very well deserved. But, you know, we, we did what we said we were going to do. You know, it's easy to talk the talk, but if you don't walk the walk, the the, uh, uh, the punters know that, you know, and they know if it's just hollow words. So we were able to deliver on all of our 2017 election commitments, you know, what we bought into the local communities, whether it be in Forestfield or every every other electorate that we're able to win in 2017, was a new life and new investment, um, and to put money into places that hadn't had funding before. Uh, was very well received and it, we didn't just fund things willy-nilly. They were all things that the community had been wanting and looking for support for over the, over the years and just weren't able to get that from the previous government. So the fact that we're able to deliver on all our promises, um, our previous election commitments, was uh, certainly a, a very telling factor in the support that we did get from the community. The challenge is, of course, making sure we do it now. Um, and uh, we're very fortunate that the good financial management uh, of the, the previous term of government has left us in a situation where we can uh, make some election commitments and be able to honour and deliver them. And once again, if you have a listen to the types of commitments we've made um, right across the state of Western Australia, they are commitments that the local communities have been asking for. Um, and in Forestfield in particular, we um, were able to get support for uh, a number of um, larger commitments which needed to be, um, needed to be funded and, and we were able to do that. And in particular, when you talk about your local communities, you know, there's, there's a couple of key elements to what actually makes the foundation of your community and uh, that being your local school groups and then your local community and sporting groups. And they are the key to any successful community. If you can give the local kids a good education, you know, they, they, they say that that education is the, the social barrier breaker, gives them the ability to go on and do things that their parents may not have been able to do. The other thing to that, of course, is with your local sporting groups and community groups. And if you can give your local kids, young adults, adults, a sense of connection and feeling within your community, then they're more likely to be involved, they're more likely to stay around, and they're less likely to, um, to vandalise stuff, they're less likely to do, make silly decisions which are going to have impacts on them for the rest of their life. So ensuring that we have the best possible educational opportunities at our local schools uh, and the best possible sporting facilities in our local clubs and the support for the local community groups that attract people and, and keep them engaged is, is really important. And um, a number of the commitments that we made in Forestfield uh, for the 2021 um, campaign do exactly that. 
So we've committed $2 million to redevelop the, um, the facilities at Scott Reserve in High Wycombe, which is a, a multi-user facility between the High Wycombe Junior Football Club, the High Wycombe Amateur Football Club and the High Wycombe Cricket Club. That'll enable them to also build new um, female change rooms. We've had an explosion of female participation in what have previously been predominantly male sports, um, whether that be football as in Aussie rules football or football as in round ball soccer football. And historically, all our facilities were built for males and um, they just aren't suitable for um, mixed use. So the commitment to Scott Reserve will enable them to build new change rooms, build them to enable them to build multi-sex um, facilities and also uh, new club rooms and um, new common space um, for them to operate out of as well. We also committed $2.4 million to uh, Matervale Reserve um, over in Matervale as well. Once again, it's a another multi-user facility between the Kalamunda United uh, Soccer Club, then you have the Rangers, T-ball, softball and baseball club uh, based out of there as well, and the, um, the Christian Soccer League, which uh, is a, a very large soccer league um, play over at Maida Vale as well. So once again, the commitment will enable us to build new, new club rooms, new change rooms and, and new um, facilities suitable uh, for multi-sex participants, which is great. Um, an interesting commitment we made uh, was for an all-abilities playground uh, to be built in Forestfield. Now, there's no all-abilities playgrounds um, within the area. The City of Gosnells has put a number in just recently uh, as a result of um, some cash in lieu uh, approval expenditure by um, the Minister for Transport well, and Lands at the time. Um, so when we, um, when we were approached by this, I actually got a letter from a, uh, a young student saying, hey, we haven't got any playground suitable for my disabled sister in the area. And uh, there are, there's actually quite a number of um, uh, constituents with disabilities um, within the Foothills area. And, Having a facility like that somewhere local uh, will be a, a great improvement to their uh, quality of life. So that's, uh, that's something I'm really looking forward to. And what it's actually led to is um, a redesign and a rethink about where we're going to put this and how we're going to um, develop around the Forestfield Shopping Centre. Uh, Acting Speaker, could I please have an extension? Extension, Grant. I won't ask for a small one because you can only get 10 minutes, so it doesn't matter how long you want. <laughs> um, so that's, uh, that's something that's actually, uh, uh, I suppose, fostered some new thoughts about how we can redevelop the whole area, uh, and that'll be an integral part of the new design, which will be great. Uh, Education-wise, um, in the 2017 election, we committed $10 million to Darling Rain Sports College to uh, essentially replace their design and technology and food uh, science buildings. Um, to be honest, the, the equipment that they had there was, was stuff that I, um, I did woodwork and metalworking back when I went to high school, at uh, Harvey High School there for a while. Um, so it was pretty outdated and not suitable for giving the right training and education to our next generation of tradies coming through. So the, the end result of the investment uh, from 2017 is absolutely amazing. You know, the, the new facilities are just uh, first class and the, the students just have such a great opportunity to develop the appropriate skills and do the right certificates to help them on their way. In the 2021 election, we committed another 12 million to do another stage of development at the school and that will, um, that will change that school forever. It, it became a, um, a sports college back in 2000 and Six, I think, uh, the current, the current, <laughs> the uh, the premier at the time, um, back in 2008, was the education minister who actually approved and renamed the school from uh, Forry High to uh, Daly Range Sports College, and it's actually the only designated sports college within Western Australia, and its sports program is uh, absolutely amazing. We, um, we made a, a significant amount of commitments and investment to all of the local schools, so. Uh, uh, Edney Primary School, for example, got $1.5 million to do some upgrades and uh, replace some equipment that they had, which is um, 
well overdue. Um, Highwickham Primary School, prior to the election, uh, when we did a, a round of um, stimulus announcements, they received, um, I think it was three million to build some new early childhood uh, rooms at the school. And um, Made of our primary school got 900,000 to build a new um, outdoor undercover area. And then during the election itself, uh, all of the schools were able to get some funding for improvements that they required. And um, it has uh, really been going to make a, a significant improvement um, to them. There are also a number of other things going on uh, within the area. Of course, one of the biggest things is the uh, Forestfield Airport Link project. Uh, we have the terminus station, which is, was referred to as Forest Field, which hence the Forestfield Airport Link, but it's now been renamed the High Wycombe Station. Uh, and that's just an amazing piece of infrastructure. Uh, the station itself looks, looks brilliant. The unfortunate part about it is when we took over uh, government in 2017, the previous government hadn't really considered the design um, at all. So they had a, a, a very expansive car park right out the front of uh, where the station is. That car park, I think, was going to have 1,800 bays. Um, so a massive area of just nothing. We had looked at it. Uh, the minister and um, the the proposal was put to build a multi multi deck car park into the side and develop the front of the station into a transit oriented development, which is the way we went. So the station, the, the car park's been built. Um, the other problem with the way it was set up initially, uh, which was commenced by the previous government, is all the tunnelling infrastructure was actually sat right out the front of the. The station because that was just going to be car park, so it was the last thing that needed to be done. Now we want to develop uh, the land, all the infrastructure from the tunnel build and everything is still taking up the place, the land that we want to develop. So we need to move that on. I do need to acknowledge that the, the land surrounding that area uh, is a little bit tricky with the local structure plan. It's put some um, limitations on land use. And uh, there's a process being worked through there um, with those local landowners, but um, that was certainly put in a, a, a tricky, tricky position when the announcement was made that the station was going to go there because they had already been informed that they were going to be a different sort of zoning. Uh, then that zoning sort of got changed on them uh, without any warning, so that's quite difficult. We did, um, we've just about finished the, uh, the Row Highway and Calamunda Road intersection. Um, that's a, a full grade intersection bridge which we committed 86 million at the 2017 election. Um, that's a, a massive piece of infrastructure and uh, it'll certainly help with the, um, the traffic congestion and safe travel within the area. Um, jumping through things, um, one of the one of the proposals uh, and one of the issues at the, at the election was, of course, the, uh, the upgrade of the intersection between Hale Road and Tonkin Highway. Um, back, back in the 50s, whenever the Steve, I think it was the Stevenson's report, something like that, um, had designed that intersection to be a pure flyover with no access to Tonkin Highway from Hale Road. Now, uh, at the moment, it's a signalised intersection for which we have access uh, to Tonkin North and South from both Forestfield and Wattle Grove. Uh, going forward, um, after some consultation uh, with the Minister and, and Main Roads, we were able to secure north-facing ramps. At the election, the opposition said they'd give full access. Full access uh, isn't possible within the footprint that's available there. And um, uh, we are able to explain that to the, most of the people. Most of the people understood there are limitations and uh, there's alternative ways to head south if you need to head south, but predominantly 80 per cent of the traffic flow headed north. So. Uh, or, or return from the north, so they'll still be able to do that into the future. Just in my um, last couple of minutes, I just want to um, touch on one of my other little passions, and that's uh, that being um, rescued greyhounds. Uh, I've spoken about it here before. Previously, I have uh, two rescued greyhounds. Uh, I'm not a not a big fan of greyhound racing, um, but in particular, one of my um, one of my little puppy dogs is uh, an extremely special one 
who uh, was rescued from the Canadrome in Macau. And coming up uh, in a couple of weekends, we have the when you get when you get a, an, a when you adopt the greyhound, they call it a gotcha day. So we've got a, a two-year gotcha day coming up. But I just want to, um, uh, I suppose, thank Greyhound Adoptions WA for the work that they do. Uh, Free the Hounds, who are another group which um, work with. Um, rescued greyhounds but also certainly advocate to end greyhound racing in, in WA and I do think it's a sad indictment that we have over half the greyhound tracks in the world in Australia. You know, the rest of the world's seen the light and are starting to shut down greyhound racing for all the abhorrence that it is but we haven't quite got it yet. So I just read a, a little extract of, uh, from Free the Hounds about the Macau greyhounds. So on the 7th of June 2019, Greyhound Adoption volunteers collected five Macau Greyhounds from a quarantine facility in Melbourne and flew them to Perth where they went to their forever homes. Five dogs had flown from, flown from Macau 10 days prior where they'd been in foster care for two months after being rescued by ANIMA, the Society for Protection of Animals in Macau, from the infamous Macau Canadrome. The track closed several months before their rescue as a result of the seven-year campaign led by Anima, Pet Liberary and Grey 2K USA to shut down the track. The five dogs were exported to the horrific facility from Australia. Two of them were unauthorised exports, exported after the passport ban to Macau. These dogs were five of 20,000 Australian greyhounds exported to the Canadrome. Only around 500 Australian greyhounds made it out alive. The Macau Greyhounds lived only to race. The dogs failing to place first, second or third in five consecutive races were killed. The dogs lived in dark, damp, barren concrete kennels with inadequate bedding. Some slept on concrete floors, others had wooden or hessian bags. The kennels were covered in scratch marks. The dogs spent the majority of their time in kennels. Illness and injuries were left untreated and many dogs suffered terribly. Every single dog at the facility was neglected and in poor health. The majority of the 532 dogs that were rescued went to the US, UK and Europe. Some were rehomed locally and 21 came, to, came back to Australia. Of that 21, five came to Perth. And I was um, quite fortunate enough to get one of those. So the second gotcha day uh, for the Macau Greyhounds is on the June the 6th at uh, Tomato Lake in Kudal. And uh, if you're free and available, I'd certainly encourage you to, uh, to come along because there'll be more, more than just the five Macau dogs there. There'll be uh, quite, a, quite a number of rescue greyhounds and um, I really support you to, or encourage you to uh, get to know the greyhounds and, and uh, grow that support for them uh, as time goes on. So on that, um, I would just once again like to thank everyone who uh, helped throughout the 2021 campaign and uh, to all the new members, wish you all the best uh, in your next term here. And as the Premier uh, said previously, it'll, it'll be over before you know it. So um, please carry on doing the great work that you started off doing and you'll certainly get the benefit of the next election. And with that, I commend the bill to the House. Thank you. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Member for Kingsley. Okay. Yes. No. Yes. Acting Speaker. Um, I'd like to make a small contribution to uh, the debate. Just very, very small contribution to the debate um, of two minutes. Uh, just to. Uh, thank uh, the Premier for all of the work that he did uh, throughout the campaign. Um, I know, having done numerous campaigns over the years, that campaigns can be incredibly tiring and exhausting. And um, I know I've certainly suffered from that throughout the campaign. But it was the times when the Premier came up um, to, uh, to our electorate or to a neighbouring electorate um, that really invigorated uh, the campaign. It invigorated the volunteers in the campaign and it certainly helped uh, with my uh, energy levels. So I just wanted to thank the Premier. I know um, the 
He did an incredible job throughout the campaign and uh, congratulate him on a very well won campaign. Um, I know that there was a lot of people who were very happy to vote for Labor, some for the very, very first time, um, in, in thanks for all of the good work that the Premier has done and the team has done uh, over the last 12 to 18 months during the COVID-19 pandemic. But I also equally know from all of the doors that I knocked on and all of the phone calls that I made um, that what the people of Western Australia could see was a vision that our Premier and our ministerial team had for Western Australia. The fact that we needed to re-establish manufacturing here in Western Australia, that we needed to ensure West Australian jobs, that we needed to ensure that um, our students who are leaving high school or people who would like to reskill had the access to go back to TAFE or go to TAFE and get the skills for jobs that we were going to need into the future. And I know that the people of Western Australia certainly bought into this vision that the Premier and the Deputy Premier and the Ministerial team articulated and that we promoted within our electorates because they understood that we had done the hard yards in the last four years in delivering what we said we were going to last time and that we would do the same thing going forward um, over the next four years. And so for my part, I just really wanted to get up and, and thank the Premier and say congratulations that you have done an amazing job. And um, I am humbled and proud to be still part of your team. So thank you very much, Premier. Premier. Contribution to the debate on the supply bill. Uh, there's nothing unusual about this bill. Uh, this is often standard practice, particularly in a year in which an election uh, is held. And uh, I appreciate the support. Of this. Question is that the bill be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Oh, sorry. The question is the bill now be read a second time. Sorry about that. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to apply out of the consolidated account the amount of $15,108,098,500 for the services and purposes of the year ending 30 June 2022. It's leave granted to uh, read a second time. Sorry? Yes, it's leave granted to proceed to the third reading. Yes. That's what I thought I said. Yes, leave is granted. Yes. Member for Rye. Uh, thank you. I just, um, the Leader of the Opposition um, was um, just momentarily um, elsewhere, so if there is an opportunity I might um, ask whether she um, may be able to come forward shortly. If, um... Sorry? Yeah, yeah. So I, I may. Well, you, you, um, maybe you might be able to contribute in the meantime. Yes, if I can. Thank you. Um, certainly, uh, certainly, if, if I can, uh, Madam Speaker. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, um, leave was granted to go forth with the third reading member. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, then Premier, you need to move. I apologise. The bill be now read a third time. Is, uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Member for Rye. Sorry, everyone. Uh, th thank you, Madam Speaker. If I may um, just make a couple of comments. The, um, Member, are you going to say something while we're uh, waiting for the Leader of the Opposition to come in? Because we're now in third reading. Yep. Um, if I may, Madam Speaker, uh, the, uh, I think the, the, the Opposition certainly does um, support the bill, as um, pointed out by um, our Leader, uh, Leader of the Opposition. And um, I think she did make some comments about the uh, concerns she did have regarding um, 
royalties for regions. I think it. Um, you can contact the leader of the opposition's office and say she's. Recorded. I think it's a program which uh, we've certainly shown concern with uh, in the past. Um, concern about the uh, the way that um, we've had uh, cost shifting, I guess, and that that was really the emphasis that the. Uh, um, the leader of the opposition did speak about. Over the last four years, we've seen uh, 2.7 billion is the calculation that we've certainly made. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, that that program of um, cost shifting is quite concerning. Um, when when you look at a um, billion dollars a year, a billion dollars a year that the um, Liberal National Government in the previous government had uh, sitting there working well towards things like the uh, Pilbara Cities program, where over 70 per cent, 70 per cent of our state revenue is um, generated from, Madam Speaker. And I think this is the issue that probably concerns the opposition more than anything. 70 to 80 per cent of the state's revenue is actually uh, generated Dennis, from regional Western Australia, and yet, and yet um, we've seen the cost shifting and the substitution of the Royalties for Regions program uh, take place. So that, that's a real concern to me. Um, and I know that the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition expressed that in her um, in her second reading speech, and I think it's something that we would certainly be looking for the government to um, straighten out. Obviously, the uh, the other concern that we do have is the electoral reform um, that's coming up, which is looking to um, redistribute uh, potentially a lot of regional members uh, in the legislative council, and that's something that uh, we'll continue to express our concerns about. And certainly, uh, an issue that the uh, leader of the opposition also brought up in her second reading speech. So, um, if I may, I'll, I'll just close on that and um, hand across to the leader of the opposition to make her comments. After I've given her the call, thanks very much. The question is: the bill be read a third time, leader of the opposition. Thank you. Thank you, acting speaker. Um, uh, thank you, Member Brock. And uh, uh, just to tidy up the, the comments from the opposition's perspective, obviously um, we support the progress of this bill. We would never uh, seek to block supply. It doesn't mean that we necessarily agree with the government's priorities, and I think we made that clear during the second reading. Um, and we outlined very clearly the challenges that we see going forward and where we would expect government to be applying that funding uh, in the interim as we move towards a budget. So the, uh, the health system, which we've canvassed um, significantly over the last couple of weeks in Parliament, obviously emerging issues around housing, those skills shortages that we see that are impacting businesses um, across the state, that failure to diversify our state's economy and, uh, and to work towards a plan that means that we are less reliant on uh, the powerhouse of the nation, which is our, our mining sector, so that we can ride through those peaks and troughs that inevitably come from having such strong reliance on that sector. Uh, and then we see the issues that we, are, we understand are, are coming to the fore as well in and around our child protection agency and the shortages we see in that department uh, and the impact that's having on families and the most vulnerable in our communities. Uh, and we've also raised issues around the machinery of government and the impact that's having on our departments uh, and the, the ability for them, I think, to provide key and strategic advice for this government to act on. So I, I think, um, in all, uh, we, we still see this government coming into this House blaming the previous government. We still see them coming in here, uh, ministers and, and the Premier alike, pointing to things uh, that occurred over five years ago now, or nearly five years ago now. Um, four years in government. GST flowing into the state as a result of the deal that the, uh, the, the uh, Commonwealth Government has struck, uh, record royalty rates, uh, and whilst there have been some challenging headwinds for this state to, to face, and no one would, uh, no one would uh, not acknowledge that the Premier and his government have steered us through uh, a response to COVID, uh, I would say that there needs to be now a long-term plan to ensure that the funds that we are 
approving for use are being put uh, to where they are most urgently needed. And, uh, and I understand that there are some infrastructure projects, a little bit like we talked about in the Treasurer's Advance Bill, there are election priorities that have been included uh, in this financial year. I would just urge the Premier to make sure that these funds are going towards fixing our health system, which is clearly in crisis, and some of the other issues that we've canvassed during uh, the, uh, the second reading speech and, and in this House over the last three weeks. Thank you, Acting Speaker. Just in uh, terms of the bill, uh, the bill is uh, standard practice. Um, for uh, especially when the uh, budget is delayed, the budget won't be till uh, the uh, later part of this year, and so therefore uh, a supply bill is necessary to ensure that we can continue to meet our obligations, in particular paying uh, our workforce. Uh, and so this is a necessary budgetary measure in this environment. The supply bill is based upon 50 per cent of the appropriations approved by the parliament for the 2020-2021 financial year. Uh, and gives uh, flexibility to the government uh, in terms of meeting uh, the obligations that we have. Uh, in terms of the specific issues raised uh, by members, uh, just so members are aware, uh, the, uh, the government uh, has committed $4.2 billion in R4R funding over four years to 2023-24, uh, uh, but that's only a, uh, in fact, a small part of what we spend in regional WA. Uh, we've committed a record $7.9 billion investment uh, in region, regional WA, of which less than 9 per cent is funded from R4R. So uh, that's, um, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, capital. Uh, and on top of that, and you know, it's multiple things uh, across regional WA, uh, there's never been as much money spent on health, education and other services uh, in uh, regional WA. And indeed, our uh, recovery plan included $900 million across regional WA and a whole range of initiatives uh, to ensure that um, uh, people are kept employed during the depths of the despair uh, that we endured uh, last year. So uh, royalties for regions continues. Uh, we are funding regional Western Australia better than ever before. Uh, that's the record of this government. I'd like to thank members for their support. Members, the question is that the bill be now read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. To the contrary say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to apply out of the consolidated account the amount of $15,108,098,500 for the services and purposes of the year ending 30 June 2022. Government business order of the day number eight be now taken. Uh, the question is that the uh, uh, motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Against say no. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Government business order of the day number eight, address in reply, adjourn debate. Um, member for Willoughby. Uh, it's a great pleasure I rise to speak uh, in the address, address in reply uh, at the request of the Leader of the House, which is always good and experienced members of this place ought to be able to, without notice, uh, arise to their feet and speak in a general debate about uh, any matter that uh, is of interest to them, particularly um, around our electorates and, of course, around the areas of interest. And I'll pick up where I left off from yesterday in relation to the contribution I made on the supply bill around uh, the agenda that individual members of this place ought to have as they come in and develop uh, through their experiences here. Some bring that agenda with them, some develop that agenda once they are here. Um, and or more, mostly, mostly is the case that is a combination of uh, both those things, where we had a preconceived set of uh, ambitions uh, when, before we arrived. Some of those are somewhat um, dashed, I suppose, and others are emboldened and enhanced as we learn more, both from our colleagues and from the experience of being here and focusing uh, all day, every day, on the role of being a local member and, of course, a contributor uh, in the wider narrative of this place to the areas that we find of, uh, ourselves uh, either required to look into by dint of the responsibilities given to us through committees or by uh, the electorate and the people that come and see us or through our own experiences in life. Um, the seat of Willoughby has been uh, in, uh, in my care 
in electoral since uh, since 2009, and it's been um, a, a great a great journey for that community and, of course, for me personally. Uh, we've seen the boundary change several times, as most members probably uh, have, a, uh, have felt the effects of over uh, that period of time, certainly the last 10 years. A significant boundary changes have seen uh, a, a, a variation in the, in, the, in the margins for each of these seats uh, to some greater or lesser degree. Uh, Willoughby has had at various times uh, uh, the whole of Cardinia, parts of Murdoch, the parts of Melville, uh, parts of Spearwood and Hilton uh, as it's moved and, and shifted its boundaries around uh, the major arterial roads. Uh, but the, inside that community, uh, edged by, as they say, the ribbons of bitumen that form the boundaries of, of uh, the seat of Willoughby, uh, there is a great story going on. That is the contribution that individuals in our community are making uh, that you won't read about in the West, you won't uh, hear about too broadly, too widely, and it's up to us to make sure we as individual members champion their cause and, uh, and in, in, in equal measure uh, acknowledge and celebrate the contribution of these people. A couple I'd like to identify uh, in, the, in the heart of my electorate in the suburb of Kubalup, which is about a 70, 80 year old suburb, which is a, uh, actually quite an oasis. Uh, it's designed uh, in very much in the old style of a grid um, with large verges, big parks, and now very mature trees, and it's a lovely garden suburb. Uh, but it also had in its day a significant low socioeconomic uh, a, a grouping uh, that has caused a, a great deal of challenges for the community, but also a great deal of opportunities. The concentration of that low SEI grouping uh, uh, allowed us to, to concentrate the efforts in, in supporting them. Uh, a significant proportion of the suburb uh, is, uh, and still is today, has, uh, is covered by social housing, uh, and that has evolved as the building stock has changed over time. Uh, the people that support the community in, in the suburb of Kubalup are a unique group. Um, there has been a something of a change in that, ele in that in that suburb as people migrated to it because of its value. We've got enough now. Quorum present? No. Quorum's now present. Yeah. Uh, members, can you just be a bit careful not to walk in front of the speaker, but you can do so now since I've said so. Right. Thank you. Blurs my vision. <laughs> The, um, the, the uh, suburb of Kublup uh, is a tremendous uh, addition and has long been in the seat of Willoughby. Um, as I said, and reiterate, yeah, it's a, right. a lovely old garden suburb, uh, had its fair share of, of challenges and, and reputation, but that reputation has changed markedly as I've seen a demographic change in, right, right across the mm -hmm. seat, but certainly in the suburb of Kublup, where there's been about, in the last four years since the last election, uh, there's been uh, that is the 2017 election, there's been about a 25 per cent turnover. About a quarter of that suburb has changed over. And, uh, and in fact, going back in two terms, uh, that would be easily half the suburb as well. Again, I would have thought uh, on my rough estimation. And what's, uh, what's happened in the demographic change has been young families uh, who are seeking the value that comes from the housing stock there uh, and the garden suburb and to enjoy uh, as they bring their young families to the seat of Willoughby. And what that's done, though, is identified some of the challenges 
in education, for example, that they're seeking for their young families. And it's been uh, through the good efforts of activist mums, if I, if I can use that, that term, who aren't satisfied with the local school uh, not servicing their, their needs and their families' needs. Uh, and of course, the Kublup Primary School was the amalgamation of two older schools in the, in the district or in the suburb that, uh, that were amalgamated uh, under the previous mem member, Alan Carpenter. Um, but what happened was the reputation of Kublup, for some reason, didn't translate even with a new school, a new building of a, a building of a new school. Uh, a lot of the young families found themselves moving across into the neighbouring uh, suburb of Sampson, which had a school with a great reputation and still does today. Um, the young, uh, the younger uh, cohort that moved into the uh, into the electorate and into the suburb uh, championed this local school and wanted to find out what was uh, what was wrong with it that it wasn't seeking the the sort of or getting the enrolments that the surrounding suburb uh, would lead you, lead you to believe. The kindergarten uh, uh, school uh, class, for example, was only ever half subscribed. Uh, half subscribed. Uh, and there was no particular reason for it other than reputation. So they started the, the, the Kubi Now group, as they call them, which is the Residents Association under the guidance of the people like uh, Katie... Katie Atwell, <laughs> uh, <laughs> under the uh, under the uh, guidance of people like Katie Atwell and uh, Pip Brennan and Jane Burnett, uh, who got in behind and joined the PNC and uh, supported and lifted that school um, to a reputation that is now the uh, now equal to any of the surrounding schools. And it's that sort of local community uh, support, local uh, local energy, if you like that it makes it so easy as a local member to, uh, to get behind and support them, uh, which we did in several elections, particularly around capital works, uh, building playgrounds, additions to school uh, classrooms uh, and assisting in highlighting the challenges around the early learning centre and their needs for resources uh, and, and with what, quite some success. Um, that Kubelup community group uh, and the Kubelup Community uh, Residents Association have gone on to do some outstanding things, and it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. For example, doing a, uh, a Kubi Fest, as they call it, um, which is a use of one of the largest parks in the, in the area uh, to create basically a community a festival, uh, a fete, if you like, uh, on, on a grand scale. And uh, I'm pleased to say that it's going to be coming back again this spring. Um, and under the, under the guidance of uh, the leadership of, of Pip Brennan. Pip Brennan will be known to many in here as one of the uh, health consumer advocates uh, who is highly respected across the state about that she happens to live in Kubelup and she brings that level of intensity and leadership um, to the community to actually make sure that people understand the value of gathering uh, in the community. So that's a, a really good example. The other one that's spin off from this that, uh, that is really worthy of me raising again, which I've done it before, is the work of Gary Allen. Uh, again, Gary Allen, you won't find him on the front page of the West. Uh, Gary started a, a group called Kubi Cares uh, just in his own backyard with the redistribution of food and furniture and clothing. Um, and in fact, um, <laughs> a neighbour moved into his street, I'm told, and thought he was a hoarder and reported him to the, uh, to the, to the, the, the city. Uh, as a hoarder, uh, we had to go. He had to go be educated. The fact that no, that's just the warehousing of the furniture and goods that Gary redistributes around the neighbourhood, right through to South Lake, Bibber Lake, uh, over to Hilton, and so on. He does an outstanding job with his team, and uh, and even through COVID, uh, we were able to find some additional money. Uh, and it's a good example of where a little bit can go a long way. A few hundred dollars here and there to supplement the food parcels that they were handing out. Uh, during, particularly during the height of the COVID area, uh, was an, an outstanding uh, um, use of resources and an outstanding uh, contribution to the community. I'll forever be uh, in, in their debt uh, because they have been so supportive of me in making sure the issues that are brought to, to uh, bear uh, for me to consider uh, are really, um, quite frankly, an armchair ride. Uh, the other thing that's been uh, a singular feature of my electorate in the, in the time since I've been the member uh, and I came to this place has been the advent of, uh, of Row 8. 
and Row 8 has been one of the most contentious issues east of the freeway. Uh, my side of the freeway, west of the freeway, uh, there is absolutely no doubt that every individual understands the value of the Beelia wetlands, um, which themselves on the Swan Coastal Plain form the aqualung, if you like, when you link all, uh, all of the lakes from the north to the south uh, uh, on the Swan Coastal Plain, they play, it plays an essential uh, component, not just to wildlife, but also to the, to the uh, filtering of the water supplies uh, and groundwater and groundwater drainage and hydrology of the uh, whole Swan Coastal Plain. So um, the idea that just we're focused singularly on uh, the Beelia wetlands actually uh, doesn't do a, good, a decent service to the fact of the contribution of all those other lakes. So row eight, we are so, uh, the community is so impressed and so happy with the determination of the government from, from the 2017 election uh, onwards, where it was uh, made as an election commitment to extinguish the row eight reserve and preserve Beelia wetlands as a class A reserve uh, for time in memoriam. Now, it has been confected by various people opposite uh, as being a, uh, 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 an an absolutely necessary road to, to deliver the sort of uh, freight link that we need. Um, I want to make sure that we continue, and I do in the community, continue to reinforce the issue here, that the people in the suburbs around, uh, around the, the formerly proposed Row 8 uh, and Row 7, if we go east of the freeway, um, has been put to them that this is a vital freight link or part of a freight link to the Fremantle port. Uh, but in reality, most of them are, 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 that are for this particular road are on the basis of traffic. And traffic management and freight management need to be uh, com com carefully separated where it's appropriate uh, in order to, to understand the nature of the challenge. Somebody who bought a house on Leach Highway and, uh, and we then proceeded to think that all of the traffic issues on Leach Highway are a direct uh, link, reason, uh, a direct link to the absence of Row 8 and Row 9 uh, uh, have been sold apart, quite frankly. The Liberal Party have been uh, completely um, morally bankrupt in the way they have prosecuted the arguments for Row 8 uh, and made people uh, believe that all of their traffic concerns would be alleviated by the implications of putting uh, one road, and a road to nowhere, we might add, uh, because the argument falls very, very sharply when we start talking about row nine and then the final kilometre into a single entry port. Um, nobody wants to talk about the cost of actually delivering row nine. The member for Bicton and the member for Fremantle are well versed in, in what that means for their communities. And quite frankly, what's happened is uh, we've ha allowed the whole debate about getting a world-class uh, competitive port uh, in Western Australia, a single port for uh, bulk cargo into Western Australia, to be hijacked in this sort of way. The reality is that when old Captain Stirling floated up the Swan River and threw a, a line over a tree and then O'Connor blew open that port, it was a very different time. When I grew up around Fremantle, going to John Curtin Senior High School, with all the, fish, the, the, the children of the fishermen and uh, fishing families and uh, the wharfies, the lumpers, the crane drivers, all of those, um, it was a very different environment. Now the land use is inconsistent with that of the enabling infrastructure needed to support a port. Quite often the numbers are talked about the capacity of the port uh, only on the basis of the number of boxes you can get across the wharf and number of ships and ship movements you can get in and out. It does not take regard to what would be the cost and implications of upgrading the enabling infrastructure, both road and rail, to support that port. So never should we have a conversation about Row 8 that doesn't talk about the Liberal lies around the area, the issues of ports and, uh, and their enabling infrastructure. There was no plan from the Barnett government on how they would cover the last kilometre and there was no costings done. Up. There was a general view you would have to upgrade the Stirling Bridge, uh, or as known as the euphemously the new, new traffic bridge in Fremantle. Uh, that alone had, a, uh, had uh, numbers in the order of 50 to 100 to 150 to 450 million. It was very rubbery. Then you had to go through five sets of lights to get a link into a single entry port, which would never meet world standards for efficiency. 
Um, so we're very, very happy in, in Willoughby to see uh, the commitment of the government for an outer harbour uh, and the work that's been undertaken there. When I had the fisheries portfolio as a minister, I became very close to the issues in relation to uh, the, the environmental factors in the uh, Coburn Sound around uh, maintaining and supporting and, in fact, enhancing fish stocks and the environment. Uh, we do need, when we're talking about the outer harbour, to actually make sure we put in context that uh, the imposition of additional infrastructure there can be done. Uh, with a thoughtful approach to the environment and, in fact, a method to enhance the environment there. Uh, but we cannot redress some 70 or 90 years of heavy industrial use. We can make inroads into it, but the one place we said in Western Australia where, in a planning context, we would place all of our heavy industry was in the Kwinana Strip. So we do have to give regard to the environment that we are uh, that we are placing or nesting this uh, new port facility in, take the opportunity with the infrastructure spend to improve uh, both the seagrass opportunity there, the pink snapper nursery, and, uh, and preserve the, the amenity that is uh, you know, a truly wonderful uh, uh, harbour inside the well, Coburn South itself as, a, as a, a body of water and interaction with the land. Um, so, None of these things in the suburb of Willoughby, in, uh, in the electorate of Willoughby, uh, are unlinked. It sits there nested in the middle of, uh, of a surrounding communities of Fremantle, of course, and Jandicott, and uh, to, the, to the north of Bicton, uh, Bateman, and to the south in, in Coburn itself. And uh, quite often you're getting these competing sort of uh, pressures, if you like. What is happening is around the river of uh, Fremantle, Bicton and Bateman, you're getting what is a, a land-constrained environment. And then you have in the south, you have areas such as Coburn uh, and right through to Quinana where a land abound, abounds and there are opportunities both residential and industrial uh, that are being pursued by those cities uh, to ensure that they're providing a future for, the West, for Western Australia and West Australian jobs. So there is always going to be a clash of, uh, uh, and of competing interests in relation to how uh, we undertake infrastructure, particularly in the southern suburbs. Uh, at that moment, I might just seek an extension, if I can. Extension granted. Thank you, Madam Speaker. The, um, the other thing to note is in the, in the development of the, of the city of Perth, we are 147 kilometres long. Uh, we are longer than LA. Uh, we are more dispersed than uh, many other capital cities in the developed world. And it is, uh, you know, it's a point of, of, well, mismanagement, in my view, over successive generations that we haven't taken seriously. And until now, uh, the urban infill that's required to actually arrest that, that uh, the ever, in, ever increasing uh, um, urban fringe and all the uh, concomitant problems that, or challenges and resources are required to, to deliver services there. I remember Treasury talking about uh, what it costs uh, to deliver uh, all the services to a new subdivision. Um, you might think about it, policing, health, uh, utilities, sewer, water, electricity, uh, it's a significant cost. If you're a business, you would actually uh, we actually be looking about how can I uh, leverage the existing infrastructure and the existing investment into it. So uh, we had, from many many governments ago, the ambition of 47% infill. Uh, unfortunately, we loaded that onto local governments. And what we have what we have seen has happened in some of the southern suburbs, or some of the, a lot of suburbs, uh, is that the local councils only met their their uh, commitment to that sort of density by a bunch of battle axe blocks. So. In the suburb of Palmyra, for example, if you drive down, it was probably one of the worst affected. Uh, there is row after row of A, B and C, where they've pushed a concrete driveway down the side, chopped out trees, ripped out canopy, increased it by putting more cars in there. Um, really is a counterintuitive idea of, of what we should be doing around density. Uh, the truth is that 47 per cent is going to be more, met more by, um, uh, by thoughtful infill, thoughtful density around villages. The suburb of Willoughby itself is a very good example where you've got a main road, it's classic for, uh, for those sort of suburbs, uh, within the 10 or 12k ring of where we're standing now. Um, your Red Cliffs, Balgars, those sorts of places all have this, where you have a, a central road going through, you have a strip sh a set of shops, the IGA, maybe a, a hopefully a medical uh, facility, a GP, that sort of thing, a school, a library, uh, a rec centre, 
Uh, that's what is uh, characterises certainly the suburb of Willoughby and a lot of the older suburbs. That is the place where you, uh, we need to deliver density. In the walkable uh, catchment of 450 metres radius around that is the best opportunity to increase um, density. And it's not going to be done by high-rise apartments. It's going to be done by two and three storey walk-ups. The 20 unit sites on a, over three quarter acres, those sorts of things are, are, are both uh, very deliverable, don't impose too much on the, on the built form environment and add, in fact, if done well, add to the, the amenity of the, of the central village of these suburbs. So um, they're, they're well worthwhile doing. Uh, the other heavy lifting will be done by Metronet and the Metronet precincts over the coming uh, years as they populate and fill out and create the sort of uh, sort of environment we know that we need to do around train stations to ensure that we're activating both uh, the public transport network but also the amenity of creating concentration and creative concentration of, of uh, village-like areas. Uh, design is absolutely essential that it's done in, in a way that is thoughtful. Uh, one of the things that we can do is look at remnant land. Um, Row 8 is a very good example. There are, uh, when it is extinguished uh, as a result of what we're going through this place, uh, it will be uh, probably mostly returned to its natural state and it goes to a stock road. But then there is this thing that we don't often talk about, which is uh, Row 9. Row 9 was established and became a remnant as a result of the extinguishment of the Eastern Bypass by a former Labor government. Uh, who decided that they thought there was inconsistent, uh, and I agree, inconsistent with the land use around there to drive a freeway right through those uh, suburbs and cut right through Fremantle. So row nine represents uh, a what I would call uh, a greenfield site in a brownfield zone. Um, it is in large part uh, undeveloped. Um, there is a great opportunity to get, get it right and make sure you, through uh, a proper consultation process that we have a good mix of uh, regenerative natural environment, uh, shared, uh, shared uh, access to it through bike paths and of course uh, some traffic management will be required to ensure that some uh, supporting roads are there but also activate on each of the intersections, for example on the corner of Stock and, uh, uh, and the Row 9, the Forest Road link, um, also Carrington and uh, the Row 9 intersection. Uh, offer enormous amounts of acreage that can be uh, that can be developed in a thoughtful way to bring an uplift to those particular areas and create the sort of villages that we're talking about. Make a connection between the coast and the wetlands, uh, uh, a really accessible and enjoyable experience. So, Row Nine is something that I, I will be uh, championing with a member for Fremantle, uh, no doubt, and other uh, member for Coburn and the other uh, relevant um, members to ensure that. Um, that the thoughtful design is an inclusive one, includes the communities. I always thought that an inquiry by a design by or inquiry by design or design by inquiry is a good one. Uh, probably best led by the local government. Uh, Coburn is a highly capable uh, city uh, and very professional uh, staff who have the capacity to engage with the community and, and work out what are the competing interests and what is the best use for that land. So I look forward to working with them over the next four years to support the ambitions of uh, all those, those local authorities. And of course, working in, in tandem with the city of Fremantle. I want to return now, finally, in my final few minutes here, to, to talk about uh, something that's been dear to my heart since becoming a member of the Labor Party. Um, I joined the Labor Party for many reasons, like, uh, like others here. I believe in teams. I believe in collectivism. I believe that the collective can do what the individual can't. Uh, and uh, that has been the formation of the, in, uh, of the Labor Party in so many ways. Certainly the industrial wing uh, of the Labor movement has been the, the nursery of that idea and have been the, the prosecutors in large part for over 100 years. Uh, for the benefit of working people to ensure that their life is made a lot better. The political wing of the Labor movement, the Labor Party itself, um, of which I'm a very proud member, uh, approaches this idea that uh, we do not just support the status quo. Conservatives, as generally might be identified, typically defend the status quo, not saying they are, can't, uh, can't undertake reform. Uh, the reforms of the gun laws in, in, in Australia is a good example of where you know, immediate crisis-driven reform was taken advantage of and we got a good outcome for all Australians. Uh, 
But when you look at the history of the Labor movement, both the industrial and political wing, change is what characterises who we are. Um, what we need to do to have an enduring commitment to that into the future is a place for dangerous ideas. We don't have in our party structures, both any of the major parties, the capacity to actually articulate, debate and determine uh, some very dangerous ideas, things that would ordinarily be controversial. It's very difficult in government to do it. It's difficult for a minister to do it, certainly. Uh, in, the, in the nature of the media cycle that we presented with, a minister could, uh, you know, could come out and say something of a, uh, of a thought bubble, if you like, in relation to a particular area that they're involved in. Uh, if it is not enshrined as policy by six o'clock or walked away from as a backflip, uh, that is the, the, the debating time that we have now, from announcement or, you know, discussion of it to its close. I was talking uh, to the Governor uh, at, at, the, um, at the sad death of passing of Bob Hawke and he said he thought he was probably one of the last uh, leaders in Australia that could open a public debate and not have to have it closed by six o'clock in the evening uh, and have that ongoing debate to build consensus and the consensus that's required for change. Change in the modern world now is ever more difficult, particularly with the advent of social media and the challenges it puts on misinformation and getting the story right. Um, people don't want to go to the second and third order uh, consequential conversations that you would have when you're contemplating a particularly significant bit of change, uh, and it's very difficult to do that uh, through platforms like social media, uh, although not impossible, and we have to embrace it. So I've always felt in Western Australia we've been uh, poorly served by the thinking architecture that's uh, uh, resident here. Uh, we don't have Cedars and Grattans and so on that are based here. Quite often the reports that uh, the Grattan puts out uh, are not applicable to Western Australia, particularly when you talk about things like energy. Often an energy report from the Grattan Institute will be focused on the networked arrangements of the east seaboard, but uh, take no regard to an isolated uh, market like ours. So, I've always felt that we need a good general public policy institute that is independent. Uh, and I, I look forward to working with a few individuals who are very keen to see a similar thing. Um, I'll also note, though, there are some great models here. The Perth Eurasia Centre is probably one of the foremost think tanks uh, that interprets the world in a West Australian context, run by Gordon Flake over there, um, who has made a, a magnificent contribution, in my view, to how Western Australia sees itself in its time zone, in the region, and the competing challenges for it. So we are very keen to see, or I am very keen to see, uh, a genuine independent think tank that is available for all to be able to air and debate uh, dangerous ideas for the sole purpose of the progression of what it is to be Western Australian, a sole purpose of uh, advancing who we are in this state and who we want to be as a people and how we want to have a, a, a world that our kids and their kids will inherit that they can be proud of and that is in every much in the traditions of uh, a progressive organisation like the Labor movement. And on that note, I'd like to conclude by thanking everyone for the indulgence this afternoon and I'm going to lunch. Bye. Uh, the question is the address and the reply be agreed to. Me member for Forest. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, contribute to the address and reply uh, debate and um, takes me back a couple of weeks uh, ago from when uh, this first kicked off with the Governor's speech uh, over in the other place and then um, the, uh, the high quality uh, inaugural speeches that were um, given in this place from uh, all the new members. Uh, it was um, outstanding uh, to sit and listen to the experiences that have um, led everyone to be in here. And, uh, I did uh, remark in conversation with the member for Willoughby just recently um, that uh, this, the 2021 group of people are, are very impressive and um, I thought our 2017 group was uh, pretty good. And, the 2013 group wasn't bad at, at that time either, but uh, the group that's come in this, uh, after this election is uh, exceptional and uh, I really look forward to um, watching them grow and develop and contribute uh, to the, uh, the best interests of this state over the next four years. And uh, we're ex extremely fortunate to have um, such a, a strong representation uh, 
on the government from the government uh, within this chamber, and um, it will uh, it will go a long way to it will go a long way to uh, to make sure that Western Australia continues to prosper. Because um, if we have to rely on the opposition for anything, we're in a whole world of hurt, member for Rowe. <laughs> but. Um, Look, it's really interesting just listening to the member for Willoughby and um, some of what he was talking about in regards to um, density and infill and development and, uh, as we all know, the, the cost, of, uh, cost of housing, the availability of housing, affordable housing uh, within the, uh, the state is something that continues to be a challenge, you know, and um, one of... Uh, uh, we all have development proposals or development activities going on within our electorates around the place and my electorate in Forestfield is no different um, as the crow flies. You know, Forestfield is 15 kilometres from the city and it might take you a little bit longer than you'd think coming down Orong Road because that certainly needs a lot of work um, but it's close you know and and where I actually am um, the part of the electorate I live in in Wattle Grove is is probably 20 k's away from the city, and we we have semi-rural blocks out there. You know, they range from half an acre through to three or four hectare blocks. You know, so close to the city, it's uh, it's incredible, and it's it's really beautiful, and it does um it it brings the conversation about what we do going forward. Because the easy thing is to do, let's just chop it up and put 300 square metre blocks there. But it, as we as the member for Willoughby mentioned, you know by doing density wrong, the first thing we do is cut all the trees down and squeeze in as many houses as we can. And uh, we've seen the, the, the canopy across the state decline over the years as a result of that. Um, and it's certainly not what we want to see out there. So the conversation about maximising profit on your property is, is a difficult one to have because people buy a larger proper, property thinking that what they're going to do is they're going to subdivide it and make it smaller and make money out of it and move on to something else, which then takes away that opportunity for someone to actually move into the area and, and in, enjoy and experience the beauty of it as it is. But there's areas where it can be done, and if it's done right, then it, it fits in with the, the local amenity that's going on. And it's to continue going north and south like we have, uh, the, the distance the member for Willoughby referred to, and 147 kilometres long. It's just, almost be beyond belief um, and we do need to take a little bit of control back because really the developers just buy a block of land they develop it and expect the government to put the infrastructure in to give people access to that so we don't have a lot of control of it so there's challenges in that um, going forward but one of the things we are certainly doing um, as a government of course is putting um, transport infrastructure in place and uh, to improve people's ability to get from A to B both more efficiently uh, and, and more safely, which unfortunately is what we have to do. And uh, especially around my electorate, we have uh, a number of major transport um, routes. So you have Tonkin Highway and Row Highway pretty much splitting uh, right through the middle of the, of, of the electorate. And, um, I did previously mention about one of the upgrades that are going on at Tonkin and Hale, um, but part of that Tonkin Highway upgrade, uh, the next intersection along is uh, the intersection of Walshpool Road East and Tonkin Highway, which I think is either the first or second most congested intersection in, in the state. It's absolute shocker. So there will be uh, a bridge put um, there as well. And the third one is the next intersection along, which is uh, Kelvin Road and uh, Tonkin Highway and uh, they're looking to put a uh, intersection there. So these are all things that have been spoken about um, as with most of the big infrastructure projects jointly funded with the federal government and um, will have significant benefit to the travelling community. So instead of getting, that's three sets of lights that will be removed from the, your journey from uh, east or south to north along uh, Tonkin Highway, which will certainly um, increase your, your travel time. An interesting little tidbit of information is um, the, the lights at Hale Road and Tonkin Highway in Forestfield. <clears throat> if you're coming out of Geraldton down the new, uh, is it Northlink, uh, Tonkin Highway out of Newshay through there, those lights at Forestfield are the first set of lights you encounter from leaving Geraldton. <laughs> 
on the new on the new uh, road. Um, so the sooner they go, the better. But in, in regards to transport around the area, there's a whole heap of heavy uh, uh, um, logistics industry uh, because it's proximity to the airport. So there's also a whole lot of uh, investment being made to intersections such as Row Highway and um, the Great Eastern Highway Bypass, um, Abernathy Road and Kalamunda Road, the rail bridge on Abernathy Road, the duplication uh, of Abernathy Road past the Forest Field uh, Industrial Area. And um, all that's designed to ensure increase efficiency uh, and reduce congestion and allow more freer flowing traffic flow throughout the area. Uh, one of the things I'm really keen to do is, is get the heavy vehicles out of Kalamunda Road through High Wycombe, so between Abernathy Road and uh, Row Highway. So working with the local government about what we can do there and make that a bit of a main street and slow it down, uh, because as, as it stands now, the, the suburb of High Wycombe is split in two by this ugly road down the middle of it. And if we make it slower for the trucks to go through, then they're going to have to go around and use the the, the infrastructure that's been put in place for them, which is the right thing to do. As I mentioned, we're just about finished the, um, the Kalamunda uh, uh, Road and Row Highway intersection. Um, you'll see there's a, one big jarrah tree left at that intersection. It was a tree that I saved. I was out there door knocking. Someone said, what about the trees? We went and measured the tree. Uh, you Googled it. There's a formula. We came up with an age of about 360 years old for this jarrah tree. So I said to the Minister of Main Roads, can't cut it down. So they've built around this thing. Um, <laughs> I normally like to cut things down, but I thought I'd save this one. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you're going past there and there's an intersection, there's a, a, there's a big tree sticking out in the middle. That's why it's still there. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of uh, investment going on within the area, which uh, certainly will make a, a huge difference um, to people's uh, travelling times and um, safety as they uh, head through the, the area. Members, uh, this business is interrupted and adjourned until a later stage of this day's sitting. Member for Swan Hills. Swan Primary School Principal Stephen Green will retire after nearly 40 years in public education. Stephen has been a classroom teacher, deputy principal and principal, including at Tambalup Primary, Bullsbrook College, Bassendine Primary and finally at Upper Swan, where I've been privileged to know him. Stephen's renowned for his knowledge of curriculum, teaching and learning principles and practice, the level of trust he places in his team and for pioneering a leadership approach tailored to individual students and the school community. His leadership was recognised in Professor Bill Lowry 2015 publication, High Performing Primary Schools, What Do They Have in Common? Describing Upper Swan as achieving yeah. excellence and as contradicting the trend towards lower variance teaching, yeah, yeah, not yeah. mandating textbooks, timetables and teaching methods. I've seen Stephen's remarkably strong rapport with kids. Every day he goes out of his way to connect, making rhyming games. Lewis the Truest, Mason will ace him, pretending to steal lunches, encouraging play in mud, involving the kids in practical jokes on their teachers and on Hot Valley Day getting his Nerf water mega blaster out. Stephen is taking the time now to spend with his family. We're also very grateful for the remarkable contribution he's made to so many children and families across Swan Hills. Leader of the Opposition. Robert who passed away on May 5th, 2021, at the age of 76. Bob was born on October 20, 1944, in Walluna and grew up in Hopetown and late, later Albany. He was an active community member, a keen footy player and a long-time supporter and friend of the Nationals WA. Bob always had a burning ambition to play football and was a decorated player. He made his waffle debut in round one of the 1963 season, playing for the East Perth Royals. He went on to play 67 games from 63 to 69 before returning to regional WA to take over the Hopetown Hotel and lace up its boots for the Ravens Thorpe Southerners. In, in, in the 70s, Bob moved to Albany where he became a fixture of the Railways Football Club, going on to have more than a 40-year involvement as player, coach, committee member, vice president and life member. Bob was also known in Albany as a successful small business owner, purchasing service stations which became United Petroleum and Wally's Uberwash, now owned by his son Robbie. Bob's contribution to Albany, the city he loved, was considerable. He was a shareholder of the Great Southern Weekender and he helped establish regional WA's first state basketball team, the Rainbow Coast Raiders. 
I offer my sincere condolences to Bob's partner of 29 years, Lorraine, his children, Robbie and Cindy, and his family and friends. He was a wonderful person that offered his support and encouragement to many, and he will be missed. Rest in peace, Bob. Member for South Perth. I'd like to bring to the attention of the House the phenomenal fundraising effort of the Curtin Wesley Tigers Football Club at their annual Pink Tiger Day 2021, held on Saturday, May 15. At this fundraiser for the McGrath Foundation, the club raised $61,000. In the 10 years the club has held Pink Tiger Day, they have raised a total of $372,000. These funds will go to support the McGrath Foundation breast care nurses who support individuals and their families experiencing breast cancer. Their nurses provide physical, psychological and emotional support for in from the time of diagnosis and throughout treatment. I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful work of Jesse Wilson, the club president, Mark Hayter, the event organiser, and the work of many incredible volunteers that made this day a success. Uh, member for Rowe. 2020. Following the cancellation of many agricultural shows during 2020, the Catanning show went ahead, coincidentally booked in for the exact day restrictions eased in October last year. The 129th WAMCO International Catanning Agricultural Show was a record breaker with more than 13,000 through the gates in one day. I congratulate them on receiving the WA Showman's Association Award in appreciation for the extraordinary effort in proceeding with the Catanning Show in 2020. Highlights of the show include the WA Axman and Yard Dog Trials, both new events to the arena, and of course the speed cheers, vintage machinery display, sideshow alley and fireworks display remain crowd favourites. Recent extensions to the shed made possible through federal government regional agricultural show development grants made set up and running of events much easier this year. I would like to thank and congratulate the Small but Enthusiastic Catanning Agricultural Society Committee with special mention to President Jill Cold and Vice President Rosalie Baxter. Thank you to the Catanning Shire for providing assistance and guidance, especially from their Environmental Health Officer with COVID safety planning. I also would like to thank WAMCO, Lottery West, the businesses who donated to the show and CBH Group. The group this group of volunteers really did put Catanning on the map and I look forward to another successful and safe Catanning show in 2021. Member Coburn. I rise today on behalf of residents of Coogee Beach Caravan Park. The Caravan Park is located within the A-Class Reserve at Wooden Point and it is controlled by the City of Coburn under a management order. The City leases the site to Discovery for the purpose of operating it as a caravan park. Earlier this year, residents became aware that Discovery is proposing a redevelopment that is likely to displace dozens of long-term residents. Many of these residents have lived in the park for decades. Some settled there because of representations that they would have long-term security in the park. Some suffer from serious health issues. Most have invested their life savings in the park and have limited financial means. That is why I have made it clear to both the City and Discovery that I expect any redevelopment of the site to involve the following. Options for relocating affected residents within the park or to neighbouring parks, financial assistance for affected residents and a timeline that provides residents with certainty about how and when they will be affected. I have met with affected residents and I will continue to advocate on their behalf. I am particularly thankful to the following residents for raising their concerns with me. Gillian Spruitt, Sheila Rain, Gary and Jenny Reid, Michelle Abbott de Rivera, Anne Durant, Edie Mueller, Karen Clicker, Edith Sanderson, Brian Higgins and Peter and Sally Newsom. I am pleased to put residents' concerns on the record in Parliament and look forward to reaching an outcome that puts the interests of the community first. Member for North West Central. Madam Speaker, as Shadow Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, National Reconciliation Week is a time to reflect and act and to acknowledge Australia's important journey towards a fair, equitable and reconciled country. I encourage all West Australians to dedicate time during the week to actively learn more about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, histories and cultures. This year's theme, More Than a Word, Reconciliation Takes Action, is called to all Australians to be part of the challenge that is needed. We have we have come a long way, but there are still many milestones to reach and challenges to overcome. It's important to recognise the role and collectively play our, in our nation's uh, future. Apart from celebrating uh, this, the week, uh, we need to reflect on the pain affected, afflicted by Aboriginal 
on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, while also exploring ways of nurturing inclusive relationships and communities with fellow Australians for a better tomorrow. Learning from each other is a step forward. Reconciliation is not something we should think about just once a year, but it's also every day in every small way. As a regional MP, I'm acutely aware of the unique challenges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have faced when it comes to critical issues like health, education, housing and employment. Our work and policies regarding the disparities between First Nations and non-Indigenous people is ongoing and as Shadow Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, I'm committed to fighting better outcomes and pushing for equality in our state. Reconciliation is everyone's business and this week is a timely reminder for us to start the conversations around the history and we can be progressive, collectively achieve a reconciled country. Members, I note the time which the member for North West Central didn't um, and these proceedings are adjourned to a later day till 2pm. Honourable members, the President. Almighty God, creator of the universe, giver of life, who has ordained that we should live as social beings, seeking the fulfilment of our own true purpose within our society. Bless this Legislative Council, now assembled, to deliberate upon the affairs affecting the well-being and good order of society in Western Australia, that all members give honour, wisdom and integrity to the role which they have been chosen, and the decisions and decorum of this Council be always to the advancement of thy glory, the honour of Her Majesty and the continued benefit of the people of this state. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. This house acknowledges and honours the traditional owners of the ancestral lands upon which we meet today, the Wajuk people, of the Noongar Nation and pays its respects to elders both past and present. <laughs> Members, are there any petitions? The Honourable Dr Steve Thomas. Uh, thank you, President. Um, I present a petition um, containing 810 signatures couched in the following terms. Up to the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled. We, the undersigned, are opposed to the vehicle access closure to Hooley Road Beach in Boranup. Uh, we therefore ask the Legislative Council to recommend removal of the road blocking vehicle access to the said beach for fishing as a priority and your petitioners, as in duty bound, will ever pray. Are there any other petitions? The Honourable Dr Brad Pettit. President, I present a petition containing 170 signatures couched in the following terms. To the President and members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, we, the undersigned, are opposed to the rezoning of lot 5780 Down Road Albany for the following reasons. It is located in a priority two drinking water source and will significantly compromise and impact the future of this water source. The proposed use of the land as a permanent motorsport facility is incompatible use for the priority two area in accordance with the Water Quality Protection Act, note number 25. There is a presence of a freshwater spring on the property which feeds into neighbouring neighboring properties. There are threatened flora and fauna species present in the area which will be neg negatively impacted by this proposal and 
There are significant concerns over the noise pollution due to the proximity of neighbouring landowners, including the proposed length of opening times and operations. We therefore ask the Legislative Council not to impose not deep, sorry. We therefore asked the Legislative Council to oppose the rezoning of this land for motors of sport activities and request alternative sites be reviewed which do not impact the future priority to drinking source areas and threatened communities. And your petitioners, as in Judy Brown, will ever pray. Are there any statements by ministers and parliamentary secretaries? Papers for tabling. Members, I have one paper for tabling. The, uh, a report, Crime and Com Co Corruption and Crime Commission, review of a police use of force incident in Northbridge on the 10th of November 2019, 27 of May 2021. Are there any further papers for tabling? Are there any notices of questions? Are there any notices of motions to introduce bills? Are there any notices of motions for disallowance? Are there any notices of motions? The Honourable Nick Goran. Uh, President, I give notice at the next sitting of the House. I will move that this House, one, expresses its deep regret at the deaths of Ashwarya, Ashwath and Cohen Fink and tenders its profound sympathy to members of their respective families in their bereavement. Two, notes that section 22 1D of the Coroner's Act empowers the Attorney-General to direct a coroner that holds jurisdiction to investigate a death to hold an inquest if the death appears to be a West Australian death. Three, further notes that the Attorney-General has declined to exercise this power of direction. And four, calls on the Attorney-General to a urgently reconsider his decision not to direct that inquests occur in these two cases and b outline the criteria by which he determines when and for whom he will utilise this statutory power. President. Uh, the Honourable Nick Guaran. I give notice at the next sitting of the House I will move that this House, one, acknowledges the ongoing important role undertaken by the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission in this 41st Parliament. Two, notes that the standing orders of the Legislative Assembly apply as far as they are able to the work of the committee no, and that a, pursuant to Standing Order 270, committee deliberations will be conducted in closed session and b, pursuant to Standing Order 271-2, no member of the committee nor any other person may publish or disclose evidence not taken in public, including documentary evidence received by the committee, unless that evidence has been reported to the Assembly or that disclosure has been authorised on motion by the committee. Three, notes the comments of Mr Matthew Hughes, MLA, on the 13th of May 2020. Four, notes the content of Legislative Assembly message number nine received on the 26th of May 2021. And five, emphasises its expectation that all members serving on any parliamentary committee in this 41st parliament will respect and adhere the standing orders under which their committee is operating and acquaints the Legislative Assembly accordingly. Uh, the Honourable Nick Goran has moved that motion, and that motion will be circulated to. Sorry, he's just given notice uh, that he intends to move that motion, and that will be circulated to members in due course. Uh, are there any further notices of motion? Are there any motions without notice? Members, before we move to non government business, I'd like to. Welcome to the Legislative Council, the Carey Baptist College from Harrisdale. We hope you enjoy your time in the Legislative Council. Okay, thank you. Members, we now move to uh, non-government business. And the motion, move the Honourable Nick Guaran. President, I move the motion standing in my name. Members, the Honourable Nick Goran has moved that this council a acknowledges that this week is National Palliative Care Week and recognises the theme palliative care, it's more than you think. 
B notes that on the 19th of November 2020, the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia tabled its final report. C expresses concern that priorities continue to be misplaced as a consequence of the Minister for Health's ongoing mismanagement of the health system. And D calls on the government to table forthwith its response to the Joint Select Committee's 56 findings and 25 recommendations. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Nick Goran. Thank you, uh, President. Uh, members, uh, <coughs> at the outset, uh, I wish to acknowledge uh, that this is indeed uh, National Palliative Care Week. And in doing so, <coughs> I'd like to take the opportunity to uh, put on the record my appreciation for the long-standing work and commitment uh, of Margaret Quirk, MLA, uh, who has for the last two parliaments, and now moving into this third parliament, uh, agreed to be the co-convener with me of the Parliamentary Friends of Palliative Care. Uh, the honourable member from the other place, as I say, has had a long-standing commitment uh, to the importance of highlighting uh, an increased awareness in palliative care, and I thank her for her ongoing uh, commitment, both in the 39th Parliament, the 40th, and indeed in this 41st Parliament. Now, Madam uh, President, the uh, National Palliative Care Week theme this year is palliative care, it's more than you think. Now, <clears throat> the significance of the final word uh, think is that what they are asking us to do, the National Palliative Care Movement, is to understand that it is more than just thinking about palliative care, it also requires some action. By way of explanation, uh, President, uh, National Palliative Care uh, have undertaken a community survey and here are some of the key findings that have arisen as a result uh, of their survey. 76 per cent of respondents are likely to ask for palliative care for themselves or someone close to them if they had a serious prolonged or terminal illness. However, only 39 per cent of respondents think a person can first ask for palliative care when they are first diagnosed with a terminal chronic or degenerative illness. Further, only 31 per cent of respondents think that general practitioners can provide palliative care. 78 per cent of respondents agree that people should plan for the end of their life and 80 8 per cent of respondents think it is important to start thinking and talking about their wishes and preferences for care if you were to become seriously or terminally ill. And yet, President, the key findings that indicate that there needs to be action that arises from these thoughts are the following two. 50 per cent of respondents have done nothing regarding their end-of-life choices, and respondents believe that talking about their preferences for the end of their life with their family will upset them—54 per cent thought that—and find the subject of death and planning for the end of their life too difficult to talk about. And that was the case in 48 per cent of the respondents. Now, um, President, it is the case that uh, in the 40th Parliament, the, both Houses agreed to the establishment of a joint select committee on palliative care in Western Australia. <coughs> the establishment of that committee was somewhat torturous and a uh, review of the Hansard uh, uh, will remind members of the chronology of events that led to the belated establishment of that uh, committee by the government. But nevertheless, the joint committee eventually started, eventually started its work. It had a truncated period of time in which to undertake a very significant task. And I had the uh, honour of being the deputy chair of that uh, joint select committee. The chair was Chris Tallentire, uh, MLA, uh, from the other place. The uh, report, the final report of the Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care was tabled on the 19th of November last year. 
of course, since that time, and this will go to the final limb in the motion, there has been no response by the government with respect to the 56 findings and 25 recommendations. And this Minister, I'm happy to take your interjection as always. And you and I both know that there was an election in the preceding period of time. And we both know, and we also both know, that it has been six months, Minister, six months since the report was tabled. And I would not have thought that it was that difficult for one person in government to be able to author some form of a response. Now, Minister, I'd like this important issue of palliative care to be dealt with today with respect, because this is the type of matter that warrants bipartisan support. That is precisely why we have a parliamentary friendship group. It is precisely why Margaret Quirk, MLA and I have undertaken this work now for three consecutive parliaments. And I'm simply saying, Minister, since you decided to interject, that there has been ample opportunity for the government to provide some kind of response. No one is suggesting that in the caretaker period that a response should have been provided. No one is suggesting that. But we are now the 27th of May 2021, and it's not asking too much for the government to provide a response in respect to this work and the 56 findings and 25 recommendations. Now, Minister, you may well be the minister who will respond to this matter in due course, and you may or may not be in a position to respond today. And if it's not a, the case that you can respond today, that's fine, but if you could at least give us some indication as to when a, a fulsome response will be provided by the government, that will help us take this matter forward. Now, I want to draw to members' attention in particular uh, some of the findings and recommendations. You'll see in the third limb of the motion that we've talked about the uh, misplaced priorities of the current government. And it is regrettable, Minister, that since the election uh, that those misplaced priorities have been uh, exposed to the extent that they have. I say that it is regrettable not because exposure is bad. It is regrettable that the misplaced priorities are occurring at all. And uh, you'll have just heard earlier this morning that I've given uh, notice of a motion dealing with at least one of the consequences, at least one of the consequences of those misplaced priorities, and we'll consider that uh, hopefully next week. But in the meantime, the Joint Select Committee did prepare this report, as I say, containing 56 recommendations, sorry, 56 findings and 25 recommendations. And I want to take members to finding nine. Finding nine says the palliative care system is fragmented and its navigation is a challenge for patients. Now that was the case, this is what the committee said in November last year. I'm unaware of anything that has transpired over the last six months that has in any way alleviated uh, that concern. In actual fact, as I have understand it, in discussions with people within the sector, the situation has only become worse. And it follows, President, that given the state of crisis that the health system currently is in, that the fragmentation of the palliative care system and its challenging navigation can't possibly, can't possibly have improved in this, in this current climate that we're in. Now, members may take some note that in finding two, we, we partly find out the reason why the navigation system is so challenging and we partly find out why the system is so fragmented because the committee, unanimous finding uh, of the, the committee, I might note in passing and uh, thank the Honourable Kyle McGinn in particular for being a member of this uh, committee and giving his full-throated support to the findings and recommendations. And I note uh, in finding two 
that uh, the committee said that plans to implement the WA end of life and palliative care strategy 2018 to 2028 vary between agencies and range from a 10 year implementation plan by South Metropolitan Health Service, a five year plan by East Metropolitan Health Service, a three year plan by the Department of Health, a yet to be complete plan by North Metropolitan Health Service, and no publicly available plan by WA Country Health Service. That was the situation in November last year. It is therefore no wonder that the committee then finds the system to be fragmented and it is no wonder that Western Australians find the navigation of that system challenging. Now, I draw to members' attention finding eight. Finding eight says, A, the electronic palliative care information system, uh, which has the acronym EPALSIS, is a specialised palliative care data collection system in use in around 19 sites in Western Australia. B, the rollout of EPALSIS ceased in 2017 due to budget constraints. And C, a subsequent investigation into the current use of EPALSIS has resulted in a recommendation for its increased rollout and use to enable all hospital sites to accurately record palliative care activity and be funded accordingly. It's a very important finding made by this Joint Select Committee last year, President. It is a little disturbing that the rollout was stopped due to budget constraints. That was the evidence provided to the committee in 2017. Be that as it may, we can't change that. But now in 2021, surely those budget constraints no longer exist. Surely. And so we call on the government to give expedited consideration to uh, the consequences uh, of finding eight. Now, um, President, I also want to draw to members' attention recommendation eight, uh, which is found at page 85 of the report. Recommendation eight states that the Minister for Health explain why additional funding to increase the palliative care workforce was not allocated in the January 2020 Expenditure Review Committee submission. Now, that would be an uncomfortable recommendation for the government. I understand that. But I once again emphasise that this was a unanimous recommendation of this Joint Standing Committee. There were six members of this committee, and there can be no suggestion, there can be no suggestion that it was anything other than a tripartisan committee. Uh, the members of the committee were uh, myself as the deputy chair, also from uh, this place, uh, the former member for the Greens, the Honourable Alison Zamon, MLC, and also I've already acknowledged the Honourable Kyle McGinn. But from the other place, we had Mr Shane Love, MLA, Mr Zach Kirkup, MLA, and Mr Chris Tallentire, MLA, as the chair. And unanimously, unanimously, the committee has asked the Minister for Health to explain why additional funding to increase the palliative care workforce was not allocated in the January 2020 Expenditure Review Committee submission. Now, President, I understand, and I think the Minister has already foreshadowed, that the explanation that's going to be provided by the government today is to say that, well, um, we've had an election campaign. No doubt, no doubt. There will also be an explanation provided about caretaker period. And, looking into my crystal ball, I predict that the Minister will make some reference to the COVID-19 pandemic, because that certainly has been the excuse used for everything over the last 14 months. Now, I say that not in any way to diminish the workload that has arisen as a result of that. I continue to be surprised, I continue to be surprised that the uh, police commissioner in particular is able to do his job as effectively as he has been able to, considering the extra workload that he's had. He must have probably the most difficult job in the public service at the moment. Nevertheless, what can't happen, and I think recent events that have been uh, highly publicised, tragic events, have indicated what cannot happen. We cannot continue to have a situation where this government uses COVID-19 as some enormous shield to deflect from everything. 
a committee of this parliament, at least in the 40th parliament, has unanimously asked the Minister for Health to provide an explanation. Now, if that explanation can be provided today, fantastic. That's recommendation eight, Minister. If it can't, then at the very least, we call on you to provide a time frame as to when the Minister for Health will provide that explanation. I turn now, uh, President, to uh, recommendation nine. Uh, now, in this instance, uh, this was uh, one of the rare instances of it being a uh, majority uh, recommendation rather than a unanimous one. Uh, in this instance, four members of the committee recommended that the Minister for Health prioritise additional funding to increase the palliative care workforce, as noted in the Department of Health's WA Health End of Life and Palliative Care Current State of WA Palliative Care Service Provision and Key Findings Working Paper, June 2020, as found at page 30 of that working paper. So again, we call on the government to provide some explanation. Uh, does it have an appetite to prioritise the additional funding, as has been suggested by that working paper, as the necessity has been suggested by that working paper? Does the government have an appetite uh, for that or not? Now, one would hope that in the prevailing period of time, uh, the government will move past the fact that it's just a majority uh, recommendation and still provide some form of response. I also um, draw to members' attention, uh, President, recommendation 14. Now, recommendation 14 should interest particularly those members who represent the North Metropolitan Region. Now, my learned friend, uh, the Honourable Pierre Yang, has uh, in recent times, in recent times, uh, vacated uh, his position in the South Metropolitan Region, and he is now taking responsibility for the North Metropolitan uh, Region. And um, so, in particular, as the lead member for the North Metropolitan Region, I draw uh, to his attention uh, recommendation 14. Recommendation 14 states WA Health undertake an evaluation on whether the 10 additional inpatient beds in the northern suburbs of Perth referred to in the funding announcement on 10 October 2019 a, will meet the unmet inpatient palliative care needs of the northern suburbs of Perth as identified by the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices and b, constitute an inpatient specialist palliative care hospice for the purposes of recommendation 7 of the Joint Select Committee on End of Life Choices. What all of that means for those members who are not familiar with those reports uh, or abreast of the situation with respect to palliative care is that there was a funding announcement made by the government. I mean, one thing we can certainly say about this Minister for Health is we probably give him a 10 out of 10 with respect to announcements. He's good at the announcements, but on the accountability, frankly, we have to give him a zero. 10 out of 10 for announcements, but on accountability, zero. And the question here is what score does he get when it comes to delivery? Now, as I say, if you're a member representing the North Metropolitan Region, you'll want to know whether these 10, these 10 additional inpatient beds, do they exist? Do they exist? Or is this just an announcement that was made at a convenient point in time? in October 2019, I mean, those members that were in this chamber in October 2019 will understand the significance mm -hmm. of the end of life choices debates that were happening in October 2019, the pressure that all members were under. Was it a convenient announcement made by the Minister for Health on the 10th of October 2019? about 10 additional inpatient beds in the northern suburbs? Or was it an authentic announcement? Has there been any delivery as a result of that announcement? That's the question that members for the North Metropolitan Region need to satisfy themselves with. And in particular, that's what we're calling on the government to provide an explanation for. So in summary, uh, President, 
uh, I indicate to members uh, that uh, this is National Palliative Care Week. The theme is palliative care. It's more than you, than you think. Hopefully, for those members who have the opportunity to uh, read this voluminous uh, report from the last parliament, uh, they will have a better appreciation for just how much is involved uh, in this area. And I would indicate to those members, those members who are genuinely interested in this particular area, and I appreciate, particularly new members, you're going to get bombarded with requests to be involved in all kinds of areas. It's one of the privileges and the challenges of being a member of parliament. But if you have a particular passion and interest in uh, this area of palliative care, please don't hesitate to reach out to either myself or Margaret Quirk, MLA. We'll be only too happy to welcome you into the parliamentary friendship group. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to. The Honourable Yawn Sibler. Uh, thank you very much, uh, President. Look, I rise today to uh, support uh, my colleague and friend, uh, the Honourable Nick Garan, in drawing the Chamber's attention to uh, an extremely important issue which often goes unremarked. Uh, I think that is uh, to the detriment uh, not only of this chamber but to our community more generally speaking. Uh, I will take, I'll draw specific attention to, to, to two of the four serials in this motion. Uh, that is part A and part C. And I'll address uh, part A uh, first, just to reinforce the importance of palliative care. In the latter part of 2019 in this chamber, as uh, the Honourable Nick Garan has identified, individual members were put under immense scrutiny and pressure with respect to the voluntary assisted dying legislation. That was, I reinforce, a matter of conscience. And I am pleased to note that my colleagues, at least those in the Parliamentary Liberal Party, exercised their individual consciences to the absolute uh, limit of their endeavour and capability and did so in a way which reflects very well on them each individually because they respected the views of their own moral uh, foundation as well as those of their community. And we came to different positions individually in respect of that bill. And that is fair and that is appropriate because people of integrity can disagree on these matters. But there was a unifying thread throughout that conversation. It was, what are we doing with palliative care? Are we giving it the care and attention that we should? Or are we treating it as a transactional sort of adjunct to another issue? And I, on occasions, actually felt quite similarly to the Honourable Nick Garan. I thought that the conversation around palliative care at that time was being dealt with in a tokenistic manner. And for that reason, prior to me actually um, coming out, as it was, in terms of my position on that bill, I took the opportunity to speak with and then subsequently write to uh, the Honourable Roger Cook, the Minister for Health. I will quote an excerpt from that letter to him and his response to me, because it is, it is germane absolutely uh, to this debate. This is a letter from the 8th of October, and I'll provide this to Hansard uh, afterwards. I said, it is an acknowledged fact that resourcing for palliative care services is presently inadequate and that this deficiency has developed over an extended period of time. Outside of a cadre of committed clinical advocates who have worked tirelessly to improve public understanding and government support, palliative care as a category of clinical activity has not been the beneficiary of the attention it deserves. I go on to say that palliative care has suffered in part due to the opacity of its accounting within a clin clinical context. Because it has not been measured, it hasn't mattered. To keep governments honest in the long term, we must improve the manner by which we identify and measure palliative care services in, WA, in the WA Health Budget and through the activities of the individual health service providers by way of their annual reports. As discussed, I hope to win your agreement to have palliative care services as a discrete service line incorporated in WA Health's resource agreement with Treasury for the 2021 budget year and beyond. 
This would mean identifying palliative care as a separate expense line item in the portfolio service summary statement in the budget papers, with the anticipated total and yearly expenditure over the forecast estimates period detailed. I went on to say that the Minister's response was going to have a non-trivial uh, impact on the way that I voted on the VAD bill, because I didn't want to see palliative care services, palliative care generally, forgotten about in the rush to uh, vote in voluntary assisted dying. To the Minister's credit, he listened, I, I think, with a measure of, uh, of genuine interest, and he wrote back to me to say on the 15th of October that he agreed that the discrete reporting of palliative care services within the WA health budget uh, was an important issue, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, uh, but that it would ensure transparency and accountability for the resources allocated by the state government. Uh, further to your representations on the matter, I am pleased to confirm that I have instructed the Department of Health from the 2021 state budget to include within the significant issues section of the WA Health budget statement a standalone table with supporting commentary illustrating the funding, expenditure and services for palliative care. Now, why that's important is because it actually addresses this matter about the North Metropolitan Health Service, the available 10 patient, inpatient beds, whether they exist or not. There was a degree of fungibility and opacity around the way that governments had traditionally spoken about their apparent commitment to palliative care services. What we need to understand is whether or not they are fulfilling the commitments they ostensibly give. And one measure of actually proving that up is whether or not the government provides a considered response to reports as the Honourable Nick Garan uh, has drawn attention to. Uh, because it is a matter which is of critical importance to every individual, every strata of society, and unfortunately it is being provided lip service to. And I hate to say that the government's lack of response to this report, notwithstanding the fact that we've been to an election and we've been in caretaker, uh, to me is another indication that this government is largely all spin and no substance. And that should not be permitted to occur for the simple fact that you are now, or you are led, by the most powerful Premier in the country who has swiftly appointed himself to be the luckiest treasurer in the Western world. You control both Houses of Parliament. Nothing stands in your way of fixing problems so long as you have a commitment, a genuine commitment, to fix those problems. Now, I'm pleased to say that in the 2021 health budget, the minister followed through on his word. Now, it wasn't particularly where I'd want it, but on page for the, for the interested people, on page 317 of budget paper number two, budget volume one, there is a table. Um, in my view, it is a good first step, but not what you want, because you actually want to see palliative care listed as a discrete service line. Only then can you test whether or not the government is fulfilling its commitment. I'll turn very briefly to, to the third limb or, or serial C of, of this motion. Um, people with even a short political memory will recall that Roger Cook was probably the most effective opposition health spokesperson uh, that the state has seen for some time. If there was a problem, the now minister was all over it. He would be a dependable feature around 6.03 or 6.04 p.m. on a Sunday night bulletin outside Perth Children's Hospital or in the, uh, the waiting room of, of some poor unfortunate person or at the bedside, people looking very concerned and then lambasting the government for some uh, imagined or perceived or exaggerated failure. What? Oh, well, this. Yeah, I, 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 I thought even that gentle provocation would attract Order. some interest. How easy it is to be a critic. How easy it is. Do you recall the Sustainable Health Review and the 12 different light items? I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars you committed to that exercise in 2017 and 2018 and 2019. What has it? What has it delivered? You went to an election with this mantra, keeping WA safe and strong, safe and strong, safe and strong. Order. Order. What, 
What an appalling exercise in misleading the public of Western Australia about the true state of the health system. It is a shambolic mess. He has had more than four or eight years in opposition as the spokesperson to form a pretty good idea about what to do. He has been the minister for four years, and I hate to say it because I think he is genuinely a good person. But, President, members of this chamber, he is hopelessly out of his depth. Yeah. He is failing day in and day out. And it's not as if the Premier doesn't have about 72 or 73 other people to choose from to provide that portfolio to. Let's get serious and let's start taking the public of Western Australia seriously. Please, please, please take this opportunity to assume the full measure of your responsibilities, fix the health system and give palliative care the respect it deserves. Members, the question is the motion be agreed to the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thanks, President. I uh, make a few uh, comments with regard to this motion, in particular part C of the motion. Uh, now, my um, contribution today won't be Churchillian and bring down the government. I'll leave that till next week. But um, what I do intend to do is to give a, per a few personal. Ah, uh, look, I'm not listening to you. Nothing's changed. I won't listen to you. Won't take interjections from you. Um, can I say at the outset, uh, Matt, uh, President, um, I'm going to give a couple of personal anecdotes because last week was pretty traumatic. I've got to say what I witnessed and it uh, brings down to the, uh, what's happening in our health system. Now, we've all heard about the ambulance ramping in recent months. In particular, the shadow uh, health spokesperson who said, ambulance ramping at Perth hospitals continues to worsen with the state opposition claiming the system is reaching crisis point. The opposition released figures showing that ramping in May was 53% worse than the same time last year with the peak flu season still months away. It said emergency department congestion at Fiona Hospital had not been resolved, with the hospital recording 46 hours of ramping on Tuesday, eclipsing the previous single day of 31 hours, and so on. Officers and health spokesmen, spokesmen said the government should take decisive action. We're very concerned that the government is not taking this problem seriously or have admitted defeat. Uh, what we're seeing is a crisis as month after month we have increases in our ambulance ramping right across the metropolitan areas. The situation is out of control and the Minister for Health is simply missing in action, unable to respond to the crisis. That, of course, is not the current opposition health spokesperson, Libby Hammond. That was shadow health spokesperson uh, Roger Cook on Thursday the 4th of June 2015. Since that time, he stated then also on the 12th of February 2017, health department figures show ambulances ramped outside Perth hospitals for 1,030 uh, hours in January. The previous worst January was 980 hours in 2015. Well, 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 what a difference opposition makes. Let's have a look at ambulance ramping now. January of 2021, 4,165, Minister. And you're saying it's terrible. Apparently, it was 1,031. It wasn't. It was 805. February ambulance ramping in 2017 was 690. 2021, 3,162. We've got a crisis on our hands. We have got a crisis on our hands. Make no bones about it. Okay, let's not sugarcoat this. Our health system has got, is a, is got problems. Now. I witnessed that first hand last week, and I'm just going to give two examples of this because this was just dreadful. Last Thursday, that is Thursday the 20th, I was sitting in my electorate office with my staff having lunch. There's a road that goes right out the front of my office. It's in a car park. There's a car park from one end of Warwick Grove to the top end of Warwick Grove. I saw this old couple walk down. They went past my office, and as they went down, I saw the lady fall. They were very elderly. I saw them fall. So I jumped up and went out, and the old man had the old lady by the hand, and he was trying to get her off the ground. And she was screaming. She was screaming in pain. It was dreadful. I went over and I asked him to stop, to, to leave her. He couldn't speak English. He was Italian. He could not speak English. The old lady was writhing in pain. It was heart-wrenching. I sat down with her and put my hand under her head and stroked her and stroked her chin 
and stroked her cheek and stroked her head. She was screaming. It was dreadful. Now, this woman had either broken her femur or her hip. That was evident. I asked one of the other ladies that came to have a look, can you please go to my office and call the ambulance? Right? She did that. Almost an hour later, that ambulance arrived. Right? Now, this woman at that stage, I thought at one stage the lady uh, whose name is Iris was going to die in my arms. She kept on pointing to her chest. She was chatting. We developed a wonderful relationship in that hour, a wonderful relationship. I kept on calming her. I kept on patting her on the cheek and patting her on the shoulder. She was telling me she didn't want to go down there. She didn't want to die. Right? She kept on telling me this. She telling me she wanted to go back to Italy and I was comforting her the whole time. It was dreadful. I kept on telling the people, can you please hurry the ambulance up? I think this woman, is, I didn't say that so she could hear, but I think she was dying. Now, I can go into a lot more detail, I don't. Suffice to say, personally, it was, it was extraordinarily distressing. But I'm not the one that's, that has to deal with it. Poor old Iris, who would have to have been in her 80s, had to deal with that. Now, I don't know what happened to Iris. She went, they took her to hospital. She was screaming all the way and she didn't want me to leave. She held my hand. She kept on calling out for Peter. Peter, Peter, don't let me go, don't let me go. The, the, the ambulance officers came. They put her on, she was screaming all the way through. She wouldn't have a needle. Anyhow, I'm not gonna keep on going on about it. It was heart-wrenching. I've tried to find out where Iris is and how she is. You can't find that out, of course. We phoned all the hospitals. They won't let you know anything. So John's won't let you know anything. I understand that, don't get me wrong. That's co that's Confident, confidential, confidential. I really, really want to know what happened to Iris. I do. I hope she wasn't banked up in one of the hospitals for hours on end, because that woman was, was in absolute agony. The second one was on, fr on the third of Friday. My mother comes over and has her hair done at Warwick Shopping Centre, and she comes and has lunch with us, and I take her home. They phoned me from the shopping centre, from the hairdressers, and said, your mother's not well. Cut a long story short, I got there and she wasn't well. She's 88, she's the most magnificent woman on this earth. She is just a wonderful woman. She's kind, she's compassionate, she's ferociously loyal and she's stoic. She survived two, two doses of terminal cancer 40 years ago, 30 years ago, had bypass surgery 11 years ago, hip replacement eight years ago. I knew she wasn't well. I rang my sister and I said, oh, I'll bring her home because she, by the time I got her into the car, she was feeling okay. But she wasn't well. She was still breathing very heavily. My sister took her to the doctor. He said, go to emergency immediately. They took her to emergency and um, uh, they did a blood test. They put a cannula in so that she could have further blood tests if required. While they're waiting for the blood test, they asked her to sit in emergency. This is an almost 88 year old woman. My mother sat in emergency for six hours. For six hours, that 88-year-old woman sat in emergency, waiting for someone to come and see her. My sister kept on going up and saying, my mother is sitting in this chair, she's got a broken hip, it was a hard chair, at least even give them, a, give them a, something soft to sit on. They didn't, and she's so extraordinarily resilient, my mother, she put up with it, to such a point where just after seven o'clock last Friday evening, she said, I can't stand this any longer. My sister went and spoke to one of the nurses said, can you please take the cannula out? My mother wants to go home. So she went home. What happened then, of course, the last two days, she's developed a clot in her nose. She's convinced that she's going to get, she's going to, uh, because she had the jab, and I advised her to have the jab as I had the jab. She's convinced she's going to have a blood clot. She will not go back to the emergency and that's the only option she's got. She does not want to sit in an emergency uh, room again for another six hours. Now, I'm not saying that for political purposes. Iris and Beryl are two women, quite frankly, are coming to the end of their lives. They're in their 80s, but they do not deserve to be laying there on the asphalt for an hour for an ambulance to rock up or to sit in the waiting room of an emergency section of the hospital for six hours for someone to come and have a look at them. They don't. They've worked damn hard all their lives. I can tell that from spending an hour with Iris that she has. 
They, this is the human interest story that we're dealing with in Western Australia at the moment. Every day, this thing is happening. Now, I will get political here. If we have talking about billion dollar surpluses, let's not go and beat our chests. Let's go and have a look at the emergency section of our hospitals and say this is okay, because it's not. On behalf of Iris and on behalf of Beryl, my mother, my darling mother, can I say, can you guys please spend some money on our health system so that these people don't have to sit on the road and they don't have to sit on hard seats for six hours, but they get someone that comes along and shows them a bit of compassion and says to them, you're just as significant as anyone else. If we can't deliver that sort of service to people in our society now, in the 21st century, we should hang, out, hang our heads in shame. On behalf of Iris, on behalf of, of Beryl, can I say to the government, you guys need to do better? Uh, the Minister for Regional Development. Uh, I, thank, um, I thank the members um, for their contributions. Um, uh, we um, obviously uh, acknowledge uh, that it is uh, National Palliative Care Week and, uh, and we think it is a, a really important opportunity uh, to think uh, about, uh, about palliative care. Um, and uh, I was interested in the comments of the Honourable uh, Nick Goran uh, about um, uh, data which shows that many people uh, don't want to plan for end of life. Uh, they or their families don't want to think about death um, because it is, um, it is upsetting. And I think uh, that, is, um, that is probably true. And I would like to think that we can start um, um, developing that ability uh, to understand our mortality, uh, to embrace our mortality. And I do think having made progress and having established the voluntary assisted dying legislation is actually going to be uh, an important part of um, people perhaps um, being more prepared uh, to come to terms with the fact that their life will end um, and uh, that this is the way that it has always been and always will be, and, and to give more thought and more preparation uh, about uh, what they want um, for their own lives and um, what they want for those, um, those family members uh, and friends. Uh, that they uh, that they value. So I think it, I think this is uh, a very important, um, a, a very important goes really very much to the deep of, uh, to the heart of uh, uh, our acceptance of uh, of who we are as uh, as human beings. The uh, uh, um, and uh, I do uh, note the, and if I can just make a comment, a comment that the Honourable Jorn Sibmer, who we do acknowledge um, uh, was a, one of the few people on the other, uh, on, in his party, uh, that did come out and support that voluntary, uh, voluntary assisted um, uh, dying legislation, uh, but he was praising, uh, it seemed to me, uh, the fact that the majority, I think about 80 per cent of uh, the members of, uh, of his party in this place, uh, did not support the legislation, and that proved that they were people of moral, uh, moral profound moral principle. Well, I, I think there is another way also, though, that one, uh, and I'm not suggesting that they aren't people of moral principle, but I do think that one should reflect on why it would be, why it would be that a major political party, or what was a major political party, um, would have 80% of its members oppose a provision that 80% of the population uh, so deeply supported, that there was a profound support across the community, and yet, 80% uh, of, uh, of the members of the Liberal Party in this place could not see a way clear uh, to support that legislation. And, and I think in that little gem uh, that this, the disconnect 
between the people that are representing the Liberal Party and the people that they represent might give a little clue to what happened at the last election. Well, I, well, it's not how dare you. No, it, uh, I, it's not. It's, no, I'm sorry. This was actually raised by the Honourable Yorn Sidmer. And I take this really seriously. I want, I, I believe in democracy. I believe in, I believe that we need a strong opposition. And I think there's people here that probably aren't reflecting properly on what happened to their party. They're not reflecting on what happened to their party, and they need to, and I'm just, in a very helpful way, uh, trying to give um, <laughs> some guidance, because we have, got, we, have got, um, we have got new people that have come in, and perhaps they might um, want to reflect on, the, on, that, uh, on that history. It's not disgraceful. It's all about, I mean, on, and could, can I just, for new members who don't know, um, this is the, uh, the member interjecting as the member for outrage, the member for hurt feelings. Everything that is said on this side is disgraceful and shameful. Um, and look, I think we, we don't take any notice of that. I think what is, disgraceful, what is disgraceful and shameful is the way that you have led your party down the gurgler. That is what sh is shameful and disgraceful. But members... Um, but members um, Order, members. Uh, one speaker at a time, please, particularly for Hansard, who likes to record the debate in here. So the undertaker is there digging the grave, making it bigger and bigger. Um, but mem members, uh, now the Honourable Nick Goran is um, agitated uh, by the fact that we have not yet had an official government response to uh, the uh, a very extensive document, very lengthy report uh, that was made uh, to the Palliative Care in Western Australia Progress Report. Uh, now, I know the Honourable Nick Goran is an absolute demon for the standing orders and the procedures of Parliament. He's a, you, know, a, you know, some might even say he fetishises it. Um, but the, uh, and the member would be well aware then that, strictly speaking, with the proroguing of Parliament, that uh, this report lapsed. However, 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 we are not being pedants. And, the, uh, and Minister Roger Cook has, uh, has made it clear that he wants to take the good work uh, that has been done in this report, take the good work that has been done in this report. He's not going to rely on standing orders uh, to, uh, to ignore that report. He is, he is going to respond to it. Um, and and uh, the... Uh, order. Uh, order. And uh, so the, the, we order. will be... Will, will be providing a response. But oh, look, honestly, look, there are times when governments, where you say, oh, governments have taken too long. I mean, this is absolutely not one of them. This is the most outrageous suggestion. A report, a report that came down just before Parliament broke, there was... Order. And and Order. Order. Honourable yes. Members, thank you. The Interjections are interesting to a point. The Honourable Alana McTiernan. The Honourable Nick Goran said, oh, you should have just got someone just to sit down and write it. Well, that is not, that is no, this is, these issues need to be considered. They need to be considered by the minister. It's not six months. We had, we had a, uh, an election period. We had a period of, uh, of around six weeks of care. Order. Member, look, honestly, truly ludicrous. Even by your standards, even by your standards, a report that comes down just before the Christmas period, a government going into take caretaker, a government being reconstituted. Well, you know, you go out there, go 
out there, no one is going to listen to that stupid criticism. What we do have, what we do have is a commitment by our very able health minister, our very able health minister Roger Cook, uh, to provide a comprehensive response to this next month. So uh, the, the minister has, um, with all his many, many varied responsibilities, um, he has uh, he has he has committed to give a response uh, next month. But in the meantime, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, he is getting on with ensuring uh, that those projects that we have committed to uh, to improve and increase um, palliative care uh, are actually being uh, being rolled out. Uh, so there's, uh, I understand, there's over 32 new palliative care um, positions in the regions that um, that have been uh, that have been rolled out. Um, and, uh, and including, for the first time, um, uh, a whole series in regional areas of, uh, of Aboriginal uh, palliative care workers to provide um, a service that really takes into account um, some of the very uh, different um, perspectives around uh, and life and death that is um, found in our, um, in our, Aboriginal, uh, our Aboriginal communities. Uh, we have um, we have stood up the 20 um, beds uh, that we uh, committed to in the uh, in the northern northern regions. So just let me uh, now. We actually sorry. I think it's 10 beds that we committed to, um, <coughs> and we have. Um, sorry, I'm just going to check. Uh, the number, but whatever the number was committed, we actually went out to tender, uh, and uh, unfortunately, none of the tenders uh, were uh, were appropriate. So what we did was what we did was to negotiate with um, Joondalup Hospital uh, to have ten beds set aside uh, for palliative care, and in this um, at, at this time. Uh, so they are operating, and in the meantime, we are negotiating with the uh, parties that did uh, unsuccessfully tender to see if we can uh, get to a point where we believe uh, that they are going to be capable of, um, of delivering uh, that uh, service. Uh, our work in the Carnarvon um, Hospital uh, is uh, is proceeding well, and that uh, includes that is an aged care facility which has a uh, provision uh, for palliative care within it, and we understand uh, that that will be uh, hopefully operational by the end of uh, end of this year. Um, and uh, we're pleased that the Department of Health has made good headway in um, in progressing. Um, uh, in progressing uh, the uh, work on the Advanced Healthcare Directive. I think one of the things that came out oh, of Sally, all of the work to... surrounding um, uh, in the lead up to the Voluntary Assisted Dying Bill uh, was that the Advanced Health Directives uh, were not working properly. There was, uh, there was no central register of them, there was no ease of access to them and uh, that they wanted um, uh, this needed to be uh, as part of that, that whole package of, uh, of palliative care and helping people through uh, the final years of, uh, of their life to help them um, have, uh, have a measure of control over their lives, that it was really important to get that, um, uh, get that new uh, system up and running. So we've... Um, uh, and I understand that that work has, uh, that there has been uh, a lot of work that has been done on that, and we're hoping uh, that will be up and running uh, early, uh, early next year. Um, so there has been, and um, I think as we've seen right around, uh, our, our, we've seen in jurisdictions in Australia and overseas, uh, where uh, they have moved to uh, voluntary assisted uh, to legislate for voluntary assisted dying. 
What we have seen is an, in, an improvement and an increase in expenditure uh, on palliative care because the whole area um, has um, the whole area uh, has puts the spotlight uh, on uh, the challenges of uh, of end of life and puts a, a spotlight on uh, what are. Um, uh, deficiencies in the system. I must say, my experience in, uh, with the palliative care services in WA uh, have been uh, fantastic. I nursed my father-in-law and a very uh, good friend a, a couple of years ago uh, through uh, uh, their deaths at, at home. And uh, I just found that the services offered by Silver Chain were absolutely exceptional. So uh, we have got the fundamentals of good service. It is important for us to keep vigilant, to identify where the gaps are and where we are not, uh, uh, where we're not um, hitting the spot, and we will continue to do this. And our very excellent uh, Minister for Health um, has committed to have a government's response to the report uh, available um, by next month, which I think is very speedy when you consider all of the circumstances. Uh, I give the call to the Honourable Martin Aldrich. Thank you. Um, thank you. And it's, uh, it's I rise to... Is my microphone going to work? Yep. I rise to uh, uh, support the motion uh, before the House in this important week, um, being uh, palliative care week. And uh, it's interesting, um, I mean, when I, when, I first, uh, when I first became a member um, eight years ago, <clears throat> I must admit that I didn't have a great understanding of palliative care. I understood um, that it existed, um, but it wasn't something that I was uh, really that accustomed to. I hadn't been through uh, experiences, end of life experiences, like other members have, have uh, have talked about during the debate or talked about during the voluntary sister dying debate. And so it's been a bit of a learning curve uh, for me throughout my term to understand um, the value of palliative care services um, in, in, Western, in Western Australia and, and more broadly. The, I think it's important, and, and uh, <coughs> this week on Tuesday, um, the Honourable Nick Garan and I attended a breakfast hosted by Palliative Care Western Australia. And I've, and I've, and I've been previously. They obviously I couldn't hold it last year. It was held um, on, on Tuesday morning of this week, and it's never easy to get up, particularly on a parliamentary sitting week, particularly on a parliamentary sitting Tuesday, knowing how manic they are, uh, to attend a breakfast. But this, attending this breakfast was, um, was really valuable. Um, there was a, it was a room of, of mostly people involved in the palliative care um, sector, um, from clinicians to nurses to um, aged care facilities to a whole range of other uh, other stakeholders, and, and the guest speaker uh, this year was Dr. Peter Sol, who's a um, intensive care specialist and has quite a, a range of expertise uh, in with respect to policy and the law uh, around around palliative care. So I would encourage uh, members who aren't familiar with the work of Palliative Care Western Australia and, and indeed their annual breakfast in Palliative Care Week um, um, to to maybe try if if, if they're. Uh, if their diary affords them the opportunity to next year to attend, because it is really quite a worthy event. Um, I picked up a publication um, at, this, uh, uh, at this event called Palliative Caring, and it's published by Palliative Care Western Australia, information for families and carers who are caring for a person with a life-limiting illness or condition. And, um, and, and this was, uh, I've been sort of flicking through it during the week and, uh, and, it's, and, and I'm glad I've still got it for, for today's debate because I think it's a really good resource um, that perhaps Palliative Care Western Australia could provide to members and their electorate, uh, and their electorate officers in terms of supporting people with, um, su uh, supporting their families through end of life. And, uh, and, and often them, some of the most difficult, I don't think, I certainly in my experience, those issues don't always present themselves at the electorate office on a regular basis, but when they do, they're very difficult and, and they're often very complex and, and even more so in regional remote settings um, where access to medical services and health services uh, more generally um, aren't as comparable to, to our regional cities and, and our urban areas. Um, but I just wanted to quote um, from uh, page 15 of this brochure, which is, what is palliative care? 
And I think this is one of the things which was reinforced at the breakfast on Tuesday, is, is just how little people understand about what palliative care is and perhaps the misperceptions that exist around palliative care. And, and I just want to quote this briefly. What is palliative care? Palliative care is a person and family-centred care provided for a person with an active, progressive, advancing illness with little or no prospect of cure and who is expected to die. The primary goal of care to optimise the quality of life that remains. The care offered may include medical treatment, relief of pain and other symptoms, for example, vomiting, shortness of breath, access to resources such as equipment needed to aid care at home, assistance for families to come together to talk about sensitive issues, links to other services such as home help and financial support, support for people to meet cultural obligations, support for emotional, social and spiritual concerns, counselling and group support and referrals to respite care services. And, um, and, and, and I think uh, there, there is a general misperception, not just across um, patients and their families, but across clinicians and the healthcare sector about what palliative care is. And that was reinforced to me on Tuesday, the need to keep talking about what palliative care is, what the services are, uh, how to access them and when to access them. Uh, it's not something that ought to be accessed in, in, the, uh, in the dying days of or hours of somebody's, of somebody's journey. And so um, uh, there, there's certainly um, a lot more to be learned, and I think that's why this report, the uh, Joint Select Committee on Palliative Care in Western Australia, has been quite an important one, and, and members have spoken about the genesis of this report coming out of the consideration of the Voluntary Assisted um, Dying Bill in this chamber, where a commitment was made to establish uh, such a Joint Select Committee. Unfortunately, um, the report was tabled in November of 2020, which means that we haven't had an appropriate opportunity to consider the report's findings and recommendations, and it is quite, uh, it is quite a substantial report at 212 uh, pages. The, uh, um, I think one of the options that, that's available to, um, uh, to the uh, Legislative Council beyond today is to actually consider whether this report, and indeed there may be other reports that received inadequate consideration in the last parliament, ought to be reinstated to the notice paper. And, and particularly at a time where there are um, uh, the committees are only just winding back up again, um, it may be some months before we see reports of substance being um, reported to the Legislative Council for its consideration. Um, I think this report and potentially other reports uh, are of significant value that they should be reintroduced. Um, to the notice paper for consideration of the Legislative Council. It was something that we did after uh, the previous election. There were a number of committee reports um, reported late in that term, and they were reinstated on the notice paper for consideration of the House. And, and as the Minister responding has just outlined, it is the Government's intention to um, release a Government response sometime next month, which we then go into the winter recess, and then this would be an opportunity, perhaps after the winter recess, to consider um, the substance of this very good report, but also the government's response at that time during the one hour that's allocated to the consideration of committee reports on, on sitting Wednesdays. Um, Madam Acting President, I wanted to, um, I wanted to talk uh, about um, particularly the delivery of regional um, palliative care services, and, and, and the Honourable Nick Grand had, had did step through the number of commitments that were made pretty well around the voluntary assisted dying debate. I think there was one, there was a commitment made, uh, I think out of the budget that year, which was whilst the Legislative Assembly was considering the voluntary assisted dying bill. And then I think there was a second commitment made um, shortly after the arrival of, of that bill in the Legislative Council. And, uh, and obviously there were a number of questions uh, and scrutiny that took place um, of palliative care in the context of voluntary assisted dying. And at this point I wanted to recognise um, amongst others, um, the work of the, a former member of this place, the Honourable um, Jim Chown, and, and particularly some of the questions that he pursued around the access of, of palliative care services in regional Western Australia. And, and, I'm, and I'm sure as, as, uh, as members became more interested in this issue, particularly in the context of voluntary assisted dying, there was certainly a lot more scrutiny, um, scrutiny paid uh, to this issue. But I found it quite interesting um, that when I asked some questions around the government's commitments to palliative care uh, um, in, in 2019 uh, and 
the announcements were on the 9th of May 2019 and 10 October 2019. Um, they were the two announcements that I referred to that year in the, in the context of the VAD debate. There was, it was interesting that um, even right up until the last election, I asked, I asked a question um, in, uh, in late 2020, uh, which was on the 13th of August uh, 2020, and asked about, I asked about the models of, um, um, the models of care, and this was something that I, I pursued because it was the message that we were getting was that um, the models of care will change region to region, location to location. The government was very specific about the funding amount, the number of FTEs, the regional breakdown, but the one question that they weren't able to answer was um, the models of care. And, and looking at the uh, reflecting on this joint select committee report, that was something that I think that they did make some progress on, but not fully. And, uh, and that's still an area that um, we're yet to see um, some greater understanding around how increased palliative care services are going to be delivered in regional remote contexts. And, and, and I do agree that it's going to change um, location to location, but it does worry me that we're now in 2021 when these funding commitments were made in 2019. Some of them were end dated 2022-23, and we still don't have a lot of clarity around how they're being delivered, how they will be delivered, and, any, and, and, and as we're approaching that time frame, the commitment that's going to be made by the state into the future. Um, um, Madam Acting President, thank you for the opportunity. I think this is a, an excellent motion in Palliative Care Week to, um, um, to recognise the importance of palliative, palliative care. And I'd like members to consider um, whether or not this Joint Select Committee report ought to be uh, reinstated on the notice paper. The Honourable Lorna Harper. Thank you. Um, I'm actually very grateful that the issue of palliative care is being spoken about this week. As I alluded to in my inaugural speech, I have a um, personal connection to palliative care here in Western Australia. Um, I'd like to go on and tell you a little bit about my friend John. John and Sarah moved here to Australia um, about nine years ago. John's the same age as me, we're 51, not ashamed to put that on the record, um, and he ha they have a five-year-old and a three-year-old. Last year, John developed headaches. The doctor thought it was um, high blood pressure. January this year, he had a car accident, and he was fine, everybody thought, but afterwards he was very sleepy, so his wife took him to Joondalup Health Campus in North Metropolitan, in the North Metropolitan Health Service. They did an x-ray and discovered there was a mass on John's brain. Um, very quickly, in the early hours of the morning, they sent him to Sir Charles Gardner Hospital for the specialists there. John has a cancer, and I will not insult MD by trying to pronounce it, but it's called GBM. It's one of the worst cancers you can get. He had a very, very large tumour removed. Under, and started going um, radiotherapy and chemotherapy. John at the time was told if he was lucky, like 50% of other sufferers, he would have 18 months. That isn't to be. John uh, went back to St George Charlie's quite a few times, um, being ill. Um, his wife tried to look after him at home, but he was an ex-rugby player and built like an ex-rugby player. And it was very difficult for his wife to move this man who couldn't, paralyse down one side of his body, couldn't move himself. It was very difficult for John at home in front of his wife and his children to be a man who had trouble feeding himself, toileting, had accidents. The man was horrified. He felt he'd lost all his dignity. The last time he went to visit the hospital for a checkup, they kept him in. I've heard a lot said about North Metropolitan Health Service and palliative care, but I can tell you the palliative care team at Sir Charles Gardner Hospital are sensational. There was no questions or comments from them about lack of services or lack of beds. They didn't mention any of that. All they talked about is what they could do and what palliative care could do for John and Sarah. John spent some time in St Charlie's, and again, the staff are fantastic. Now, he's residing in Bethesda. Um, Bethesda, as a public patient in a private hospital, he has a beautiful view over the Swan River. He makes sure he gets his bed hoisted up so he can see that view. He's basically bed-bound. He's been out a couple of times, but in these COVID times, it's um, hard. 
He was given four weeks to live and he has passed that. His family has managed to travel from the UK, spent their two weeks in quarantine and are now with him. They're here to watch their son and their brother die. His two little kids don't quite understand it. Having a conversation with a five-year-old about your dad is going to die is one, probably one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. The care he, and attention he is receiving here in the North Metropolitan Health um, region is sensational. There's never been a question about lack of funding there. There's never been a question of lack of understanding. It is amazing about what's happening. You referenced a survey from the palliative care um, website about percentages of people who didn't understand about end of life. I, read that, I also read that survey because I too am interested. It was a survey of a thousand people. And I understand it's just a snapshot. And I would hope that the conversations we are having today will actually be able to encourage other people to talk about end-of-life choices. Now, unlike us, John is facing that. If, and it's a very big if, he's still here on the 1st of July, he will have the opportunity to make a decision about whether or not he ends his own life. And that is a choice that, thankful to the McGowan Labour government, he has. It will be his choice. And I can tell you, both him, his wife Sarah, his mum June, his dad Alan and his sister Sue fully support that choice. John is not happy that he is sitting in a bed withering away in front of his two little children. Palliative care is more than you think. My stepfather, he died of mesothelioma. He was too ill to go into palliative care, but that was back in 2005. We have come a long way, and under, through the voluntary assisted dying debate, a lot more people are aware of choices available to them at the end of life. Our health service is one of the best funded in Australia. Having worked at the union, I have personal experience of working and going through the hospitals, so I actually saw exactly what is going on in there. And whilst people are making comments, I would encourage every member in this house to go in and spend some time in a hospital, go into a palliative care unit, go into an emergency department and sit and watch and see what is happening. Then truly we can stand with personal experience and make comments about if, whether or not they're well run, whether or not the staff are supported. Let's remember, when we're talking about this, we are talking about people right now, people that some of us know or some of us have known who are dying. Let's not be flippant and shout at each other across the house because we have differences of opinions. This is a really, truly sensitive and sincere subject. So, palliative care is more than you think about. Please remember that. Uh, Thank you, um, President. Look, very briefly, I, I, I generally support, like many of the notions, the motions that are brought here by the opposition, started out well in a reasonable manner, but uh, became unreasonable and uh, degenerated into a, a political point scoring exercise as you went down. But at no point did I hear the Honourable Nick Garan acknowledge the wonderful men and women that work in the area of palliative care. And those families and those, those patients who are users of the service. And I want to acknowledge all of them today in this, nation, in this uh, palliative care week. It's a difficult area to work in and it's not an area that attracts um, lots and lots of staff to it. And anyone who works in that, in that field is truly wonderful and needs our acknowledgement on Palliative Care Week, as much as the people that, uh, that they assist and work with every day. And I think that applies also to all of our healthcare workers right across the health system, because after a year of COVID-19 and the worldwide pandemic, I think it's fair to say, and I, I, I don't think the, the staff in the health system will mind me saying, but 
Everyone's tired. Everyone's fatigued. It has been a particularly difficult year for those frontline healthcare workers. And I don't think it's helpful to come into the parliament and denigrate the work that they've done over the last year. It has been very challenging for everyone, and I thank them and acknowledge every single one of them, right through to administrators of the health system. And most of all, and I, I won't have it, the Honourable Jorn Sibma, where you, you make the claim that our health minister is out of his depth. He is not. He is the best health minister that this state has seen. He has done an amazing job through the most adverse of circumstances over the last 12 months. He has fronted the media day after day after day to keep Western Australians abreast of what's happening with the pandemic. And he has kept Western Australians safe. He has kept Western Australians safe. Funding for our health system is 18 per cent higher than the national average. We are getting great um, support in the regions from this minister and from this government with projects that have been sitting waiting for 20 years in the areas of health, hospital upgrades and mental health finally becoming a reality. So I understand that it's, it's difficult from opposition. I understand that when things go tragically wrong, as they did recently at Perth Children's Hospital, um, when things don't go well and don't go to plan, and members, aren't, for those that aren't aware, uh, our family has also been through uh, an adverse outcome with the loss of a child. But I don't think that this is the forum to deal with, with those tragic events. And our hearts go out to the family of Ashwarya and everyone who's had an adverse outcome in our health system. Of course it's not perfect. Of course it can be made better. But it is the best in the world. And I think it's times like this that we should acknowledge those people that make it the best in the world. Thank you, Madam President. The Honourable Kyle McGinn. Thank you, Acting President. Um, I too rise today to, uh, in the brief time that's left, to put my comments on the record regarding this uh, motion brought to the Chamber. I'll probably speak specifically to the report um, and also Part A. Um, and I too would join the Honourable Darren West in um, giving my thanks to all uh, healthcare workers, um, particularly in the palliative care space in this week. Um, and I want to go one step further and uh, make a, a big shout out to the people working in the Aboriginal palliative care space. Um, if you do get time to read this report, um, and I thank the committee staff for assisting um, because it was quite an uh, extensive uh, inquiry put into a very small time frame, um, which I think, given the opportunity to go a bit longer, probably would have found some more resounding results in there and probably a little bit more information around the recommendations. But, uh, but one of the parts that I think is really important starts on page 85, which dives into palliative care for Aboriginal people. And the committee heard evidence of uh, that Aboriginal people are generally underrepresented in the palliative and end of life care patient population and often difficult to have difficulty accessing palliative care services. There's another section within this report that touches on telehealth and an amazing um, step forward that we've had in telehealth, um, particularly in regional Western Australia in the mining and pastoral electorate, where it was um, a little bit of the forbidden fruit where no one wanted to touch it for a while and then COVID come in and telehealth started to rocket a bit more. Um, and there's some amazing telehealth setups right around regional WA that I think have taken a lot of pressure and stress off people that need to travel uh, long distances to get to, to, uh, to see professionals. So that is going to play, I think, a very important role through delivering um, Aboriginal palliative care, um, particularly in regions such as the Kimberley. Um, and you go through this report and read particularly around where the committee managed to communicate with organisations, which I've said in this chamber before, I believe it was under the elder abuse report in the last government where um, it was very difficult to get hold of Aboriginal health providers in the uh, elder abuse um, uh, inquiry. And I think we had a little bit better success in this report, um, with, uh, and I'll have to say with a lot of effort in trying to, to get that done. Um, and the effort is needed in that space to ensure that the Aboriginal voice is put into these reports and these inquiries. 
So the, one of the recommendations, which I think is uh, bang on and probably one of the best ones in the report, is palliative care units be designed in consultation with local Aboriginal community members and their elders. Very simple, you would think, but that's something that needs to be implemented to ensure that when we're creating these systems, the local community is part of that. Otherwise, we're coming in with an outsider's view in an ivory tower, dictating terms on how um, a system is going to operate. That doesn't work. Too many times do you see programs and projects implemented by um, federal, state or local government without interaction and consultation that just don't get utilised and end up being a waste of money. Then a new government comes in, gets rid of that program and starts another one without consulting. Palliative care is critical because the conversation around life and death is a big conversation. There's also cultural understandings that need to be taken into account. There is a huger debate to have here about dying on country and not dying on country. That's something that I know in the gold fields is a very split thing. Um, there's a, there was a high percentage last year that, of people that wanted to go to palliative care units in Kalgoorlie to pass away rather than on country. Um, but next time we get to talk about palliative care, I'll touch on that further. Thank you. Members, the time allocated to non-government business has now expired and therefore the motion lapses. We move now to private members' business. Uh, the Honourable Shelley Payne. Um, I move that this House supports the McGowan govern government's initiatives to create a renewable hydrogen industry in WA. Members, the Honourable Shelley Payne has moved that this House supports the McGowan government's initiatives to create a renewable hydrogen industry in Western Australia. The Honourable Shelley Payne. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to move this motion. For the benefit of some of the new members here that don't, haven't had a chance to um, investigate what the hydrogen industry is, um, I'll just give a little bit of a brief overview. So the hydrogen industry is about using hydrogen for energy. And a lot of you might not know that all the fuel and the fossil fuels that we're using now, diesel, um, petrol for our cars, natural gas. That's all hydrogen, but the problem with that is it's hydrogen that's bonded with carbon. So when we burn those fuels in our car, in our house, we end up with carbon emissions, which we know is not good for the environment. So the thing about the hydrogen industry is that it's a cleaner industry. So we take water, which is readily available and stable substance, um, and we use that and we break that um, in a process called electrolysis so that we can get the hydrogen out of it. And um, with that, it's a clean industry and there's no emissions and it's better for the environment. Um, so, um, with this hydrogen, we can store it and use it for energy. That's the main thing. So, um, the hydrogen industry, it's an emerging, it's what's called an emerging, in, emerging industry and there's still work to do with making it more efficient, making it um, let, more cost effective and making it safe. You might hear people talk about the renewable hydrogen industry, and that's when we use renewable energy for the hydrogen industry. So we use solar energy or we use wind farms to create um, the electricity that we need to create the hydrogen from the water. So um, this whole process is a clean, from all the way from production, all the way through the chain, it's a clean industry. So something very important we need to do for our environment. Um, so, Today, most of the hydrogen is actually made from natural gas, which creates emissions. So this is, um, will make it cleaner and, as I said, better for the environment. Um, so with this hydrogen, what can we do with it? We can put it in our natural gas pipelines to make um, our natural gas and the energy and the gas that we burn more efficient um, and we can store it and export it. We've got a huge natural gas industry, export industry at the moment, and this is something that we can do. Um, in 2019, the government made a strategy for renewable hydrogen industry, and we've got some goals in that strategy, which we've actually bought forward because this industry is actually moving ahead quite quickly globally. So some of the things that we want to do is make sure that our exports of hydrogen are what we, if we can build them up to what our natural gas exports are today, um, to make sure we can start putting hydrogen into our natural gas pipelines. That'll make the gas that we burn from those in our houses, everything more uh, better for the environment. Um, 
also we want to use it in our mine haulage vehicles. We've got a huge mining industry, so that's another one of the goals in the strategy. And the final one is to make sure that we can use some of this hydrogen for transportation in um, vehicles in regional Western Australia. So as I said, these goals have been brought forward um, because of the advances in this industry. Um, we've actually invested more than $35 million in this um, towards developing this industry in Western Australia, and we've actually got huge potential for this industry here. We're lucky we're not a country like Singapore that's got no land area. We've got a huge amount of land area where we can create renewable energy from wind and from solar, and we've also already got a big export industry happening with our natural gas at the moment which we can use all the knowledge we have with regards to that to try and develop an export industry for hydrogen. So currently the global the global demand for hydrogen is more than 70 million tons a year and it's estimated that our hydrogen exports could reach over 2 billion by 2030 and 5.7 billion by 2040. Um, here in Western Australia, we're involved in a number of exciting hydrogen projects. The first one you've probably heard about, Okaji and the Okaji Port, um, and that's one of the um, West Australian government's projects. Is the deep water port 23 kilometers north of Geraldton. And that's also the site of a strategic industrial area, which has a lot of potential up there. So um, that area is recognized for its world-class wind and solar energy potential. And it's got the capacity to support an extensive renewable energy hub. Um, recent investigations there have shown that it's got a lot of potential for um, solar and wind uh, generation there. And some of you might recall last year in September, we put out expressions of interests for um, this strategic industrial area for creation of a renewable industry there for renewable hydrogen production and export. And there's 65 expressions of interest that's come in, some of them from around the world, and we're currently reviewing those. Um, the second exciting project, which just got underway this month with construction starting, is the first community hydrogen power plant. And that's up in the town of Denham in the Gascoigne. And that's actually will be a first in Australia to have the first renewable hydrogen powered um, remote microgrid um, anywhere in Australia. So that's an exciting project. And also, we are fortunate this month, too, to receive um, a funding boost of over $70 million from the federal government under their Australian Renewable Energy Agency. Um, that that um, funding round actually only funded three projects, and two of them were funded in Western Australia, which just shows our real potential for hydrogen in an in industry in Western Australia. So the first project was up in the Pilbara, and that was uh, $42.5 million for the Uri Green Ammonia Project, and that's for a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, and that will produce renewable hyd hydrogen energy. Um, and that follows our $2 million grant to this project earlier this year. And then the second project funded with that federal funding through the Australian Renewable Energy Agency was $28.7 million, also for a 10 megawatt electrolyzer, and that's at Australia's Clean Energy in Innovation Park, which is run by ATCO, Ener uh, ATCO Australia. And that's um, in the Midwest at the Waradarj Wind Farm. And so that's gonna be producing renewable hydrogen for gas blending. So going into the natural gas pipelines. So we helped us kickstart that um, project with a feasibility study into that clean energy innovation park um, last year. So those two projects with receiving that federal funding that aligns with our government's uh, hydrogen strategy with regards to developing the hydrogen industry, both for export and also for our local gas network. So it's really important that we invest in this um, hydrogen industry to, first of all, reduce our impacts on the environment. And also, it's really important that we support these emerging technical industries and stay competitive in this global world. So there's a huge opportunity in Western Australia for a renewable hydrogen industry, but it's not going to happen without significant investment and lead times as well. And I just wanted to commend the Honourable Alana McTiernan, the Minister for Hydrogen Industry, for her work in driving this new industry in Western Australia and also the government's commitment to technical advancement of our state.
please the call to the Honourable Dan Caddy. Acting President, thank you. I rise today in support of the motion um, put forward by the Honourable Shelley Payne. Um, no one in this place should be surprised that I would support this motion wholeheartedly. The McGowan government has been pushing hard in the renewable and alternative energy space since the day it was elected in 2017. And as mentioned by the Honourable Shelley Payne, in 2019 launched the WA Renewable Hydrogen Strategy. There are many reasons to support uh, this government's initiatives to create a renewable hydrogen industry in Western Australia. The first and obvious one is quite simply that it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to do for our future. It's the right thing to do for our children's future. And it's the right thing to do for the future of the planet. And it's true that these statements could be made about a great many policy directions, some of which are difficult and costly to implement. But the beauty of this one, and the second of the, uh, the, second of the three reasons I want to put forward, is the net economic benefit to Western Australia that will be realised through the creation of a renewable hydrogen industry in this state. That's the second reason, the simple economic export argument. And the third reason is that it's an opportunity to become a world leader in hydrogen and hydrogen technology. Uh, the Honourable Shelley Payne outlined already why Western Australia is best placed uh, both geographically and uh, with the uh, climatic conditions required for hydrogen production, as well as the other reasons that um, we have a natural advantage over many other places in the, uh, in the developed world. So I won't rehash this for honourable members. I'll just go back and explore my reasons in a bit more detail, the initial reason that it's the right thing to do. I'm sure no one in this chamber, well, I hope no one in this chamber would need convincing of this, but I'll say it anyway, as the world moves at an ever increasing pace towards the realisation that the continued use of fossil fuels is not just a thing of the past, but it's actually harmful to the planet. New technologies are increasingly being seen as the only way forward, not just here, but across the whole world. Hydrogen technology, supported by renewable energy at the front end, represents a clean energy source for the future, not just of our state, not just of our country, but for the entire globe. And the second reason, the economic argument, Western Australia for the past 50 or f more than 50 years has been at the forefront of uh, exporting minerals and resources across the world. The Honourable Alana McTiernan in uh, December last year pointed out that if, if we get this right, and I think uh, the Honourable Shelley Payne alluded to this, by 2030, which is not that far off, the hydrogen export uh, industry will be worth $2.2 billion to Australia. And by 2040, a little under, haven't got the exact figure, $6 billion to Australia. To put this into perspective, our, uh, our national exports in 2015 for wool came to about just over $3 billion, and for wheat, just under $5 billion. So the hydrogen export market would not be an insignificant market for this country. But as a student of history, what excites me most about the possible creation of a hydrogen industry in Western Australia is when I, when I compare it to where the wind turbine industry was some 40 years ago. This is the third and what I believe is the most compelling reason to uh, push and push very hard right now in the hydrogen space. It's an opportunity to become a world leader in this industry. Acting President, a world first was achieved on the 15th of September 2019, and I'm pretty confident that not many members in this place are aware of what I'm referring to. It was the first time ever that a nation's uh, wind turbine energy pr production exceeded what that nation required over a 24-hour period. And some of you may have guessed, uh, that happened in the small Scandinavian country of Denmark. Honourable, honourable members may ask why am I talking about wind turbines in a country on the other side of the world when this is a motion on hydrogen in Western Australia. And if you bear with me, I'll get to my point. But first I need to take you on a, 
on a brief tour of the history of wind turbines uh, and the Danish wind turbine industry. Just the basic details. Uh, I don't profess to be an expert on the subject. It certainly wouldn't be my chosen category on hard quiz. President, or acting president, in the early 1970s, the wind turbine industry was, much like the hydrogen industry is today, a fledgling industry. The Danes embraced this new, uh, this new industry. The Danish government invested a whole lot of money in wind turbines and wind turbine technology. But that's, that's not the real story. It's what's happening now, all these years later. The Danish energy company, Ustup, which was born out of Dong Energy, the largest energy company in Denmark, is now building a one gigawatt wind farm in the North Sea. And this will link directly into the UK energy market and, uh, and help provide them with energy. And at the same time, this same company is building a one gigawatt wind farm in Massachusetts. And that will link into their, their, uh, uh, their power network. And I'd remind honourable members that one gigawatt is about the total uh, that we get from all of our wind farms right across Western Australia. The critical part of this, the fact that this, this company, this Danish company, is building two massive wind farms now on two different continents, is that they are using Danish technology, Danish produced wind turbines, and, uh, and, uh, and the Danish know-how to go about it, and they're all manufactured in Denmark. And why, why is this relevant to the hydrogen debate today? The important thing in my synopsis of this, it's not the percentage of power that's, um, that's produced by uh, wind turbines in Denmark, although that is impressive. It's said that in the, if anyone stands anywhere on the 43,000 square, square kilometres uh, that make up Denmark, you can see two things. You can always see the Danapu, which is the Danish flag, and you can always see a wind turbine energy producing windmill. But the important lesson out of the Danes taking the lead in wind power nearly 50 years ago is that they now lead the world in this technology, including the manufacture of the towers, of the, uh, of the turbines themselves, of the blades. And this is what we should be doing right now. This is where hydrogen technology is at. It's where wind technology was at 50 years ago. People often talk of the uh, Norwegian sovereign fund. And this, is, this was a Danish equivalent, albeit they've tied up an industry rather than using royalties. The time for hydrogen is now. If we can not only create, um, if we can not only create but be at the forefront of global hydrogen technology, we will be exporting the knowledge and the know-how for generations to come. This is not something we can put a price on or a, a, at this stage, and, and one would be foolish to try to do it. But it's undeniable that if we become the leaders in hydrogen technology, this benefit to future generations of Western Australians will be many, many times more than the already not insignificant uh, benefit of the simple processing and export. And so this is the key lesson learned when we look at what happened with wind technology and the Danish experience. Go hard early. Become a world leader in a technology and the benefits for your future generations will be extraordinary. By capitalising on our geographic and natural advantages, Western Australia can establish itself as this global leader. We can be, in decades to come, the, at the very forefront of hydrogen technology, and we can be the knowledge base and the know-how base for the entire world. The Honourable Lana McTiernan is an outstanding minister. She's achieved uh, more in her time um, as a minister than uh, many others put together, let's put it that way. And so I'm confident that this will happen. I'm confident under her stewardship that we will become a world leader in hydrogen technology and this will only add to the Minister's legacy. I give the call to the Honourable Jackie Jarvis. Acting President, I rise to support the motion moved by the Honourable Shelley Payne. When we think about hydrogen, I'd like to um, go back a little bit in history and reflect on the work of astronomer Cecilia Payne. 
Cecilia Payne was born in the same English county I was born in, in Buckinghamshire, um, in 1900, so just a couple of years before me. Um, Cecilia did the first work um, as an astronomer that actually came up with a thesis um, that identified that hydrogen was one of the most common elements in the universe, um, understanding that stars were made up of that. I do believe at the time, in the 20, 1920s in Harvard, um, a lot of the blokes there didn't quite believe her, and I think it took her some time to convince them that she should be awarded her PhD by Harvard. Um, Cecilia obviously paid a lot more attention in school to chemistry than I ever did. Um, the only other thing we, I do have in common with Cecilia, though, is that we are both the mother of three children. And uh, fortunately, one of my children did study much harder at school than I ever did. And um, in February, I was very proud to watch her graduate from Curtin University with a um, bachelor's degree of electrical power engineering with first class honours. Um, my daughter, Caitlin, uh, did her thesis at the end of that degree on the use of hydrogen power in the West Australian context, and specifically in the context of delivering electricity to regional communities. So I called her as the Family Brains Trust on Hydrogen and said, tell me, give me a bit of a dummy's guide. Dumb it down for mummy. I want to understand hydrogen. And um, so she talked about hydrogen as this amazing element, this element that can be produced from water. Um, and when used as a carrier for electricity, or any energy, it returns pure, clean water as a byproduct. Um, she also told me that it was, it was the late 1950s when it was first used to, to um, power vehicles. And so I said, well, where, why has it taken us so long? And of course, the issue was that we can use any, electric, any energy source to create hydrogen, but it certainly defeats the purpose if we're using coal-fired um, electricity to create hydrogen. So she said the game changer in WA is, of course, the use of solar to create this hydrogen. And she explained to me that WA is perfectly well set up to lead the world in hydrogen. She talked to me about the fact that we can use PVs. Apparently, that's what the cool kids call solar panels, PVs. Brad's laughing because he knows. <laughs> um, so because we have obviously an abundance of sun here, we are perfectly well set up. And I um, echo the Honourable Dan Caddy's words when we have this huge opportunity to take this industry to the next level and WA is in the perfect position. She also explained to me that um, the other thing that makes WA so great to develop this industry is that we already export gas. We're experts at it. We're experts at using our, our available resources and selling them to the world and whether that is agricultural exports, as I thank the honourable member for mentioning, um, or obviously we are experts in um, our mining exports, but I think hydrogen um, creating this fabulous new renewable energy source will be fantastic. Um, so I'm absolutely supportive of creating this environment for a fledgling renewable hydrogen energy industry in the state. Um, I'm also incredibly excited about the opportunity to support a green manufacturing industry. Um, as my daughter, Caitlin, explained to me, hydrogen has an opportunity to create um, an energy source that is using very high heat, one of the high heat manufacturing. I don't think that's the right term. I'm sure um, perhaps the Honourable Shelley Payne as an engineer would be able to correct me on that one. Um, but because we can use hydrogen to, in manufacturing, this is perfect for manufacturing of steel products, um, and those industries that we want to build here in Western Australia as we move to creating more of those manufacturing jobs in our own state. Um, so look, I am incredibly supportive of this bill and um, I am supportive of the work done by the Honourable Elena McTiernan and leading the charge on renewable hydrogen energy industry in Western Australia um, for both power generation but also to support and advance manufacturing here. Uh, I give the call to the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Acting President. And um, you always try and sit here and wait for the Minister to speak to respond, but I'm sure we'll talk across the chamber if required. Um, uh, thanks for the opportunity, Member, to discuss uh, the potential of the hydrogen industry. Uh, for those members who are new to the chamber, uh, this chamber has had some excellent debates on energy policy over the last four years, and you've missed 
um, the opportunity with um, the Minister for Regional Developments, the Honourable Anna McTiernan, and the, the now Minister for Mental Health, who was the Environment Minister at the time, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, uh, and one of our departed members. Um, I don't know whether the, the Honourable Robin Chapel is still officially, officially honourable or, or simply Mr. Roy, he's still officially the honourable. He's still honourable. We won't put that to a vote today. Um, but some, ex some excellent debates in this chamber about the, the future of renewable energy. Uh, and if you had listened to those debates, you would have heard all sides of the chamber talking about the future potential and how Western Australia might plug in. And it is absolutely the case that we've got a range of potential options for energy in the future. Now, I know, acknowledge that the Minister for Regional Development has uh, uh, made herself the champion of the hydrogen industry in, in to some degree the same way as um, the Honourable Bill Johnston has uh, taken, taken up the cudgels on behalf of uh, lithium uh, and the battery industry. And some, look, some good work has been done, done in those areas. Uh, the minister, this minister and I both attended a couple of years ago the opening of the ATCO Clean Energy Hub. Uh, and so we both have a fairly long history in supporting both the potential of, of this industry and other renewable energies. Um, hydrogen is a fairly simple uh, chem chemical. Um, it's basically a proton with an electron somewhere uh, floating around it. it. It's not complicated, and the chemistry around this process of developing hydrogen as a tool is not complex. Um, you can pull it out of water, you can pull it out of the atmosphere. It, it's, it is a fairly simple process. The key to the, all of these industries is, of course, that over time you have to turn it into an economic uh, proposition. And hydrogen will one day meet that point. Uh, it is somewhere where both the, uh, the solar industry and the, uh, I think somebody mentioned uh, the, wind, the wind generation component uh, was some years ago. I think, I think you know, we were talking about wind turbines 40 years ago. I suspect it might have been a bit, a bit closer than that. So hydrogen will catch up. And there are some good reports out there to suggest that hydrogen will catch up at a reasonable rate of knots. I've seen studies that suggest that it may become more competitive in that region in the second half of this decade, 2020 five, six, maybe through to 2030. Uh, the, the tricky part with hydrogen at this point uh, is that it is, uh, it is the efficiency and the losses you occur between the point of generation and the point of usage. And it hasn't caught up with the, the general uh, electricity sector in that and certainly can't compete with things like lithium batteries. And that is not to say that lithium batteries will be the, the be all and end all, because I suspect that lithium batteries will be replaced by other rare earth batteries, particularly, uh, I would have said, the prospectivity of vanadium looks quite exciting going forward. Uh, and then probably the biggest advantage of that will be in the reuse sector, where lithium batteries will deplete relatively quickly, whereas vanadium will have a very long-term uh, recharge capacity. Uh, the, the, the simple solution, though, is that at this point, if you look at the efficiency of that energy, uh, if you take uh, a, a production uh, through insertion into a, a renewable battery and then final usage, the efficiencies of, of that electricity now is sitting up in the 90 plus percent. Uh, and that makes it a pretty efficient system. And that's why you will see a, an increase in, in electric, electric vehicles at a, at a higher rate at this point than you do in hydrogen vehicles. And that is about the efficiency, the efficiency of the generation and ultimate use of that energy. Uh, best indications at this point are probably that hydrogen production, particularly for transport, is somewhere between 30 and 40 per cent efficiency by comparison. And it has always been the case for those who have been heavily involved in the industry that, that hydrogen as a fuel source started out in particular uh, as a highly prospective heating energy fuel source. And that if you can store it, ship it easily and use it then because you can, you, you're only using that energy fairly quickly uh, and you don't have too many steps and processes to get it from the point of production, transport and final use. Uh, where, and that's the advantage that the electricity car industry has at the moment. So hydrogen will have to catch up, particularly in terms of transport energy over time, and that's going to take a, uh, a, a little bit of work. So I would say that in terms of prospectivity for, for transport energy in, in a bulk way, 
um, we've probably still got a little way to go. Now, uh, in my sort of research, I note that the, that the International Energy Agency, the IEA, uh, has counted the number of hydrogen refuelling stations around the world. And it's starting, but it's starting at a fairly low rate. So there were six countries in the world that had more than 10 uh, hydrogen refuelling stations. Um, the, the greatest the level was found in Japan at 134, Germany 90, and the US at 46. So it is still very much a fledgling industry at this point. Um, that's not to say that it doesn't have enormous opportunity. It is absolutely the case that this energy may well prove itself to be one of the most efficient. Um, the trick that we will have to face, and I guess the threat that a, a, a hydrogen industry in Western Australia might have to deal with, is the simple nature of its, of its production. Because it is, is a very simple process. And so where we, will, where we will have to be careful is that if you can produce in Western Australia a relatively cheap product, you then have to transport it effectively to overseas markets. And I know that's what the Minister for Regional Development is focused on through the Midwest. I did note that the, uh, the, the Liberal Party took some strides in this, in this direction during the election campaign, uh, acting president. Um, and, um, um, but um, let's, uh, but uh, so all parties are, are looking at this process. The hard part will be that if it is economically um, realistic to derive hydrogen in the Midwest and then transport it and deliver it to countries where the demand is. Now, bear in mind that we in Western Australia are a low uh, energy user by world comparisons. I mean, the peak demand on the Southwest Integrated System when I first got involved in politics was about four and a half thousand megawatts. You know, it's now about three and a half thousand megawatts as industry stagnates and we become far more efficient with other things. So we are not a big energy user. So if this, if, if, this is, if this is going to proceed, then you, what the thing is that you have, to, you have to generate this at an economic value. And the hard bit we'll find is that if it's economic to do it here, it may well be more economic because of the simplicity of the chemical nature of the process to do it at the border of the recipient country. So if we can do it here on renewable energy for... for for, if we, so I don't, have time, I don't have time for interjections, Minister. If you can do it, if you can do it at, at the point at Australia, um, it is potentially more cost effective because you lose the transport cost and also, uh, I guess, the, the environmental impact of the transport if you do it uh, directly at uh, the, uh, the level of the, the recipient country. And so Western Australia and Australia will have to be incredibly cost competitive to be in that marketplace. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't pursue it. We're a believer in pursuing it. Uh, we have supported the Minister for Regional Development in her, in her uh, push for hydrogen. And uh, like I say, I've been to events with the Minister where we've both been supportive of this industry uh, and we think it has enormous potential. But it has to be uh, economically viable and that's where we have to get to over time. Now, um, if you don't do that, uh, members need to just remember that governments do not have the greatest history in terms of picking winners and losers, losers in projects um, and, and assessing the, the, the economic viability of it. And uh, for those new members, uh, I, I, I suspect you should ask members who have been around a while about this thing called the petrochemical plant uh, in Western Australia and how, how the, uh, the then Labor government proceeded with that and how much money the, 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 the Western Australian purse lost out of that process. Now, that's not to say that this is going to happen again, but it just means that we have to be a little cautious to make sure that all of the things, all of the prospects are examined here, including the economic viability of this, uh, because you can, we, can't afford, we can't afford for the Labor Party to throw away billions of dollars in the process. So it will be, it will be a very careful examination of the best, best, the best prospects going forward. And the most important role for government and for the Chamber is to be supportive of the development of the sector and, most importantly, in terms of regulation, to get out of the way and allow it to be developed, because government is generally far better at getting in the way of new industries through over-regulation and, and um, um, getting in the way of, of, of red, with red tape causing the problem. We're better at that than we are at, in, in promoting these industries, and that will be the major role for government if hydrogen is to develop here to its full potential. Order. Um, the, the Minister for Regional Development. 
Uh, thank you. I thank uh, the Honourable Shelley Payne for um, bringing this motion forward, and I thank all my uh, uh, speakers on this side for their contribution. And uh, I particularly thank the Honourable Jackie Jarvis for telling me about Cecilia Payne, who I'd never heard about her. And it just so happens that maybe it's not a coincidence, but Cecilia is my patron saint. So there you go. Um, um, but look, uh, perhaps if I uh, I just direct uh, my comments uh, a little bit to the comments that have been made uh, by the Honourable Steve, uh, Steve Thomas. Now, it's interesting, um, the Honourable Steve Thomas is equating turning up at, uh, at an event as showing that we are equally um, involved and engaged in the, uh, in the hydrogen industry. I, I will just point out that at that particular proposal, we had actually given a uh, million dollars uh, of funding uh, to that uh, to that refuelling project, uh, and I have to say, uh, and whilst I uh, I understand there's a sort of a, a sort of support in there uh, for the uh, uh, for the hydrogen industry from the leader of the opposition, it is fundamentally his comments uh, are really really fundamentally wrong and show, and in fact show, um, a profound lack of understanding of his own party's history in this sort of area. But I want to just make this comment. When we came into government in 2017, the cupboard was bare in terms of any development of this fledgling industry. There was no knowledge of it. There was, uh, it was not even on the radar. Of, uh, of the Barnett government. But in along with uh, dismantling all of the infrastructure surrounding climate change and their um, uh, moving back from uh, uh, positive policies on renewable energy, they had certainly let the whole hydrogen story go by. So when we got into government, we had to pedal very, very fast to get up uh, to speed uh, with where many other states were going so that we in Western Australia uh, were not being left behind. Now, I asked the um, minister, the leader of the opposition to understand this. Uh, that the whole development of the natural gas industry in Western Australia uh, would not have happened or would not have happened at the time it did. It probably would have taken uh, a decade more unless it's a Charles Court knew that you had to get in there and you had to support that industry. You had to give a take and pay, con take or pay contract to get that thing off the ground. Likewise with the ord. They took a chance on the ord. But what you, and they used to also support you know, the work that was done by governments of both persuasion to make sure that we got that Quinana refinery down there in the 50s, the work that was done, the fights that were had, the fights that were had for the, with the eastern states to allow us uh, to override the major funders of the Liberal Party and the eastern states, BHP, to allow Western Australia to develop its iron ore industry. Well, we need the same today. You can't just, it's not a case there of, of, of the member saying, get out of the way. What government has to do is just get out of the way, absolute rubbish. Nothing would happen. What industry? Get out there and order, start doing, order. instead of doing order, members. silly, silly ill-conceived uh, announcements about something uh, of which you knew nothing, get out there and actually talk to the industry. Talk to the industry and what they're telling us all across the world, they need government to be in there as partners. They need government to be in there driving it. Because you're right. It's not fully commercial yet. It's not fully commercial. And just in the same way that we have seen so many uh, technologies uh, um, emerge uh, after, after support from governments because they could see the potential, the same is here. It, a lot of work is needed. But can I tell you why this work is needed? And uh, I think the uh, members, and I think uh, uh, in particular the uh, Honourable Dan Caddy and the Honourable Shelley Payne talked about the need for us to decarbonise our economy. We've got to do it. We've got to do it. Now, even if you over there, if you don't care about the future of the planet and you think that's all this Greta Thorberg stuff and it's not real, well, just focus on our exports. Just focus on our market. 
focus on what we export. We export iron ore, we export wheat, we export wool, and we export, hopefully one day we'll export cotton. So we are, and are all of the customers, all of the customers of these products are asking, what is the carbon footprint? People are being called to account. CBH is racing off now. How can, how can we deal? How can we account for the carbon footprint in our wheat, in our barley and our oats? What's going to be our story? What's going to be our accounting mechanism? How can we show uh, that, we are, um, that we are dealing with this? So, and likewise, iron ore, all of those products, all of the stuff we export, we are being called to account. And so this is being taken out of our hands. We don't need, you know, ScoMo and, and all the other coal lovers and, and climate change deniers in the, uh, in the Liberal Party can proceed. The markets have made their decision. They're going up. And the financiers, we had uh, the conference in uh, Sydney uh, yesterday. We had uh, all these finance institutions talking about, talking about their, their regulatory environment in which they, uh, which they operate, they have to account for their exposure to carbon and carbon liability. So this is happening. Whether you like it or not, it's happening. And if we just sit back, we could just sit back and get out of the way as the, as the Leader of the Opposition is on. And what would happen? All of the other states would get it. They, all of the other states would get this new industry and we'd be, we'd be sitting back doing nothing, you know, and having to do as we had to do under the Barnett government because they refused to invest in renewable energy. We used to have to buy buy renewable synergy, had to buy renewable energy certificates from South Australia because we wouldn't do it ourselves. Great model, just to get out of the way, go and have a sleep, um, and uh, that's not how things work in the modern world. And I can tell you, we will be losing great opportunities. We will be losing, but with the member, honestly, I don't mind interjecting, but you don't know anything in this area. You seriously don't, and I do. Now, the Europe, the Germany alone, Germany alone has committed 11 billion dollars, 11 billion euros into this space. That's a German government is going to be investing 11 billion euros. Two billion euros of those are going to be for international investments. So they're going out next week. They're going out next week, releasing those guidelines, releasing wanting companies to say, yeah, where can I, where can you be producing renewable energy, renewable hydrogen that we can use in our systems? And if we're not in there, if we're not in there actively engaging with our industry, making sure that we've got the land tenure available, making sure that we've got the regulatory framework that will help us navigate through the 240 pieces of legislation that you need to navigate through, we're not going to have a chance. We're not going to have a chance. It will go elsewhere. Well, I can tell you, Member, we are not going to leave it to the other states to take advantage of this. We're going to be go out there fighting, and we're going to be fighting for the downstream processing opportunities. We're doing a study at the moment, a million dollar study, into the green steel, the potential of a, of a green steel uh, or, um, industry driven off, the back of, uh, driven off the back of power. We are looking at how we can participate. We've got a $10 million program uh, to get into the production of, uh, of wind turbines. And we also are deeply wanting to uh, engage in how we can get uh, the electrolyzers here. We, if we're going to be operating at such a massive scale, potentially by 2040, having 200 gigawatts of power being generated to fuel renewable hydrogen, uh, we are go we want to be uh, in there, not just shipping, uh, not just digging and shipping. We want to be in there creating, having a manufacturing sector uh, that can support that industry. So, member, it's not a question of sitting back and getting out of the way. It's being in there, working in close collaboration and partnership, as Liberal governments of way past used to understand. Order members, the question is the motion be agreed. The Honourable Carl McGinn. Thank you, Mr. 
you, Mr Acting President. And what a de delivery of that speech, Minister. That was absolutely what we're after in this industry that's required for us to get this off the ground. Unlike eight years of absolute nothing that happened on the other side. If we want to hear about PFAS for three years, we'll go to you, Honourable oh, Steve Thomas. Don't worry about that. But when order. we want to talk about order. hydrogen, order. we'll go to the Honourable Order, Honourable members. Tierney. Order. Order. I think we've only got a very time-limited debate left. Probably only time for a couple more speakers. I'm actually struggling to hear the Honourable Carl McGinn, and I assume Hansard, who's closer to the Honourable Member, is finding it even more difficult. The Honourable Carl McGinn. Yes, I'll, I'll try to, uh, to uh, lower my voice a little bit there, Mr Acting President. Um, but it is quite easy to get passionate when you listen to the Honourable Alana McTiernan and talk about hydrogen. Um, she is out there spearheading this for the state and making sure that we get new initiatives off the ground and renewables is front and centre. I know in the last government there was plenty of neg negativity in this chamber, coming particularly from this area in the chamber, in the last government, that was just totally anti-anything renewable. But then when it came to the election all of a sudden, there was a little bit more of, oh, potentially hydrogen, something we want to look at. The Honourable Minister had put so much work into that space. We can go through the projects that other people have already mentioned, but there's two projects I want to focus on, and one of them is particularly up in the Ord, and that's something that I remember a past member who spoke a lot about whether or not we were doing anything in that space. And we've got the Ord Hydrogen Project, which is up there and has had a feasibility study done in 2020 which is going forward, which is a massive opportunity for local employment, a huge opportunity for us to utilise a natural resource to build the energy we need. And I'm, I'm personally a big believer of using that energy in the local area where it's created. And there's a great project where I went with the minister um, only a couple of weeks ago down to Denham, where we were able to turn the sod on a $9.3 million project, which could see the whole of Denham operating off of hydrogen. That is phenomenal. This is an opportunity for an entire town, which is a tourist town, to be operated um, with renewable energy. There is potentially the opportunity to offset a million litres of diesel. That is unbelievable. And to think of how small Denham is and how we can move on to a bigger project, I am absolutely ex um, really excited about seeing the potential of Exmouth. I think Exmouth is a really great opportunity for, for the state government to focus on potentially having that run through hydrogen, um, but just imagine what that sells to the world. So we're already selling one of the most pristine tourist destinations within the world. We now may have the ability to sell it as a completely green, renewable area. That will, in, that will now have opportunities for the tourism operators to turn their operations into green energy, and then all of a sudden we're selling a huge environmental tourism package. I don't think you can find anywhere in the world that would be able to sell such a package as that. When you've got the reefs, Turquoise Bay, oyster stacks, you've got all that out there, whale sharks, but we're trying to move towards selling something as a package that nowhere else in the world will have. And I know the people in Exmouth are excited about it. Um, they, they tend to be a bit green, uh, honourable member over there, so uh, they, uh, they definitely are excited about renewable energies in that space. But Denham took on this project um, with open arms. The minister and myself were up there and seen um, the sod turn happen, and as soon as we were leaving, they were starting construction. They were that excited to get going, and we went up and did a tour uh, through the uh, power plant that's currently there and all the plans that are in place to see this project, which will produce a um, hundred households worth of energy. Um, that to me is exciting. I think you, you talk hydrogen, you talk desal de desalination plants. Um, these sort of things I think are also needed in areas such as Exmouth where water is a bit of an issue as well. So there's some synergies to be able to expand out, not just within the uh, hydrogen, but also in other needs that the community requires. So <clears throat> I think it's going to be exciting to see how Denham goes. Um, because if we can get this off the ground, um, we're looking to see installed a 704 kilowatt solar farm, a 348 kilowatt hydrogen uh, electrolyzer, and a 100 kilowatt fuel cell uh, in Denham, enabling excess renewable energy to be used to produce renewable hydrogen, which will be stored on a site and used to power homes as required. It's an amazing outcome. Um, and I know. 
Go back four years ago, who was talking about hydrogen? only person talking about hydrogen in this chamber that I was listening to or I heard was the Honourable Alana McTiernan. And she's gone out there and now we have a portfolio that's focused on that to ensure that we're moving into the future, not into the draconian pass of coal that we see from the East Coast people and the federal government that's constantly, constantly getting rid of renewable energy projects, talking them down. I think I remember um, he's almost been rubbed out of political history, but it, I think it was Joe Hockey um, who said when he was driving to Canberra that how, how insulting it was to have the eyesore of wind farms as he come into Canberra. What a disgrace to see that he was a leader in a space when we needed to see energy transition into renewables. Not to mention Tony Abbott. I could go all day about his view on renewable energy, but, but you know, let's just, let's just thank everyone that he's no longer in politics, because Joe Hockey, I think, just disappeared into America and went and joined up with Trump. But um, that's where them views belong, to be honest. That's where them views belong. Not over here in Australia where we're trying to be progressive and bring initiatives of renewable energy. So um, that, that to me was quite hilarious that an eyesore was a reason that we shouldn't have renewable energy. Don't worry, I'm not listening to the garbage over there, the Honourable Sam Rowe, because it, all, it sounds like Joe Hockey and Tony Abbott have been reborn. Um, so I think what we uh, members bring coming back to the motion uh, before I get, get out of hand here. Um, would you like an onion to bite into there, Honourable Steve Thomas? Are you right? You're all good. Do you want me to continue? I'll continue. So we've got um, order, <laughs> order, honourable, oh, order. I have a listen to this. Order, the honourable Carl McGinn. I invite you to address the chair on the subject <laughs> of hydrogen, and I ask other members to seek to cease their interjections. The honourable Carl McGinn. Thank you, Mr. Acting President. Um, it does get a little bit too exciting sometimes to hear the other side um, whinge in despair. But uh, I will get back to the projects. And again, as I said before, $9.3 million in Denham. What a great start um, to see a town like Denham move into the future um, and be able to produce hydrogen, produce their own energy, get rid of some diesel. Um, and make it an all-round better, uh, better place to visit. And you know, I, I always spruik the mining and pastoral electric because it is the, uh, one of the most beautiful places in the world. But Denham, Shark Bay, Exmouth, these places are phenomenal. They are second to nobody else in the world. And if we can get them into the space of renewable energy, if we can get them into the space of hydrogen, and get them into a space where they are known around the world as environmentally friendly tourism locations. I think we're going to have a better opportunity at getting even more tourism once we get past the pandemic that we currently have. And I really do see that we will have something that the East Coast doesn't have or anywhere else in the world has. And that is a great thing for the environment. It's a great thing for small businesses in my electorate. And it's a great thing for the state government to be leading because the state government should be the one saying, this is where we're heading. We're not going back to the past. We're not going to walk into the chamber with a piece of coal and a high-vis jacket. We're going to go out there and find new energies, new en oh, see, they, they didn't like that one, did we? Um, but, uh, but that's okay. We'll just get rid of coal instead and make hydrogen and everything. Oh, was that the policy? I can't remember. It didn't last very long anyway. But, uh, but look, thank you uh, to the uh, Honourable Shelley Payne for bringing the motion to the chamber. I appreciate it. I know you're uh, a big advocate within the uh, environmental space, um, and it's good to see renewables is on your radar. I look forward to hearing you talk about that into the future. And once again, I thank the Honourable Alana McTiernan for fighting for West Australians for innovation in hydrogen energy. Well Members, questions the motion be agreed. The Honourable Pierre Yang. Mr Deputy President, um, can I please uh, begin by thanking the Honourable Shelley Payne for moving this motion. Uh, it's a very well thought out motion and her contribution is uh, really magnificent. Now, Mr Deputy President, before I launch into the substantive part of my contribution, can I please just uh, congratu congratulate yourself for um, uh, being elected as the new uh, Deputy President of the Legislative Council. Uh, I have seen you uh, as the Acting President during the last term of Parliament, and uh, you uh, are truly uh, um, uh, a, uh, uh, a great candidate for that position, and uh, I would like to congratulate yourself. Uh, I would also like to congratulate the Honourable Alana Clossy for being elected the new President of the Legislative Council. 
And I uh, uh, was only too happy to see her uh, taking uh, the seat. And um, my uh, warmest uh, congratulations, um, President. Mr. Deputy President, um, when I uh, was listening to the debate earlier uh, this morning, I was actually getting worried uh, because there was no one uh, seeking the call from the opposition bench. And, uh, and, and I was worried that the, the, the Liberal National Coalition may not have any idea or policy on uh, the very important issue of hydrogen. Uh, I did some research, I did some research, um, and I found out that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the member for Cotesloe, uh, Dr. David Harney, MLA, Dr. David Harney, MLA, is the Shadow Minister for Hydrogen. So I'm uh, very pleased to see that the, the LNP do have at least a person, a, um, a person from their front bench looking after this portfolio. Whether there is any uh, policy ideas coming out of that uh, uh, portfolio, uh, it remains to be seen. But I'm glad that at least they had someone. And I was only very pleased to see that the uh, right honourable gentleman, uh, the honourable Dr. Uh, Steve Thomas, stood up and uh, put forward his views. Although that I may not necessarily agree with you on uh, many of the things you said, uh, but that's okay. But that's okay. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, um, I uh, may also add uh, that uh, uh, if you look at the new members from this side of the House, uh, the Honourable Shirley Payne, who moved the motion, the Honourable Dan Caddy, and the Honourable Jackie Jarvis, who uh, um, uh, 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 responded and put their views forward. And also during the non-government business, the Honourable uh, Lorna Harper, who uh, um, made uh, a contribution during that uh, item uh, of today. Um, you can see the uh, enthusiasm and the energy coming up from these new members. I'm, uh, very pleased to see all this, and I thank the members for um, making a contribution a day or two after their first speeches. So, congratulations, uh, new members. Now, Mr. Deputy President, Mr. Deputy President, I um, would like to say that uh, hydrogen is the ultimate clean energy. Uh, as we know, and we heard from uh, the Honourable Shelley Payne, uh, who. Uh, educated the House about uh, the scientific backing of, of this new energy. Um, to separate water, uh, to, um, to separate hydrogen uh, from water, uh, you will produce uh, oxygen in the meantime, which is not carbon. All right? Oxygen is not carbon. It does not cause um, global warming or uh, greenhouse effect. Obviously, to achieve that, you would need uh, energy to process uh, the, 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 um, the uh, water. However, Western Australia being Western Australia, we have uh, endless sunshine, we have endless uh, wind, so that we can um, uh, have renewable energy to help to separate hydrogen uh, from water to produce oxygen, which is causing no uh, detriment to the environment. Um, President, uh, I uh, um, just wish to re-emphasize uh, my congratulations to you uh, for your election and um, um, congratulate uh, you to be our new uh, uh, President of the Legislative Council. President, um, in the remaining time, I want to say this government has promised back in 2016 that we will diversify the economy of Western Australia. And as soon as we were elected in 2017, we embarked on that journey. The Minister, Alana, the Honourable Alana McTiernan uh, launched the launched the the report. I'll get the terminology right. 
the uh, Western Australian Renewable Hydrogen Strategy in 2019. The government has been working tirelessly in diversifying our economy to make sure the state captures the wave of the new energy that this world will see, hydrogen um, and uh, solar energy. And all these will create endless jobs for Western Australians. And this is a government that has been working tirelessly on these projects that in turn, while we have the backbone of our economy, the mining and resource sectors, we'll have diversified industries that will provide support for our economy. So when a particular sector of the resource industry going through a flight time after a boom, we have other, other areas in our state that can provide more jobs for Western Australians so that we will not see a huge increase in unemployment rate as we saw during the twilight years of the Barnett government. There was 100,000 Western Australians who didn't have a job back in 2016, 2017. And I just want to say that it is important, it is important that as a state, we look at new areas, different areas to support the industry to provide that policy support so that private sector can go in and invest with that policy certainty and in turn will have more jobs and more employment for the state of Western Australia because Western Australians deserve that. Members, that concludes uh private members' business for the day, and we now move to orders of the day. Leader of the House. That orders of the day numbers one to five be taken after order of the day number eight. Members, the Leader of the House has moved that orders of the day numbers one to five be taken after order of the day number eight. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Um, members, that means that we move to uh, item six on the uh, business program, address and reply. And the motion is to His Excellency, the Honourable Kim Beasley, Companion of the Order of Australia, Governor in and over the State of Western Australia and its dependencies in the Commonwealth of Australia, May it please Your Excellency, we, the members of the Legislative Council of the Parliament of Western Australia in Parliament assembled, beg to express our loyalty to our most gracious Sovereign and thank Your Excellency for the speech you've been pleased to deliver. This is the Honourable Member's inaugural speech. I give the call to the Honourable Clara Andrick. Thank you, President. May I congratulate you on your appointment as President of the Legislative Council. During your inaugural speech to this House in 2013, you spoke of the values of honesty, integrity and fairness, and how they guide you and define you. As someone who has looked up to you as a role model for many years, I have no doubt that your leadership of this House will be defined by those same values. May I begin by saying, Nagala Kadic, Nunga Mort, Kayan Kadak, Nija Buja. Please excuse my pronunciation. I want to begin my address by acknowledging the first and continuing custodians of this land on which we meet, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to acknowledge the first Aboriginal person to be elected to this House, the member for the Mining and Pastoral Region, the Honourable Rosie Sahana. It is a historic occasion, one that fills me with pride to be alongside you in this House. I'd like to congratulate Premier Mark McGowan on his re-election. His determination during the election and his excellent leadership led our party to a truly historic victory. I would also like to congratulate my colleagues in both Houses those re-elected and newly elected members of parliament alike. 
Firstly, let me begin by thanking the people of the South Metropolitan Region. I am incredibly honoured to have been elected to represent them in this place. I am proud to stand in this chamber today as the first Serbian-born person elected to the Parliament of Western Australia and the first Serbian-born woman to be elected to a parliament in Australia. My journey to this place began in May 1986, when two brave migrants took a leap of faith and began their voyage to Perth, Western Australia. With nothing more than two suitcases and a dream of a better life, they embarked on a journey to the other side of the world in search of opportunities and a brighter future for their children. My parents, Clara and Ishtvan Marton, who are here today, could never have imagined that one day I would have the opportunity to be elected by the people of Western Australia as a member of the Legislative Council. I am incredibly honoured to be standing here as a proud representative of a party with a strong tradition of supporting the most vulnerable in our community and making dreams like this one here today a reality for working class families just like mine. I was born in Novi Sad, Serbia in 1981, a city located in the autonomous region of Vojvodina in what was then known as Yugoslavia. When I am asked the question of my heritage, I often explain the place of my birth. Because the reality is there is no single existing nation state that can explain the complexity of my origins. Born to Hungarian parents who themselves were born in Novi Sad, Serbia, a city located on the banks of the Danube River overlooking the Fruška Gora mountain, Novi Sad is renowned for the celebration and unification of its people's cultural and religious differences. Named the European Capital of Culture in 2021, the city epitomises the very essence of multiculturalism and inclusion. In the words of the late singer and writer, George Balashevich, Novi Sad is a city where you hear six different churches ring in unison, where you celebrate two Christmases, two Easter's, Names Day, Saints Day, where you walk along Jevreska, past the Novi Sad synagogue, and hear the acoustics of a classical concert being played by an international artist where you attend the three-day-long celebrations of Romani neighbours and live on streets named after poets, streets that are patrolled at night by grandmothers walking arm in arm admiring the neighbourhood roses and gossiping in three different languages, understanding one another completely. Named the city of love and tolerance, Novosajani, as we often like to call ourselves, are resilient people. Despite heartbreak and loss from the devastating wars in the Balkans, our humour, sense of kindness and humanity never wavered. Indeed, Novi Sad was and remains a proudly multicultural city where differences are celebrated, hatred is shunned and standing up against injustice is second nature. I hope to carry those enduring traits with me during my time in this place. Like many before us, my parents joined the wave of economic migrants from former Yugoslavia and made their way to Australia. I still vividly recall the night we embarked on our voyage. The tears and sadness on my grandmother's face remains etched in my memory to this day. Little did I know how far Australia was and the impact that distance and not seeing my family would have on me. But my parents made those sacrifices for my future and to them, I am eternally grateful. In some parts of the world, including the Balkans where I come from, politics doesn't always serve its true and intended purpose. Indeed, sometimes it's politics that causes the destruction and devastation of its people. Seeing the impacts war has on civilians was made very clear to me at a very young age particularly when I visited Serbia, then Yugoslavia, in 1993, 1996, 1998 and 99, just prior to the devastating NATO bombings. In 1993, as a 12-year-old from Australia, the stark contrast of the two worlds I belonged to was ever-present. 
Former Yugoslavia was in disarray. The war was impacting everyone on all sides. Even though Novi Sad was relatively safe, you could feel the tension erupting around us. It was during this time Novi Sad became a safe haven for civilians desperately fleeing war zones from across the Balkans and searching for safety. As a child, I watched the desperation on faces of refugees who fled from the destruction in other regions of former Yugoslavia and witnessed people from my city, once a magical city, begging for food and basic needs. I stand here today and consider myself one of the lucky ones. Lucky because I was fortunate enough to have the security and safety of Australia to go back to. This was not easy for my family, who watched the years of devastation in my homeland unfold from the safety of our lounge room, not knowing whether our family would be safe. It was during this time, more so than ever, I realised the importance of good government. Governments who work in the interest of their people to protect them and to pro properly fulfil their obligations. As a child, I was encouraged to speak out against injustices and inequality, to be part of the conversation, to think critically of the politics of the time and how it could be improved. My parents always talked about the effects of politics on everyday people and to stand up for what we believed in, the principles of social justice, equality, education, an accessible healthcare system and a fair go are the values that my parents taught me and the values that led me to join the Labor Party. In our household, politics was discussed at the kitchen table, in front of the TV, at family dinners and even when guests came over. That old saying, never discuss religion and politics, had never been uttered in our household. Mum encouraged my younger sister Rebecca Marton and I to have our own voice and our own views on every issue imaginable. Though perhaps in hindsight, and now with two girls of my own, I suspect this was not appreciated as much when our voices and arguments were in fierce disagreement with hers. SBS Nightly News was our Bible, second to Sundays watching SBS football with my father. Football was and still is my father's language. The soundtrack of my youth was none other than the dulcet tones of Mr Football himself, the late Les Murray and the late Johnny Warren. Growing up, I was a little different to the other kids at school. English was my third language after Hungarian and Serbian. We spoke our languages in the home. We listened to music from the old country, cooked traditional foods in our kitchens, a place where nobody ever left hungry, and added an ethnic element to nearly every Australian tradition we were introduced to. For my family, this was our way of staying connected to our culture, our heritage and our identity. My family and I made Perth our new home. It wasn't difficult to fall in love with this beautiful state and its people. The climate, laid-back lifestyle, beautiful beaches, incredible nature and friendly people made settling here much easier than we anticipated. Perth is my home. It's where I've chosen to raise my family. I'm fortunate that the city of my birthplace and the city I now call home share in common with each other the beauty that is multiculturalism. Both Perth and Novi Sad have taught me that multiculturalism works, that it should be protected, that the onus is on every one of us to call out injustice, to, to reflect on our own internalised prejudices and to welcome all those who come to our shores either by boat or by plane, some by choice and some because they have no other. What is clear is that no migrant embarks on such an uncertain journey to reach our shores without making incredible sacrifices. My story is not unique and is certainly not a unique story in this house or in our community. I am proud that in this parliament in particular, this story is shared by so many members who have come from all walks of life and made this beautiful city of ours, in this beautiful state, our home. 
Now, more than ever, Parliament reflects the diversity of our community, its richness in culture, lived experience and the collective aspiration to commit to something bigger than our individual selves, to leave a legacy that changes the lives of those around us. Indeed, while my story in this country began some time ago, it has not been one shared unanimously in our community. For those who came to Australia when migration first began, or more recently, this accommodation wasn't always felt. Some did not feel like they belonged. There are some, perhaps, even in this chamber, who no matter how long they have been here, how pure their Australian accent is, or their place of birth on their passport, faced racism, both overt and covert, hidden or rationalised, with an explanation that our society is too willing to accept. It is incumbent upon us to change this. Painfully, kindless kindness is most absent towards our First Nations people, whose land we have the privilege to walk on whose voices have been missing in our conversations about the future of this state for so long. We are still trying to play catch up despite being their guests in this beautiful country. We must not ignore the past trauma and dislocation that First Nations people experienced. We need to do better in recognising the ongoing effects of this trauma. This week marks National Reconciliation Week. This year's theme, more than a word, reconciliation takes action. Urges the movement towards braver and more impact impactful change. And we all have a responsibility, individually and collectively, to ensure our path to reconciliation is more than just hollow words. Many from my community settled in the South Metropolitan Region long before my family's arrival, in areas such as Spearwood. Spearwood is the kind of place I have always felt right at home. Seeing tomatoes growing on nature strips, lion statues on balustrade balconies, the never-ending procession of arches, columns and marble on brick veneer homes, the kind of homes where it's safe to say Jim's mowing has never stepped foot on. <laughs> More precisely, homes that encompass concrete as far as the eye can see. After all, Australia would not have the love affair with concrete it has now were it not for us migrants. <laughs> what is clear is that here in Australia, migrants and migrant communities have had a lasting impact and helped shape our community into the diverse place it is today. More than one third of Western Australia's population was born overseas. For many migrants in the South Metropolitan Region, their first glimpse of Australia was from the shores just off the Fremantle Passenger Terminal, where hundreds of thousands of migrants disembarked and began their new life in the 1960s and 70s, following the post-World War II migration. This is a story that is shared by many living in the Southwest Corridor. Almost 20 years ago, I decided to build my first home and raise my family in the southern suburb of Atwell. This was a time when traffic lights were still positioned on the Quinana Freeway, new estates were yet to be developed before the major infrastructure projects at Coburn Central Gateway Shopping Centre, before the delivery from the previous Labor government of the Perth to Mandra rail line. And thank you, Minister McTiernan and certainly long before the arrival of the very contentious Coburn Station Tower of Faces. As some of you are aware, the 2021 state election was not my first rodeo in running for parliament. In 2013, I gave it my first go and ran for the seat of Jandicott, where we campaigned heavily for the needs of the people in our community. Crucial to those needs was infrastructure which had been neglected by the then Liberal National Government. The new establishment in the east of the South Metropolitan Electorate appealed to young working families who were moving into the area because they offered more affordable housing for first home buyers. However, the Barnett Government made it clear it had no plans on how it would support this expanding population 
and no plans to make sure that councils in these areas could deal with the increase in volume and pressure points of physically having more people move into the South Metro Corridor, whether it's roads, infrastructure, building new schools, ensuring planning laws are sustainable for the future, or that local emergency services are funded to deliver services that are needed. This is what good governments do. They prepare the state for the future. Since 2017, our pocket of the world has changed dramatically within, with the election of the McGowan government, who are delivering on their commitment to ensure infrastructure and community services continue to keep pace by delivering on commitments such as the widening of the freeway, building the Armadale North Lake Road Bridge, developing the Armadale Road dual carriageway and creating the first east-west metro link from Coburn Central to Thornley. These projects, like Metronet, make the lives of Western Australians easier each day, whilst creating more jobs for our community. Of course, none of this would have been possible without the tireless campaigning of local members of parliament advocating for their community. I want to personally give my thanks to the former member for Coburn, Mr Fran Logan, member for Jandicott, Yasma Barakai, member for Southern River, Terry Healy, and member for South Metro, the Honourable Sue Ellery, who have tirelessly advocated for our region. I also want to thank Minister Rita Safiotti, who had the grit and determination to fix and deliver what her predecessors couldn't fathom. Local issues have always been important to me. That's why I became involved in the campaign to protect the Belia wetlands in 2012. This area of Western Australia has been used by traditional owners for thousands of years and holds great social, biological and cultural value to the area and its people. Bibra Lake is one of the most important recreational sites in the South Metropolitan Region, with some of the most biodiverse areas in our state. I am pleased to see the McGowan Labor Government reintroduce important legislation to rezone the wetlands as parks and recreation reserve. This important legislation will permanently safeguard the area from future development and preserve the wetlands for generations to come. It was during this time living in the South West Corridor that I became active in the Labor movement. After completing my BA in History and Politics at Edith Cowan University and working six years in retail at Maya Morley and Maya Garden City, I went in search of an opportunity to get actively involved. As a proud member of the Labor Party, but with not much to go on, I decided to cold call a number on a fridge magnet calling the office of none other than the Honourable Liliana Ravlic. To my surprise, I was advised that there was in fact an internship called the Labor Movement Work Experience Program run by Senator Chris Evans and that I should apply. To my disappointment, I was then advised that registrations had closed only days before my call. Thank I thanked Lil's office for their help and then thought, you know what, I'm going to try and apply anyway. And so I did. I picked up the phone and called the office of Senator Chris Evans. Now, I don't recall exactly what I said, but what I do know is that my pleading worked. I was told by a young man over the phone, Hayden Falconer, <laughs> to bring in my resume. Well, thanks to him, I made it through. I can honestly say the work experience program was life-changing. Thanks to people like Chris Evans, Hayden, the late Tony Cook who interviewed me, and everyone who has supported and continues to support the internship within the movement, I say thank you. You make it possible for us, ordinary working people, to have a chance to be part of this movement and to one day sit in this house. As a result of the Labor Movement Work Experience Program, I went on to work for various state and federal members of parliament, beginning with my first political job in 2008 with then Premier Alan Carpenter. 2008 may feel like a lifetime ago, but those years were some of the most important for me personally. It was during those early years when I was raising my firstborn, struggling to keep up with the demands of a toddler, household and life in general, that I began working for a member of this house 
who taught me that sometimes it's okay not to be okay, that it is normal not to have it all together and, to be, and not to be too harsh on yourself. That person is thankfully still here in this chamber. I am honoured to be a member in the Upper House and sit alongside someone I consider to be one of my mentors, the Honourable Sue Ellery. Thank you, Sue. The 2013 election is not one I often like to look back on. For those of us who worked on the campaign, we still bear the scars. However, those campaigns are what made us tough. Lessons were learned during those years, including lessons on how to get up, dust ourselves off, keep going and never give up. Another movement that never gives up and that I had the privilege to work for was the union movement. I want to thank the United Workers' Union and Unions WA for the incredible opportunity to be part of the trade union movement. I am proud to call myself a trade unionist and I am privileged to have worked alongside people who have spent their whole lives advocating for workers, ever evolving, even as the definition of workplaces continues to change, as does the face of trade unionism. To my comrades in the union movement, who have been some of my greatest mentors, Carolyn Smith, Dom Rose, Steve McCartney and Pearl Lim, thank you for your support. Keep fighting the good fight. More recently, I had the opportunity to be part of a close-knit, high-functioning team at WA Labor that ensured the party did something the Liberals have forgotten to do in the last couple of years – talk to people. I'm proud to be part of a Labor team that speaks to everyone in the community, no matter their position or background. Our commitment, Mark McGowan's commitment, to listen to the whole community has made this government an inclusive, thoughtful and, if you'll forgive their modesty, popular government, one that I feel a deep sense of honour to now be a part of. The South Metropolitan Region is a vibrant and distinctive part of our state, showcasing the best the West has to offer and even includes our very own WA icon, Tony Gallardi. Whether you're spending the day on Rottnest Island, enjoying a long mac on the cafe strip in Fremantle, strolling along the Swan River in South Perth, having a swim at South Beach or Coogee, watching the planes fly over Jandicott Airport, enjoying a play at Bibra Lake Regional Playground, picnicking along the wetlands, testing your fear limits at Adventure World, or simply enjoying local fish and chips on the foreshore of Rockingham. The South Metropolitan Region truly is the best place to live. I feel this is my time to give back to this great state that has afforded me so many opportunities. During my time in public office, I will endeavour to work hard to make the interests of the people in this region my priority and be a strong voice for them in the West Australian Parliament. I promise to stand up for our community and continue the great work led by the McGowan Labor government. I want all women in our community to look at this chamber and see themselves represented. Our almost equal caucus of female members is a step in the right direction, and I'm proud to see these changes led by a government that genuinely believes in its importance and understands that equal representation can transform society and politics itself. After all, this isn't a women's issue. Including women in politics and addressing gender inequality makes for better societies and better governments. Our community, our economy, our democracy benefit from us working together to close the gender pay gap. President, we have achieved so much over the last 100 years since WA's very own Edith Cowan took her first steps in Parliament. But our work here is not yet done. While women make up 50 per cent of our population, they are still underrepresented in many areas of leadership, including politics, board roles and senior executive positions. The truth is, 
They are often underrepresented in these places, such as where I stand today, because we have not adapted our workplaces to encourage women to take that leap. I hope to see continued policies which improve this issue of women's participation in our workforce. I am proud of the McGowan government's track record in this space, with initiatives and programs such as Onboard WA and the Aboriginal Ranger program, which employs over 300 people, 53 per cent of whom are women. Policies that support training and apprenticeships for women in male-dominated industries, such as shipbuilding at Austell Henderson facility in the South Metro electorate and the McGowan government's commitment to a statewide STEM strategy encouraging STEM education for women and girls. The historic 2021 election result was something I am certain will remain in the hearts and minds of all party faithful. I could not have, it could not have been achieved without the dedicated and hardworking team at WA Labor. I want to acknowledge State Secretary Tim Picton and Assistant State Secretary Ellie Whitaker for their captainship of the 2021 state election and their support of me, not only during the campaign but during my time at WA Labor. I would also like to acknowledge the previous State Secretaries I worked with during my time at the Labor Business Roundtable. Both Matt Dixon and the person who had faith in me and my abilities when he offered me the position back in 2017, the federal member for Perth, Patrick Gorman. Now to the engine of WA Labor, my colleagues at party office, who deserve so much credit for their endless commitment to our party. I am honoured to have worked alongside you all. It's been a ride. I would like to make special mention to a few colleagues colleagues I've worked very closely with over the last four years and more recently. Julie Bogle, David Can, Jesse Desmond and Daniela Pusharic. There, there are so many people I've had the privilege to work with during my 13 years in the labour movement. I would like to acknowledge those I often reach out to for advice, guidance, direction and support. They have been instrumental to me on my journey. People like Mark Reed, who's always there to tell me like it is. Remind me not to be too harsh on myself and to keep striving. Thank you for, your, thank you for continuing your wisdom after all these years. The member for Jandakot, Yasma Barakai. The member for Scarborough, Stuart Albury. <laughs> and longtime friend, Olivia Crowley and former WA Labor Assistant State Secretary, Linda O'Shalem. I would like to take this opportunity to thank our Premier, the Honourable Mark McGowan. I met the Premier at the very start of my journey, and it's an absolute honour that I stand here today as a member of the McGowan Labor government team. I want to thank him for always supporting me and for the friendship over the years. Thank you to the Serbian communities of Western Australia for supporting me and my nomination to run for Parliament. To the women in my personal life who are here today, some of which I have known for over 30 years, truly amazing women, thank you for your friendship and support. I would like to acknowledge my extended family here in Perth. Some of them are here today, though my family members in Melbourne and many who are far away in Serbia will always be in my heart. Vukash and Andrić, thank you for being a great dad to our beautiful girls. My parents, Clara and Istvan Marton, your support means the world to me. Thank you for everything. I could not have done this without you. To my little sister, Rebecca Marton, who is here today, having a younger sister is like having a best friend you can't get rid of especially when they follow you into politics. <laughs> but having a little sister means that whatever you do, they'll still be there. No matter the problem, you'll never have to solve it alone. Rebecca, thank you for always supporting me. I hope one day you follow me again, but this time into one of these chambers. <laughs> to my beautiful and strong daughters, Angela and Alexandra, you are both the light of my life, my strength and my world. 
I am so lucky to be your mother. Thank you for cheering me on, for understanding and supporting me. I hope you know that I do this for the both of you, and I hope I make you both proud. As I mentioned, English is not my first language, so I'd like to say a few words in the order of the languages I was taught. Nagyon szépen köszönöm kezdődjön a munka. Fala puno svima neka poso započne. Thank you very much. Let the work begin. Thank you and congratulations, Honourable Member, and I wish you all the very best during your term in this chamber. Members, uh, noting the time, I'll leave the chair until the ringing of the bells. The President. Members, it's question time. Are there any questions? President. Okay, thank you, members. The Honourable the Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. And my question without notice, and welcome to Thursday. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, uh, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. I refer to the GST received by the State of Western Australia and the flaw instigated by the Morrison government, and I ask one, what indication or evidence has the government received that the Commonwealth Government is considering altering the GST agreement struck with this state to implement the current flaw in GST payments? Two, has the government received any correspondence from the Commonwealth Government in regard to their position on the current GST floor agreement? Three, please table that correspondence. Four, what evidence does the Treasurer have that the Commonwealth has any intention of changing the GST agreement? And five, please table that evidence. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. One, the Commonwealth has been under sustained pressure from other states and territories to undo the GST reforms. For example, the South Australian and Victorian Treasurers have raised their concerns with the GST reforms in recent months. Two, the Prime Minister and Federal Treasurer have only provided verbal assurances of their intention to not unwind the GST reforms. The State Government would welcome the Honourable Member's support in seeking formal assurance from his uh, Commonwealth counterparts, three to five, C one to two. The Leader of the Opposition. President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. Uh, I refer to the 2018-19 to 2020-21 boom in iron ore royalties, and I ask one, what is the current spot price of iron ore as measured by Treasury? Two, does the Treasurer receive a nightly update on iron ore price from Treasury to help him sleep, as the previous Treasurer publicly acknowledged? Three, what is the total government royalty revenue to date for the 2021 financial year? And four, is an iron ore spot price above US $150 a tonne for the rest of 2021 highly unrealistic? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And again, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notes to the question. One, uh, US $191.3. Two, the Treasurer receives an overnight update of the iron ore spot price. Three, as stated in the answer to Legislative Council question without notice number two, on 29 April 2021, iron ore royalty income totaled $5.129 billion to 31 December 2020, as shown in the latest December quarterly report. The actual for 2020-2021 will be published in the annual report on state finances in September 2021. Four, as stated in the answer to Legislative Council question without notice number two on 29 April 2021, annual average prices are shown in the annual report on state finances published each financial year. Iron ore prices are highly volatile. The McGowan Labor government's budgets are based on a prudent iron ore methodology given this inherent volatility. The Honourable Colin de Grusser. Thank you, uh, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to question C147 asked in this place on the 25th of May 2021, and I ask one, 
Will you table all presentations, reports, data and correspondence regarding concerns and issues raised by the Emergency Department of Perth Children's Hospital to the Executive of the Child and Adolescent Health Service for the period 1 October 2020 inclusive to 30 April 2021 inclusive, including but not limited to information identified in the SAC-1 Clinical Incident Investigation Report, contributing factors and root causes into Ashwarya Aswas death, and two, if no, to one, why not? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, uh, President, and I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for some knowledge of the question. One, no, two, an independent inquiry will, will be conducted into the Child and Adolescent Health Service in respect of all the functions and operations of Perth Children's Hospital concerning the care of Ashwarya As Aswath. As part of the terms of reference, the inquiry will investigate the roles and responsibility of responsibilities of clinicians, management and the executive at PCH and their escalation of issues to the Child and Adolescent Health Service Board. The Honourable Jorn Sidmer. Thank you, uh, President. My question without notice, of which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I refer to the explanatory memorandum for the Conservation and Land Management Amendment Bill 2021 which identifies that the proposed amendments will, among other things, provide for the laudable aim of, and I quote, greater recognition of the rights of Aboriginal people by broadening the purpose of marine parks to include the protection and conservation of the value of marine parks to the culture and heritage of Aboriginal people. And I ask, one, does the continuation of lawful commercial and recreational activities prevent or impede the protection of Aboriginal culture and heritage in marine parks, marine management areas and or marine nature reserves? And two, if yes to one, can the Minister provide specific examples? Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. I'm earning my money this afternoon. Uh, I provide the following answer on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One to two, such matters would be considered on a case-by-case -case basis through the preparation or revision of the management plan for the respective marine reserve under the Conservation and Land Management Act of 1984. The Honourable Nick Guerin. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney-General. I refer to your answer to question without notice number 973, answered on the 5th of September 2019 in the 40th Parliament, in which you informed the House of your commitment to table a review into the efficiency and effectiveness of the commencement and conduct of prosecutions arising from Corruption and Crime Commission investigations by the 20th of September. 2019, and I ask one, on what date was the review report completed, and two, on what date was the report tabled? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following answer on behalf of the Attorney General: one, May 2020; two, not applicable. The Honourable Donna Farragher. Question. The Honourable Donna Farragher has the call. Uh, thank you. Oh, President. Uh, President, my question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Minister for Education. I refer to the new $1.2 million program to be trialled at two Perth schools to support children and families who speak English as an additional language before they start school. And I ask, one, has the trial commenced? And if so, what is its total duration? Two, can the Minister provide more information about the program, including a breakdown of how the $1.2 million is to be spent? And three, will an evaluation of the program be conducted at the completion of the trial? Uh, the Leader of the House. Thanks, uh, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One, the trial will commence in semester two, 2021, and continue until the end of 2024. Two, the program will be trialled at Bentley and Maylands Peninsula Primary Schools. It is designed to help the children of families from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds to successfully transition to school. The breakdown of how the $1.2 million is to be spent is $904,000 on salaries, early childhood trained teacher and an ethnic assistant, $200,000. $43,500 school startup and program delivery, $53,000 project support and startup, $1,500 staff training and development. Three yes. The Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, but some is given is to the Minister representing the Minister for Police. One, will the Minister confirm that the Mental Health Co Response Unit consists of four teams of nine uh, police officers as well as the authorised mental health practitioners sourced from local health providers? Two, if no to one, will the Minister provide the exact composition of the Mental Health Co Response Unit? Three, have any officers been moved from any of the four teams over the past 12 months? And four, if yes to three, which of the four teams and how many officers have been removed? Minister for Mental Health. 
Thank you very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes to the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Minister for Police. The McGowan Government is recruiting 950 additional police officers, or 15 per cent more officers, the largest single increase in police numbers in Western Australia's history. The McGowan Government has also committed to boosting funding by an estimated $20.2 million for the Mental Health Co-Response Programme to expand the programme to Bunbury and Geraldton and to provide more mental health teams in the metropolitan area. One to two, the Western Australia Police Force advise yes. The authorised mental health practitioners are provided by the Department of Health. Three to four, deployment decisions are made by the Commissioner of Police. The WA Police Force advise that in the last 12 months during the state of emergency, several officers have been temporarily deployed to Operation Tide in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and to the Perth Watch House. Further, to accommodate the temporary, temporary deployments, some staff from the Cannington team have also been temporarily redeployed to other teams without affecting the response in Cannington. The WA Police Force is on track to boost mental health co-response in the metropolitan and regional areas. The Hon. Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question, without notice in which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Fire and Emergency Services. I refer the Minister to an article published in today's edition of The Countryman, which reports on the traffic management and operation of roadblocks during the Wooroloo bushfires in February this year. I note the article paraphrases one resident as describing the roadblock experience as more stressful than the fire. Given the January 2016 Waruna Fire Special Inquiry explicitly recommended a review of the policy for traffic management at emergency incidents to reflect national best practice, can the Minister provide an update on the status of this much needed review? Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, uh, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. A working group was convened on the um, 2nd of September 2016 to consider recommendation 14 of the January 2016 Waruna Fire Special Inquiry to review the policy for traffic management at emergency incidents. The working group revisited the policy and guidelines in view of the Ferguson findings. The group concluded that the existing policy did not require amendment but did identify the need to improve implementation and communication of the processes, including the newly developed Department of Fire and Emergency Services restricted access permit system. The working group oversaw the development of an aid memoir for use by personnel at the vehicle checkpoints, a checklist describing the establishment and operation of the traffic management planning function for use by the incident management team, and implementation of the fire and emergency services restricted access permit system, including education and information for the community and first responders. The Honourable Sophia Mormont. My question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, Agriculture and Food. I refer the Minister to the Regional Dry Crop Agronomy Seed Cultivar Trials and Harvest Survey overseen by HempGrow and financed by government funding in the financial year 2018-19, to and I ask, one, does the government intend to release the findings of the trials and or survey, or does it have a timetable for the release of that information by any third parties? Two, were any similar trials or studies undertaken or completed since 2018 and 19? And if so, what plans, if any, are there to release that information? Three, are there any plans to continue such research into the future? And is the minister able to share those plans with the House? The Minister for Regional Development. Um, I thank the uh, member for the question. Uh, member, yesterday I did provide information about uh, the trials that we are currently doing. So uh, the answer to that part of the question obviously is yes, as per uh, the question that we provided yesterday. In relation to those um, particular um, studies that were done under the auspices of hemp grow, um, we, um, I'm advised that uh, this uh, information has all available results to date in this research area have been given in um, numerous forums, including open forums of growers in April 2021. 
um, an Emerging Industries Food Conference in Darwin, May 2021. Interviews in regional ABC re results were presented on all hemp trials at a conference in Fremantle in February 2000, and it says 2020, and a symposium in March 2021. Um, both events in Fremantle covered media, media coverage. But member, I do think that this sort of information uh, should be placed um, on the uh, website so that it is um, uh, properly available. So I have uh, today asked um, DPIRD uh, to make sure um, that they put these, uh, collate these reports and that that material will be, um, uh, will be online, it will be available on the website. Um, of obviously the work that I referred to yesterday, the 2021 work um, is still underway, but we will certainly be um, presenting that at the March 2020 um, uh, third biennial Australian Industrial um, uh, Hemp Conference. The Honourable Brian Walker. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. I refer the Parliamentary Secretary to the review of the Criminal Property Confiscation Act undertaken by the Honourable Wayne Martin, which concluded two years ago almost to the day and was tabled without comment in the other place in December 2019. Acknowledging the many other legislative reforms currently in the pipeline, I nonetheless ask, what timetable, if any, is the Attorney General working to in terms of a formal response to the review, either in whole or in part? And when might we reasonably expect to see something tabled here or in the other place? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some notice of the question, and the following answer is provided on behalf of the Attorney General. As the member rightly points out, the government has a considerable legislative agenda. Additionally, for much of last year, significant resources in the Department of Justice were redirected to the COVID-19 pandemic response. The Martin Review made more than 60 recommendations, canvassing both legislative and administrative matters, with the primary recommendation being that the government give consideration to repealing and replacing the Act in its entirety. The recommendations of the Martin Review remain under detailed consideration by the government, noting that criminal property confiscation scheme is complex and any reform, should it be pursued, would be a large body of work. The <coughs> Honourable Martin Aldrich. I thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Trans uh, Minister representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the extension of the Tonkin Highway referred to as the Northlink project and ask one, since the project was opened to traffic, how many claims of compensation has Main Roads or its contractors received relating to damage caused by loose surface material? Two, how many claims have been settled and what is the total value of compensation payments to date? Three, how many noise complaints have been received to date? Four, has the results of the noise monitoring survey that was undertaken at the end of August 2020 been publicly, re publicly released as the Minister committed to in answer to Legislative Council question without notice 1211? And five, if yes to four, please table the report. If not, why not? The Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one, 1,724. Two, 1,457 claims have been resolved, 964 claims have been paid, totalling $947,261. Three, 43, four and five, results of the noise monitoring survey have been provided to the residents who lodged noise complaints. And uh, uh, we will table the report, uh, this says, tomorrow. Now, this question was lodged on the 25th of May, so I'm going... Which is what this answer says. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So we're all good then. We're on the same page. Okay. Thanks, President. Uh, thank you. Can we, uh, the Honourable James Haywood. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, my question, uh, without notice, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House, representing the Minister for Housing. I refer, refer to the end of the rental moratorium on the 28th of March, and I ask one: How many eviction notices have there been from public housing? Two. Further to one, how many people or families have been evicted into homelessness from public housing? Three, is the Minister aware that a family of five children is one of 159 families in the Magistrates' Court over the last two days facing tenancy, he uh, tenancy hearings and evictions? And how many homes has the Government spot purchased in advance of the moratorium lifting? Four, is the Minister aware uh, the by name homeless count for Perth, Fremantle and surrounds increased by 58 per cent since November 2021. Uh, can the minister uh, name, sorry, 
I'm not sure that November must be 2020. Um, can the minister name uh, any programs currently in place to direct uh, directly increase the supply of affordable rental properties? The Leader of the House. Uh, President, uh, I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to two, since the 28th of March 2021, there have been zero evic evictions from public housing. Three to four, matters regarding the Magistrates Court and the project should be referred to the Attorney General and the Minister for Community Services, respectively. Five, the McGowan government is investing nearly $1 billion in social and affordable housing programs and homeless support services programs, including the Social Housing Economic Recovery Package and the Housing and Homelessness Investment Package. In partnership with the Commonwealth Government, the WA Government is continuing to increase affordable rental supply through the National Rental Affordability Scheme, which stimulates new privately owned construction to be delivered for affordable rental purposes. <clears throat> Under the scheme, owners receive incentives to rent their property to eligible low to moderate income households for at least 20 per cent below market rate. Tax incentives from the Commonwealth and financial incentives from the state are provided in arrears for 10 years. The McGowan government's $20,000 building bonus grant is playing a critical role in the significant increase of new home building approvals in WA, with over 24,000 applications received as at 20th of May 2021. In the 12 months to March, there have been 23,100 new homes approved for construction, the largest growth on record. As new homes come online, supply-side pressures will begin to ease with more properties in the rental market. The Hon. Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, for which some notice is given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to verbal reports by local leaders and school teachers that school attendance among Aboriginal children has dropped significantly since the uh, onset of the COVID crisis. Uh, concerns exist that this trend will exacerbate further disadvantage, and I ask, is the Minister aware of uh, reports uh, of reduced school attendance? And two, what is the average <coughs> attendance rates of students in each year, cohort K-12, to in the following locations in the years 2016, 2019, 2020 and 2021, and uh, for the locations of Halls Creek, Fitzroy Crossing, Wyndham, Derby and Kununurra? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question one yet. Two, in 2020, the Kimberley region received additional funding to support the re-engagement of students. Attendance data for 2021 are not provided as the semester has not been completed. The Department of Education's data verification processes are not commenced until term three. Attendance data for 2016 to 2020 are provided for semester one each year in accordance with the national standards for student attendance data reporting. The data in 2019 were affected by an early and particularly severe flu season. The data in 2020 were severely affected by COVID-19, particularly in weeks seven to 10 of term one. Two data sets are provided for 2020, actual, which includes all weeks of semester one and adjusted, which excludes weeks seven to 10 term one. If I can just, um, by way of background, there's been an agreement at a national level about how we will record um, our data and some debate I'm quite happy for all of West Australian's data to be out there because it's one of the best uh, in Australia during uh, the, the pandemic, uh, but there's a debate nationally about what the data looks like that's made public. Um, as the information uh, is provided in tabular form, I seek leave to have this incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Leader of the House seeks leave to incorporate that table into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Aye. Leave is granted. Um, the Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. My question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs. I refer to a response given yesterday by the Parliamentary Secretary on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs, the Honourable Jorn Sidmer, regarding electoral reform of the Upper House, in which a reference was made to widely expressed community concern. And I ask, number one, can the Minister advise what consultation process was used to gauge the widespread community concern at the election, res at the election result? Two, over what time period did the consultation take place? consultation process take place? And three, was the consultation undertaken in regional WA and what percentage of the population in regional WA were concerned? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, President, and I thank the member for some uh, notice of the question, and I provide this following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the March 2020 general election prompted widespread media coverage of the anomalous results in the Legislative Council. The government established the Ministerial Expert Committee, the Committee on Electoral Reform, to review the electoral system for the Legislative Council and provide recommendations. The committee is undertaking a wide consultation with the WA community. 
It has asked interested members of the public and organisations to make submissions on its terms of reference, and there has been considerable interest from the public regarding the review. The committee has received over 50 submissions, which it is currently considering. Submissions are open to the public until Tuesday, the 8th of June, 2021. Information, terms of reference, and public submissions can be found on the committee website at waelectoralreform.wa.gov.au. Notice of which some notice has been given is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. Uh, I refer to question without notice 1083 asked on the 14th of October 2020 on the PFAS contaminated oil extracted oh, during yeah. tunnelling from the Forestville yeah. Airport link. Yeah. Uh, they're very keen today. Are we finished now? Honourable members. Do you um, need me to start again, Leader of the House, or we I can just continue? I think you've got it. I ask, one, has any of the 600,000 cubic metres of spoil stockpiled at 777 Abernathy Road, Forestfield, now been reused, and if so, where? Two, has any of the 110,000 cubic metres of spoil stockpiled at Perth Airport now been reused, and if so, where? Three, has the estimated 160,000 cubic metres been used on the FAL project as predicted and from what storage source was derived? Four, how long can the government store this spoil on temporary storage sites before it is considered a waste? And five, would the same time frame apply to spoil accumulated by a private sector business? Leader of the House. Thanks, President. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One of the joys now about representing the Minister for Transport is I get to answer the PFAS questions, uh, so I'm delighted to answer my first one. Um, one to two, no. Three, yes, Abernathy Road. Four, the material is not considered waste. Five, not applicable. The Honourable Colin de Grusser. President, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Agriculture and Food. I refer to the State Barrier Fence Esperance Extension and I ask one, since the completion of the initial 63 kilometres of fence in April 2020, have any additional sections of the fence been constructed? Two, if not, what has been the cause of the delay? Three, have any materials for the construction of the remaining sections of the fence been procured? And if so, how are they stored? Four, can the minister commit to a definitive timeline within which the remainder of the fence will be completed? If not, why not? Minister for Regional Development. I thank the member for the question, and uh, I think he actually probably knows the answer because he has been uh, following the issue for some time. Um, but it is uh, um, the delay um, is caused, or the, uh, our inability to start the remainder of the project is because we are still uh, undertaking the Illua negotiations. Now, I can understand they are taking a, a long time Time. There has been some impact of COVID in that some of the group meetings um, did have to be cancelled. Um, we certainly have looked at um, what other ways we might be uh, able to do this. Uh, I think there's some, uh, the, and I presume the member has been contacted by uh, the farmers on whose property the, um, uh, the fencing is stored. Um, they. Um, uh, there is a view that 70 per cent of the remainder is on freehold property, and so we should be able to get on with it. Uh, my understanding it's only around 25 per cent of the remainder is on freehold property, uh, and it is um, very, very interspersed. But uh, I've certainly had a, a letter from uh, Mr Neil Wandell talking about uh, whether or not we can look at having some arrangements where those little bits that are there um, can be done. Um, uh, separately while we're trying to resolve uh, the native title for the other areas. Uh, the advice from the department initially is that that would be too expensive, but if we can negotiate something, uh, we're happy to do it. Now, the idea that somehow or other there's a problem with this fencing being out in the weather, uh, it is outside, but you will know, member, that, um, that uh, or, uh, but certainly if you can assure Mr Wandell uh, that this is designed to be out in the weather, right? It's our intention it's going to be out in the weather for many, many, many decades. So I'd hope the fact that it's out in the weather, it's galvanised. Um, and certainly from the pictures I've seen, it looks quite bright and shiny. Um, so uh, I'm not quite sure what the cause of concern is. But it, look, it has taken much longer than and table the picture. 
I'm quite happy to table the photograph of Mr. Wandel if he would like to get into the part. I'd like to get into the hand side. Um, that document is tabled. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, but I just say, oh, look, I, I understand the frustration. Certainly, uh, the Ilua negotiations are taking uh, a long time. Uh, the department uh, is very focused on trying to bring those to a resolution, but there are processes that are really outside uh, our control. The Honourable Yon Sidmar. Uh, my question, without notice, which some notice is given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, I refer to the answer the Minister provided me on 25 May concerning the origin of information which was provided in an answer to an earlier question about data relating to the diversion of construction and demolition or C&D waste, and I ask one, does the Minister's answer imply that official statistics derive from self-reporting of the operators themselves, and two, if yes to one, what specific process does the Department of Water and Environmental Regulation currently undertake to validate the integrity of this self-reported information? Uh, the Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some nods to the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Environment. One, recyclers are required to report waste and recycling data annually under Regulation 18C of the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Regulations 2008. Regulation 18D of the regulations requires information to be calculated or estimated in accordance with gazetted procedures approved by the Chief Executive Officer. In relation to the waste levy, licensees must make a record under Regulation 17 of the Waste Avoidance and Resource Recovery Regulations and under, and under Regulation 18 uh, use these records to make a return in the approved form, setting out details of the waste received and lodge this return with the Chief Executive Officer. Two, an audit program is undertaken each year to verify the integrity of the data reported for a sample of returns. In addition, validation is undertaken for each return. Returns are compared against data reported in the previous year. Returns are also checked against data reported under licence conditions. The, uh, the Leader of the House. I ask the business of the House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Ministers or parliamentary secretaries, are there any further answers? President, on behalf of the Minister for Housing, I'd like to provide um, an answer for the Honourable uh, Colin de Gusser's question without notice 130 and the Honourable Steve Martin's question without notice 139, asked on the 25th of May, and I seek leave to have them incorporated into Hansard. The Minister seeks leave to have both those answers incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. The Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Donald Farragher's question without notice, 133, which was asked on 25 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Brian Walker's question without notice 155, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Minister for Mental Health. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Wilson Tucker's question without notice 154, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, I would like to provide an answer to the Honourable Colin de Grosse's question without notice 149, which was asked on 26 May 2021, and I seek leave to have the answer incorporated into Hansard. Members, the Minister seeks leave to have that answer incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, uh, with respect to the Honourable Martin Aldridge's question without, question without notice 156, part 4, which was asked yesterday, uh, I have sought clarification and can inform the Honourable Member that invoices are generally issued after 60 days. Uh, however, some invoices are provided within less than 60 days where passengers request priority or company invoices. The effort to provide a breakdown of the number by time period would need to be undertaken by a manual process and is not an effective use of WA Health resources. Are there any further uh, answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? The Minister for Regional Development. President, I would uh, like to provide a, cor a correction to the Honourable Dr. Steve Thomas's. Que uh, sorry, I would like to provide a, quest a correction to the answer given to the Honourable Dr. Steve Thomas in his question without notice, Hansard number one two eight. 
uh, um, asked on the 25th of May 2021. I would like to correct my response to part three of the question. The amount paid is $71,468. The incorrect figure of $501,779 was provided to the Department of Mines, Industry and Regulation and Safety by QBE. I apologise to the House for the error. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? Uh, President, uh, just, the Honourable Peter Collier. Uh, thanks, President. Just with regard to a question that I asked yesterday, and there was the incorrect reference to a question from the Premier, and the Leader of the House was going to follow up. Leader of the House, on a point may. of clarification. Yeah, if I may, I think it was just the two different um, numbers that are used in the Council and in the Hansard, and um, so uh, I will, behind the chair, tell you which one is wrong, but that's what it was. It was just the different numbers that are used in the Legislative Council and that are then used in Hansard. And in answering the question, as I, rec as I recall, the way the answers are provided refers to the Hansard number. But I'll clarify for you that behind the chair. Um, are there any further answers from ministers and parliamentary secretaries? Members, we... Leader of the House. Uh, can I move that we move to member statements? Yes. <laughs> Members, the question is, we now move to member statements. All of the, do we need, we need to take that to them. Yep. Uh, all of those, all those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, say no. The ayes have it. Members, we now have member statements. Are there any President. members with member statements? President. Uh, the Honourable Martin Pritchard. Thank you, President. Um, I'll be quite brief. Um, it's been a good week, can I say, uh, and I've enjoyed many of the speeches. Um, I'm not always very complimentary, uh, President, of, of the media. Often I believe that they try to create news rather than report news. But there was an article in the West Australian on Friday the 21st of May that so caught my eye and thought, I, I thought was so on point that I just wanted to read some small snippets of that particular article. It's uh, by a columnist for, the, for News Corp, uh, David Penberthy, and the article is headed, uh, Why You Should Get the Jab. Um, and I'd like to report at this stage that I have had my first jab, and uh, I'm looking forward to the second. But quoting this article, it just goes uh, to say this. Here's a question. Of all the influenza vaccines, which one is your favourite? Maybe you're a fan of the two made by Sinopharm Aventis Pharmaceutical Company, Vaxogrip, Tetra, and Flu Quadri. If it's Vaxogrip Tetra you like, you might be just as happy ta to taking the same version of that vaccine made by GlaxoSmithKline. Or you might prefer the three vaccines made by Sequiris Company, Fluid Quad, Afluria Quad, and Fluxavax Quad. Or maybe you're a myelin health enthusiast and have their Inflovac Tetra injected each year ahead of winter. My strong, my strong hunch is that you, like me, uh, had no idea that in Australia there are seven TGA-approved flu vaccines made by four companies, the comparative benefits and pitfalls of which are a blissful mystery to us non-scientific types. Australians, especially older Australians, are overwhelmingly happy to take a flu vaccine and will never even think about ranking them by their promised benefit or purported pitfalls. We just trust the science and appreciate the advantages of having our shots. Further in the, in the article it goes, we don't think twice about any of this. We enthusiastically roll up to the local GP, chemist or workplace vaccination clinic and have any old vaccine jabbed into our arm, safe in the knowledge that it is better than coming down with the cold. This is not the case with the coronavirus vaccines. Suddenly, everyone's an immunologist. Walk into any front bar in the land and there's a couple of blokes in high vis deba debating the physiological merits of Pfizer over AstraZeneca. 
Further on in the article, it says, uh, the, the article quoted doctors reporting a significant proportion of older people who are so concerned by the fear of blood clots with AstraZeneca that they are holding off in the hope of receiving a different vaccine. And towards the end of the article, it says, please read the stats and trust the science. The most recent and authoritative research was done by Oxford University in March, showing recipients, recipients of AstraZeneca have a five per million chance of developing blood clots, compared with four per million chance of, of, with Pfizer and Moderna. That's five in a million, uh, or, or uh, compared to four in a million. Of those, uh, uh, this is not in the article, but I believe of those, uh, it's possible that one in four uh, would, prob uh, would die of the blood clot. Not only is AstraZeneca staggeringly safe, Pfizer and Moderna are safer by such a tiny margin that I wonder why anyone would bother waiting. And they are all much safer than walking across a busy road. And I think I just wanted to highlight that we would be far more at risk in changing a light bulb in our own house. We would be much more at risk if we crossed a busy road. We, are, we seem to be subject to our success that we have managed to abolish the, the, uh, the, the uh, COVID-19 in this state and around the country to the, for the most part. And that success has led to um, uh, a lot of misinformation, in my view, uh, uh, heightening people's fear about taking the vaccine. I would encourage anybody in my constituents uh, to roll up their sleeve and actually get vaccinated. I think we've got to now to a point that the more we try and explain it, uh, the more people are worried about it. But just think of the differences. Uh, five per million, as opposed to even my own parents were waiting. My mother was waiting for Pfizer, uh, hoping to get Pfizer later in the year, until I said, the difference is five per million as opposed to four per million. It's ridiculously small chance of something going wrong. And if something goes wrong, there's also a much smaller chance of then uh, actually dying of it. I just encourage uh, people in my constituency, roll up your sleeve. Let's look after uh, everybody, get the jab, particularly looking after our children. Thank you, President. The Honourable Nick Guerin. President, the Corruption and Crime Commission in Western Australia is a body that has extraordinary powers. When it was established, it was given extraordinary powers by the two chambers of parliament for the purposes of overseeing the police in Western Australia in particular. It has a role to oversee all of the public sector, but in particular with respect to police misconduct. It is no trivial matter to be talking about the extraordinary powers that are available to the Corruption and Crime Commission. The contemptuous attitude of a series of McGowan government ministers to parliamentary question time seems to know no bounds. The 17th of March 2016, this is what Hansard records in this place, accurate and timely information to Parliament and its transparent dissemination is essential. Secrecy, obfuscation, avoidance and inaccuracy, whether deliberate or not, and dishonesty are in fact the enemies of our parliamentary democracy. Those are the words of the Honourable Sue Ellery on the 17th of March 2016. Now, in 2019, President, the 5th of September 2019, I asked the Leader of the House, who at the time was representing the Attorney-General, the same Attorney-General that we have today, about a report that arose from the work of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission. My question was, I refer to the report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission tabled on the 17th of November, 17th of November 2016, several months after the words uttered by the Leader of the House. 
which recommended that the Attorney General undertake a review into the efficiency and effectiveness of the commencement and conduct of prosecutions arising from Corruption and Crime Commission investigations and to table a report on that review within 12 months of the tabling of the Corruption and Crime Commission's annual report for 2016-2017. So, in other words, the report was due around about September 2018. I'm asking the question in September 2019. And the, resp the response that comes back from the Leader of the House, the Honourable Sue Ellery, on behalf of the Attorney-General, says, due to the prorogation of the 39th Parliament in January 2017, the previous Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission did not have the opportunity to receive a response to this recommendation. Similar kind of vibe that we got from the Minister for Regional Development earlier today. Accordingly, an identical recommendation was included in the second report of the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission, tabled on the 14th of September 2017. Subsequent to the tabling of that report, the Attorney-General, with the agreement of the Joint Standing Committee, committed to tabling the review within 12 months of the tabling of the Triple C's annual report for 2017-18. The Triple C's annual report for 2017-18 was tabled on the 20th of September 2018. The review commenced in December 2018. So even with the delay by the Attorney-General, the, uh, the Honourable John Quigley, under this new timetable that he created, the report was due to be tabled by the 20th of September 2019. 20th of September 2019. Here we are, May 2021. I've just asked the Attorney-General today, his hard-working and, I suspect, soon-to-be long-suffering parliamentary secretary, <laughs> has quite accurately reported to Parliament today that the review was only completed in May 2020, and that's a year ago. And where's the report? Has it been tabled? Nowhere to be seen. In fact, the contemptuous attitude of the Attorney-General is to simply say it's not applicable. Those are the words. That's his signature, 27th of May 2021. It's not applicable. His commitment to the Parliament is not applicable. This was due in 2019, here we are in 2021, and the Attorney-General's arrogant attitude to the Parliament. Now, where is the Leader of the House, where is the Leader of the House, who said accurate and timely information to Parliament and its transparent dissemination is essential? In 2016, the Leader of the House was very, very quick to be critical of anyone in government and their responses to to, uh, to questions and referred to it as, in fact, being enemies of our parliamentary democracy. Now, all I can ask for at this point in time, uh, President, is that somebody, somebody in government, they've got a plethora of members now. Surely one of them can go and knock on the door of the Attorney General and say, for goodness sake, you said you were going to do something in September 2019. You gave a commitment to the parliament. You made the Leader of the House utter those words in this place. So, in effect, it's now become her commitment. Provide the, provide the document, provide the report. It's already a disgrace that it was only finished in May 2020, almost two years later. But that aside, we now know that the report exists. There can be no suggestion that the report hasn't been completed, that doesn't exist. I know that the McGowan government has an obsession with secrecy. They hate transparency, despite the fact that their Premier in the lead into 2017 promised gold standard transparency. Yet again today, here we go, Exhibit A, we ask for something and what we're told, not applicable not applicable. The gold standard transparency that the Premier promised has been absolutely not applicable. It's been missing and missing for four years. We're now moving into our fifth year. We're yet to see anything that barely resembles the idea of a gold standard of transparency. So I do hope, I do hope, President, that when we return next week on Tuesday, that one of these ministers gets up during minister brief ministerial statements and makes sure that there's an explanation provided for this. I would expect that the Attorney-General would ensure that there's an apology given to this chamber. A document that he committed to tabling in 2019 was not only not done in 2019, it wasn't even finished in 2019. Finished in May 2020, still not tabled last year. And, and do us all a favour, 
do us all a favour and do not tell us that the excuse is COVID-19. This was all due well before anyone even knew anything about COVID-19. There's no reason why this document couldn't be tabled. And then the contemptuous attitude today, President, when the question's been asked, it would have been very easy for the Attorney General to instruct his parliamentary secretary, his hard working, soon to be long suffering uh, parliamentary secretary, he could, have, he could have asked him to table that today in response to the question. No, the arrogant attitude of the Attorney General, of course, is no way, not on your life, not on your Nelly. I'm not going to provide any information. Even if my Premier, Mr McGowan, my friend, the member for Rockingham, tells me I need to adhere to a gold standard of transparency, I, the Attorney General of Western Australia, are going to do the exact opposite. The exact opposite. And I certainly am not going to listen to, to any uh, principle that's been outlined by the Honourable Sue Ellery uh, on the 17th of March 2016. That seems to be the attitude of the current Attorney General of Western Australia. It is not good enough. I hope and I ask and I call on those ministers opposite, those senior members opposite who have been here long enough to know that this is unacceptable. They would be the first, they would be the first to lose their mind if they were in opposition and this was happening. They would lose it if it was late for a week. We're talking about soon approaching two years and the Attorney General has been unable to do this. And as I say, this is on no small trivial matter. This is about the Corruption and Crime Commission. There was a fiasco under the, under the tenure of the now former Commissioner, Mr McKechnie, and the Supreme Court found that actually the Triple C didn't have the power to charge and prosecute. That's what led to this particular report by the Joint Standing Committee. A new structure has been put in place. There was a review to be undertaken with respect to, to this matter. And now we don't know what the answer is with respect to the review because the government continues to hide the report. So next Tuesday, I do hope that uh, one of the ministers or indeed the parliamentary secretary will table this report uh, so that we can all be better informed on whether there has been actually success as a result of this new regime. The Corruption and Crime Commission can no longer prosecute charges in any jurisdiction in Western Australia other than contempt proceedings. So somebody else has to do it. My recollection is it's the State Solicitor's Office that's doing it for them. Is that working? Are there further problems that have emerged? And indeed I note that only this week that there are two honourable members of this place who have now been appointed to the Joint Standing Committee on the Corruption and Crime Commission and I hope that they take this up because there's absolutely no point in us ensuring that these reports get tabled by these parliamentary committees and then we have an arrogant government that takes no notice of them. The Joint Standing Committee on Corruption and Crime Commission would be well placed, would be well placed to be following up this particular recommendation and the response from the government, albeit belated, almost two years late, I might add. Um, every night, uh, 116,000 Australians sleep rough across the country. That's 116,000 uh, men, women and children. Uh, as winter approaches, their experience will get even harder. I'm sure members remember a few days ago uh, it was only six degrees at night. Homelessness is a, a community issue. It's a human rights issue and it takes the whole community to work together to address that. I uh, wish to advise the House that I will be participating in the CEO Sleep Hot again this year. Uh, this is my fifth year, uh, which is organised by St. John, um, sorry, St. John, St. Vincent de Paul Society. Uh, and um, um, I ask members to donate to this great cause so that they can continue to provide services to people who are experiencing homelessness in relation to um, education, accommodation, food, counselling, employment and other programs. President, I would like to thank the members who have already donated. Uh, thank you for your contribution and support. I would also like to uh, thank the members, uh, both past and present, uh, for their uh, contribution to this cause. Uh, President, uh, it's going to be on the 24th of June this year. Uh, I believe that's the last sitting day for this uh, calendar year. Calendar year, and um, um, uh, members uh, finishing sitting on that day will be returning to your homes. I just want you to know that um, your donation will be put into good use 
to support those uh, who need it very much. And I will be um, uh, working with uh, a number of my colleagues from this place uh, as part of the uh, CEO sleep hall that night. Thank you. Members, are there any further member statements? Nope. There being no further member statements, the House is adjourned.